Matt, I think we're about there. If you will go ahead and uh, make sure I'm spotlighted and we'll get started. Good morning uh, to, to, to today's Mad Scientist Weaponized Information Capstone event. Uh, we're excited to have you here with us today. Uh, this event has been a series of webinars, podcasts, war games, a vignette writing contest where we have focused on weaponized information. Uh, some of you have been along with this ride for us the entire time, but if you are just joining us for the first time, uh, we have plenty of ways for you to catch up uh, through connecting with our content uh, that we put in place. Mr. Ian Kersey, who's running our chat room, will have links uh, for that for you as we go through today. If you're an old timer, you know all about Mad Scientist. But if you are just connecting and this is the first time you've heard of us, let me tell you a little bit about the program. Uh, my name is Lee Grubbs. I'm the uh, director of the program and I have a great team you'll meet throughout the day who are running this event and have run all of our events uh, over this entire series. This program is focused on engagement. It's focused on learning. It's focused on connecting to expertise outside of the Army. Our mission is to connect the intellect of the nation to our Army. So that is what we are about. This can look a, whole, a lot of different ways. A lot of people that we'll talk to have very little experience with Department of Defense. Our first presenter, Keith Law, is from the Athletic. He's a baseball writer. When we looked at robotics, we went to NASA and we went to emergency services that use robotics in different places, nuclear reactors and places like this. When we looked at uh, smart installations of the future, we went out and found engineers in, in middle and small sized towns and looked at what they thought about uh, smart technologies and security and what they were doing in their towns. So we go out, we learn and we bring it back to the army. It's about collecting, uh, connecting the intellect of the nation to our army. So how do we connect? Well, we run events like this, webinars, we run physical conferences, which we've done in the past. Uh, and right now due to COVID, uh, we, we cannot do, uh, but we've been pretty innovative over the last uh, five months working through how we would connect. So uh, we have our Mad Sci Lab and Mr. Ian Kersey will put these links in our chat room. Uh, but this blog, we publish twice a week. We publish all of our events. It's a crowdsource process of thinking about the future. Uh, we're on Twitter, at Army Mad Sci. If you follow us, we'll be tweeting this event throughout the day. If you have to leave the, uh, the visual session, you can come back, look at Twitter, you can see as it goes through. Uh, but we tweet a lot about what we're learning and we also connect that way. We run a podcast called The Convergence. We've had two great podcasts just on this topic uh, that I sent to most all of you in emails so that you can look at the blog description, you can connect and listen to these podcasts talking about disinformation. So lots of different ways for you to connect the way you feel comfortable to talk about your expertise to help us think about what it means about the operational environment, what it thinks about what it means for the army and what it means for security of our nation. So very critical mission as we look at a very complex environment where much of the expertise that exists about the operational environment today is outside of the Army. So we appreciate each of you connecting with us and we appreciate you sharing your ideas. So how are we gonna move through today? So we have a couple of people who will welcome you and we'll start off on our session and uh, Matt Sanispert will moderate us throughout the day and you'll meet Matt in a little while. But as we're going through the day, we've connected all of this content virtually on our All Partners Access Network site. We have bios, we have slides where the presenters are using slides. Uh, we have uh, video content. Uh, you know, if you have trouble, if you struggle with the video that you can pull down the video there and take a look at it uh, to make sure that you have a quality experience and we learn together. Uh, we also have all of the information from the prior events. So if you hear a reference to an event and you wanna know more about it, you can go on to that All Partners Access Network site and you can look at that information. For example, a couple examples like that would be, uh, we have Davis Ellison, who's the winner of our vignette writing contest that, that will talk to us later today. And his vignette was published at the Mad Side blog yesterday, the 20th of June. You can go pull it down, look at it and the two runner up, the runners up. And as well as 
Uh, for example, Dr. Gary Ackerman will talk to us about the war game we executed. And you can go online and you can look at the scenario we had, you can look at the notes, and you can look at uh, all that learning experience to help complement what Gary is going to talk to us about where they pulled the string and talk about what we learned during that war game. So full virtual complement of how you can connect to the content and how we can move forward. A big part of this is your ability to ask questions. So we have two rooms. We have a chat room, which I would encourage you to plug into and communicate throughout the event. Uh, I'll be in there with Ian Kersey. We'll be putting down links. We'll be discussing concepts. It's, it, it's a parallel discussion on what the presenters are talking to us about. And there's a question and answers window. Both of these are on your, um, your strip at your bottom of the screen. Please put your questions in there so that the, the 15 minutes we have with each presenter approximately, Matt can quickly pull down your questions and we can make this a little interactive for you as participants uh, watching this event. So use the chat room throughout, use the question and answer piece to ask your questions and the presenters uh, will have an opportunity to address that. When you're using your chat room on your right side, I encourage you to select all panelists and participants, I think that's what it says. Uh, that allows everyone, not just the presenters, uh, to be able to see your comment and allows a discussion across the platform uh, to do that. Many of you know how to do this because you've been on Zoom, but I just want to make sure we make this a quality experience. As we're going through the event today, you're going to hear a couple people be described as proclaimed mad scientists. Matt, can you please put that slide up? So this is a common question we get a lot because it's really neat. Uh, so how do I become an army mad scientist? And uh, what it means is you have to share your expertise. We have probably about 150 designated army mad scientists. They are actually proclaimed. And what they've done is they presented at a conference. They are consistent writers at our blog site, or they've come onto the convergence, spent, spent an hour with us in our podcast, and shared their expertise. And when it's quality and it's consistent, we make a decision to proclaim them an army mad scientist. This has become viral, which we should like viral because viral is what we're gonna be talking today. A lot of weaponized information is about viral information. So you can see here on the slide how viral the, um, the proclamation and the uh, pieces like that will be. Know that each presenter today will receive a proclamation. Unfortunately, through the mail, we don't get a chance to slap each other on the back today, but they will be proclaimed an Army Mad Scientist and they'll get a compliment of swag. You can see the swag here uh, on the screen as well. And hopefully we'll see these individuals share their uh, pieces on their social media as we build this network of people who are interested about helping the Army. Lastly, I would be remiss if I did not thank our partners. Mad Scientist is about partners. It's about academic partners. It's about other government partners. And we have had great partnership for many years with Georgetown University. And, you know, usually it's a physical conference every year, but we've done writing contests with them and we've done, they've been involved throughout this series. Uh, Georgetown has a, a couple of their departments. Usually it's the uh, department for uh, study of, uh, security studies is the primary one, but this year also we partnered with uh, the Emerging Technology Department, which is a newer department at Georgetown. So they've been great partners and we'll hear from them in a few minutes. And then also we uh, a new partnership with Dr. Gary Ackerman's team and the team at the University at Albany, SUNY, uh, New York, that um, and their partnership with us on the war game and some other things we did with vignette writing as they helped us a lot. We cannot do what we do without these partners who give us platforms, connect us to expertise, and share their expertise. So to kick off today, we're going to have welcoming remarks by General Paul Funk, Commanding General, U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command. General Funk cannot be with us today, but he has made video remarks, and we're going to play those. As I said earlier, if you struggle with the video remarks this morning, uh, just because of your connection or whatever, these remarks are also uploaded at our All Partners Access Network site, which Ian Kersey has put in the chat room. Matt, play General Funk's remarks, please. Good morning, and welcome to the TRADOC Mad Scientist Conference on the information environment and the weaponization 
of information. My name is Funk, and I am an American soldier. I'd like to thank Georgetown University and the Center for Advanced Red Teaming from SUNY Albany for partnering with our Army on this important effort. And I'd like to personally thank each one of you for attending today's conference. The days of securing campaign success through traditional combat operations are over. Information has become decisive. Without a sustained competitive advantage in the information environment, hard-won victories can be negated or even reversed. Our strategic competitors have been quick to leverage the information environment to challenge traditional advantages and to exploit our weaknesses. They recognize that disinformation and psychological operations are as old as warfare itself. With its low cost of entry, our adversaries are advancing anti-Western views and spreading false information to create divisions among ourselves, our allies, and our partners. They are doing this continuously. From small information campaigns targeting specific individuals, to large-scale information campaigns that use bots to herd populations into self-reinforcing echo chambers. It is difficult for the truth to penetrate the information environment, and as a result, trust becomes strained and weaknesses are tested. In response, our Army needs to freely and confidently operate in the information environment by communicating to the American people, our adversaries, and each other. The ability to harness the power of the information environment while combating and competing with our adversaries is fundamental to national security and democracy of the United States. TRADAC understands the importance of taking control of the narrative and dominating the information space. We are taking what we have learned about the information environment from both peacetime and combat operations around the globe to gain the communications initiative the attributes and methods for effectively operating in the constantly involving information environment are being included in our doctrine, our leader development activities, and in all of our training. For example, during the early days of the COVID-19 crisis, TRADARC immediately responded by moving the majority of our recruiting to the virtual spaces, connecting to potential recruits sitting at home. This digital approach and our recent Army National Hiring Days are changing how the Army will recruit and communicate to America in the future. Thanks again for being here and for participating in today's Mad Scientist Conference. Throughout this great event, I'd ask you to keep Funk's Fundamental Number 15 in mind. A good idea is only, only becomes great when it is shared. Success in the information environment requires a radical shift in mindset. And I thank you in advance for sharing your expertise as together we strive to be the Army of tomorrow today. My name is Funk, and I am an American soldier. Victory starts here. Well, thanks, General Funk, for his remarks this morning. I want to highlight two things. First of all, a good idea is not great until it's shared. This is all about sharing. We have set up many ways for you to share your expertise, you as participants to share your expertise inside this event, through the chat room, through your questions, writing at the Mad Sci Lab, uh, you know, volunteering yourself for a podcast or for some other opportunity to discuss your expertise uh, through our virtual and physical platforms that we operate. So uh, that's a critical comment there. And then also to highlight uh, General Funk's point about uh, moving our recruiting into virtual space. So the virtual space and how we're connecting with the youth today is an opportunity. But like many opportunities, there's a corresponding challenge. So this weaponized information discussion is critical because our adversaries will attempt to intercede in our ability to recruit the best and the brightest through our virtual platforms, through traditional cyber attacks, through information operations focused on our youth, and through the full 
spectrum of what we're going to study uh, today and what we've been studying over the last two months. So thank you, General Thont, for those remarks. So we will move on to uh, our opening remarks today by Dr. Ben Buchanan. Dr. Ben Buchanan is the Director of External Affairs and Outreach for the Center for Security Studies. He's Assistant Teaching Professor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. The full bios for all of our presenters have been sent to you and are online. Uh, so usually we'll just mention a couple of points about uh, these presenters, but Dr. Buchanan, as I read his bio, it really jumped out at me. Uh, his journal articles and peer-reviewed papers he's written on artificial intelligence, attributing cyber attacks, deterrence in cyber operations, cryptography, election cybersecurity, a lot of these elements are encompassed within this idea of weaponized information. So we are uh, very excited to have Dr. Ben Buchanan uh, provide the opening remarks today for our weaponized information session. Dr. Buchanan, you're up. All right, thank you all very much. I'm gonna trust that the video is working and I'm going to, to uh, echo uh, Mr. Grubb's remarks about how grateful we are uh, to have all of you here uh, joining us. I speak on behalf of Georgetown University where uh, I'm a professor in uh, the Department of Security Studies and a senior faculty fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology. I'll be brief, but I wanted to share a few thoughts about information itself and why um, we would have a, a conference like this and why information is so important in my view to the practice of, of statecraft today. And, and fundamentally, uh, information is about uncertainty. If you go back to the very dawn of information theory in 1948, worked out by a mathematician named Claude Shannon, he posited that the value of information is essentially at a mathematical level, it can reduce uncertainty. And what's remarkable to me is how this plays out in two different and intertangled ways. We've built over the last seven decades or so a remarkable mathematical or computer science theory for how to handle, process, and share information, how we manage this uncertainty in a technical and mathematical sense. What's also remarkable is that over uh, many millennia, sometimes without knowing it, sometimes in the modern age more deliberately, we've built a theory that's less mathematical, that thinks about how information moves through intangible environments, like the geopolitical one, like environments of athletic competition, like our own understanding of ideas uh, and the like. And what's remarkable is that these two environments, the technical formal environment where we manage uncertainty and communicate it, and the intangible, messy, interconnected world that we've built continually interact. And what I've tried to do in my research and what we try to do at Georgetown University the Center for Security and Emerging Technology is think about how, amongst other things, these different environments fit together. Think about how we manage uncertainty, both in a technical sense and in an intangible sense. And what's great about this subject, what's fascinating about this subject is that it's really hard, that we are continually pushing at these frontiers of both technical understanding, what technologies can do, particular technologies that are still emerging like artificial intelligence or cyber operations, and also what the effects of those technologies will be uh, on our society, on our military capabilities, and on more generally speaking, our geopolitical environment. And it's heartening to me to see a conference like this uh, come together. I deserve no credit for it whatsoever, but there are some great teams uh, at the Army Mad Scientist Group and at Georgetown University that have helped put this together because you're getting at this subject from a variety of different ways. And over the course of the day today, you'll see how um, different angles on this subject uh, come together and how uh, I think we get an understanding for a cross-cutting subject like this only by exploring it from different angles because it is so interconnected. So some of the folks that, that you'll hear from today are Keith Law, uh, whose work I, I've been a fan of for a long time back when he was at, at ESPN and now at The Athletic. Uh, when I when I first saw his name on on one of these documents, I thought, well, it's got to be a different Keith Law. There's no way we could have a, a baseball writer thinking about this subject. And then I realized, no, this is exactly the kind of people we should be having because this is the Army Mad Scientist Conference, and uh, Mr. Law has written a lot about the role of information and, and analytics in sports, and uh, has written some good books and the like on the subject. So he's exactly the kind of person uh, who I'm happy to to have kick off the day 
uh, for us as a formal speaker. And we've also got folks who are, are more squarely uh, in the realm of information operations and the like. Uh, one of our Georgetown adjunct professors, Olga Belgoglava, um, is, is famous at Georgetown for teaching a class called Lies and Disinformation, in which students think about how do you carry out disinformation operations? What makes disinformation operation successful? Again, an entirely different element of managing this uncertainty, trying not to cut through it in the sense of what Keith Law might talk about to make a better decision to win in a competition, but trying to foster disinformation, trying to foster uncertainty uh, to, to win uh, a competition between nations or online. So it's remarkable to me the different ways uh, we will use to approach uh, the subject, uh, the different uh, aspects of the problem that we'll study here. But what's also remarkable is the degree to which it fundamentally is still about uncertainty. And as we go through the day today, I encourage you to keep this uncertainty in mind, to, to keep in mind this notion that so much of information at its very core is about the communication and management of uncertainty. And that has two fundamental components to it. The first is a very mathematical one, which is probably not terribly intuitive to most of us who haven't studied information theory. But the second is a more intangible one. And a lot of the time um, we build systems in society to manage uncertainty, to manage ambiguity. Rarely do we confront those systems head on. That's what we're trying to do today. And I'm very grateful that we're able to do that and to think about how uncertainty is managed and how in a competitive environment, uh, like the one that the Training and Doctrine Command is preparing uh, our soldiers to, to fight and to win, uh, we can manage uncertainty better. So with that, I will turn it back over to our MC and our terrific team, but please know that I'm, I'm grateful on behalf of Georgetown University for everyone who has made this possible uh, and for all of you for joining us today. I only wish we could have done this in person, but it is fitting uh, for a conference about information that we could do it in such a dis disparate and interconnected way. Thanks very much. Okay, sorry for the delay there. I got a lot of moving parts. So my name is, is Matt Sanispert. Um, I'm on the Army Mad Scientist team, as Lee alluded to. Um, Dr. Buchanan, thank you for that intro. Um, and thank you for the intro to Keith Law. You said a lot of what I was gonna say. So we're gonna get right into our keynote speaker today, as uh, Dr. Buchanan alluded to. Um, so in this industry, you'll hear a lot the term inside baseball when somebody wants to talk about the inner workings of a process in the army or showing you something behind the scenes. And they use it kind of tongue in cheek, but um, at Mad Scientist, we're not joking around. We are going inside baseball today and there's a good reason for it. So our keynote speaker today is Keith Law. He is currently um, um, senior baseball writer at The Athletic. He was previously a lead prospect writer at ESPN. And before that, he was literally inside baseball as special assistant to the general manager for the Toronto Blue Jays. So how does that relate to what we're doing today? Well, Keith just wrote a book called The Inside Game, and in it, he looks at the behavioral science side of decision-making. What are our cognitive biases? How do they affect how we think? How do they affect the decisions we make? And he wraps it all up expertly in the analogy of baseball, because that is our national pastime, and that's something everyone is familiar with. And it makes for a very interesting read, since we can all relate to that, and it'll help us better understand how we make our decisions. Um, so what, we're gonna, what we've asked Keith to do today is kind of talk about those cognitive biases, talk about how they affect our decision-making based on the information we get because disinformation campaigns are effective because we are susceptible to them. So Keith's gonna help us think about why we're susceptible to those things and he's gonna talk about those cognitive biases. And I know we're just a few minutes early, but Keith, if you're ready, I will hand it over to you and the, the virtual floor uh, will be yours. Keith, are we there? Let's try. Everybody stand by for just a second. We'll see if Keith can hear us. He's in the participant list. And oh, okay, we've got them and we'll spotlight them. Okay, thanks Keith, thanks for being here and the floor is yours. 
Oh, sure thing. We're starting a little early here. Yes. Hello, everybody. For that. No, that's okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. For folks who don't know me or any of my background, uh, my name is Keith Law. I am a senior baseball writer for The Athletic. I previously was at ESPN for 13 years. Prior to that, I worked for the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, in the front office as a special assistant to the general manager, although I have sort of casually described myself as a one-man stats department. If that sounds impressive, I promise you that it's actually not. That, uh, in fact, most of the analytics work that I was doing at the time could be done on a laptop just like the one I'm sitting on now. I could do most of the work in Excel or Access. Uh, it is a very... Uh, pale imitation of what stats departments for most professional sports teams look like today. I have also written two books. The first one was called Smart Baseball, which was about baseball statistics, which ones are more or less useful for talking about player performance and maybe for looking forward to what you think players might do in the future. I think the reason I'm here today is actually because of my second book, which came out in April called The Inside Game, uh, which in which I discuss cognitive biases or cognitive illusions in the, and explain them using concrete examples from baseball history, recent and actually well into the past, and talk about them in uh, a way that I hope that people who have no background in, say, cognitive psychology or behavioral economics, because these concepts kind of cross over between the two. If you've had no background in either of the two, hopefully it won't matter. Hopefully you can understand what I'm explaining in the book. And also because they're baseball examples, I hope that makes them a little bit more entertaining. So there were a couple that I'd highlighted from the book today that I thought might be particularly relevant to the theme of this conference and uh, just generally to any discussion of how people try to use information to mislead or to manipulate people into making bad decisions. Uh, I think it's particularly relevant now because we're in the uh, because of the ongoing pandemic. And there was an example on Monday uh, where the governor of Missouri, Mike Parson, claimed that kids could go to school because they'd get the coronavirus, but they would just get over it. Now that's sort of based a little bit on actual data that shows that children are far less likely to get seriously ill from coronavirus, and they also seem to be maybe half as likely to pass the virus along to other people, particularly to other adults. So that's not entirely wrong, but it is something that has been, uh, I think, repeated often enough that people have started to believe, oh, kids can't get sick from the coronavirus. And I just responded pointing out that there have actually been 31 child deaths age 14 and under from coronavirus so far this year. And I was inundated the rest of the day with these COVID-19 truthers, some of whom appeared to actually just be bots, repeating the same talking points about how flu is just as deadlier. Now talk about the flu and the pneumonia and pneumonia. If we closed schools because of the flu, then if we closed it because of coronavirus, we'd have to close it because of flu. Or uh, many people brought up Sweden's example, obviously, Sweden's taken a very different approach to the coronavirus. Or they'd say, well, what about car crashes? That's another popular one. I wasn't aware that car crashes were actually contagious, but people seem to like that to bring that up as some sort of analogy. This isn't new. I, I grapple with people on Twitter a lot, particularly on when I'm advocating for just basic science and run into science deniers or other anti-science people. It comes up with anti-vaxxers. It comes up with people who say that masks that don't actually work to stop the spread of the virus. Uh, it's come up with 9-11 hoaxers. The one thing they all have in common though is, especially when, you get, when you're on Twitter and you argue with a number of them or just have a number of them coming at you, what you realize is they say the same things over and over again. They are just repeating things that they've probably heard or read multiple times and come to believe that they're true. That is a phenomenon known as the illusory truth effect, where the, the mere fact of finding out, of, of hearing or reading something repeatedly actually makes your brain more likely to accept that it's true. Uh, regardless of the actual truth value of the underlying statement. That, that is the ultimate problem here. And so these people 
these science deniers just in general will hear or read something untrue. One of the, I think one of the most common examples that many of you might have heard is people who say the mercury found in vaccines causes autism. They hear it enough that they believe that it's true. And then they turn around and repeat the same claim kind of ad nauseum on social media, Twitter, Facebook. Facebook, I think, is actually the worst for anti-vaxxers. Even though that statement I just made, despite having, what does it have, six words in it, the mercury in vaccine causes autism. There are two fundamental errors in that. One is that childhood mandatory vaccines actually don't contain any mercury in any form. Vaccines never contained elemental mercury or methyl mercury, which is the form of mercury that is poisonous, that is toxic to us. Some vaccines used to contain a compound called dimerosol, a preservative, that had mercury in it, but it was bound up in a way that the body did not have any problem metabolizing it, and it did not bioaccumulate. It was not actually harmful. That's a compound called ethyl mercury. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that vaccines don't cause autism, and we have so many studies and studies of studies that show absolutely no connection between vaccinations and autism. This is a bogus claim that actually started because of a fraudulent research paper published about 22 years ago in The Lancet, which did ultimately retract it after far too long. And that claim was based on completely fabricated data. And yet it has stuck with us and people continue to repeat the claim. And I, I believe at least a large part of this is because that there are people who maybe have some questions about vaccines or are just sort of chemophobic. We have a lot of people who are just afraid of anything chemical or anything that's not natural. They go online, they read about it. There's plenty of bad information out there about vaccines as there is bad information about essentially any health topic at this point. And they read it often enough and they read these sort of carefully or trickily worded phrases that once they read them enough times, they say, oh, vac maybe vaccines do cause autism. Oh, maybe masks don't work to prevent the cor coronavirus. These people aren't naturally unintelligent, but we're all prey to something like to these cognitive biases or illusions like the illusory truth effect. It could happen to any of us. And you really have to have, I think, a pretty good skeptic response to that, uh, to any new information that you see that especially at first glance, might appear to be inaccurate or somewhat misleading. And in that case, in these cases, it becomes dangerous. The information becomes weaponized because these people then turn around and go online, go into social media spaces and repeat the same thing. And I think in the case of what happened to me on Monday with these COVID-19 you know, reopen school people, most of them didn't follow me. So they appeared to be searching for comments on COVID-19 in schools, or perhaps somebody else who I didn't see maybe retweeted me to criticize me to tell other people, oh, go after, go respond to this person and, uh, and point out why we should reopen schools. And I'm not actually staking out a hard position here on reopening of schools. I'm just talking about the way that information was wielded against me for not even making a claim about whether we should open schools or not. I merely pointed out that what Governor Parson had said specifically was not accurate, was not supported by actual data. In the inside game, I have a chapter dedicated to the illusory truth effect. That's true of the couple of these topics I, I'm going to talk about today. I talk about it in terms of baseball, uh, one, because that's obviously what I do. And also, I think if you're a baseball fan at all, or just generally a sports fan, you can probably come up with or follow some of these examples of these oft repeated nuggets of wisdom that people just assume are true, even though in many cases, we have actual research showing that these things aren't true. In the book, I talk about things like clutch hitting, lineup protection, or the hot hand, which is one of my favorites to talk about because every couple of years, it seems that we have some new research paper that claims, no, 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 the hot hand is real. And most of the time, if not all of the time, these papers turn out to be somewhat flawed. I highlight two of them in the book and talk about why those papers aren't true. Yet people still believe in all of these things, people within baseball, people who would otherwise tell you that they view themselves as fairly progressive thinkers, as evidence-based thinkers, that they have bought into the types of statistical analysis that have now become de rigueur throughout Major League Baseball, but they'll still tell you that one or more of these things is true. That lineup protection, the idea that you can be a better hitter, a substantially more productive hitter, if there's a better hitter hitting behind you in the lineup. 
the idea there being that pitchers would say, well, I don't want to pitch to Keith Law because, oh, Mike Trout is hitting behind him. So, or sorry, the, I, the other way around that I'm going to have to pitch to Keith Law because I don't want to walk him so that Mike Trout is coming up behind him. So I would, Mike Trout is batting behind me in the lineup. Well, I'm more likely to get strikes or I'm more likely to see fastballs because pitchers aren't going to try to pitch around me to get to the weaker hitter behind me in the lineup. The premise there is not entirely flawed. However, it's just not true. We have actual research, actual evidence showing that that's not true, showing that there is no such thing as a hitter who raises his game in the clutch, the so-called clutch hitter. Regardless of the fact there are players who actually have nicknames that supposedly refer to their ability to perform in the clutch. Again, evidence does not actually support these contentions. That's true of the hot hand. It's particularly true of uh, it, a slightly different phenomenon I experienced firsthand while working in Major League Baseball, which is the way that certain players are tagged as being winning players or non-winning players. And after a while, I started to realize that that was a bit of coded language, that I would often hear the term winning players referring to white players, uh, even to white, particularly to white players who maybe weren't all that talented, but seemed to play hard. The, the impression that people had was that they would play hard. And that the opposite, the, he's not a winning player, he's non, a non-winning player, however you want to phrase it, would much more often be applied to players of color, whether they were black players, players of Latin American descent. It's far more common to hear that term applied to those types of players. Now, that's a bit more difficult to prove or disprove the existence of such a thing, but people accept this idea that that's a winning player and that's not a winning player, because if you grow up in the sport, you hear it all the time. You just hear, oh, he's a winning player. Oh, he's a heady player, he's a cerebral player. Uh, he's got good instincts or he's got poor instincts. He's got good feel for the game. You accept that these things are true and that they're applied accurately if you come up within that sport, within the culture of a specific sport. Now, I came in at age 28 and I had not come up in the sport. I've been a baseball fan all my life, but I did not come up through the culture of baseball. So I had not been exposed to all of these things the same way that pretty much everybody around me, players, coaches, scouts, executives, they'd all come up within a specific culture. And many of them, I think, hadn't even really thought to question what they were hearing, what things were repeated to them, all of these things that I've just listed to you here as possible examples of the illusory truth effect at work in baseball. So I had the advantage of just coming in from the outside. And I think that is one of the arguments for how to combat the illusory truth effect. I mean, the easiest thing is to say any of these repeated statements, anything you can, you should apply actual evidence to try to evaluate whether it's true or not. But it's also true that you can take somebody who comes in from outside of your culture, who may not have been exposed to the same repetition, the same kind of manipulative talk, and see what they think and look at their reactions. They are more likely to look at these things with a fresh set of eyes if they have not been exposed to something so frequently that they start to believe that it's true and forget to ask the simple questions of, well, what does the evidence say? Does the evidence say that these things are, are actually true? Are they actually supported by data? Another example of a cognitive bias um, that I discuss in the book, or like, again, this is one that's sort of bridges between cognitive psychology and particularly behavioral economics in this case is something called moral hazard. Uh, and that's one of, of everything I discussed in the book. It's the first one that I ever actually heard of because I had studied economics as an undergrad. And moral hazard is one of the few things of everything in the book. It was one of the only things that I actually was taught in economics classes as an undergrad. Uh, even in classical economics, they do talk about moral hazard. And the example I've given pretty frequently, especially when talking on the radio, throughout this spring leading up to what appears to be the start of a major league baseball season on Thursday, at least I hope it is, is that look, owners and players, obviously they both wanted to play. They both wanted to have a season and they both benefit from us having a season. The owners get quite a bit of revenue. In this case, it's just broadcast revenue, television revenue, and streaming revenue from having games, no games, no revenue. So, the equation is relatively simple for them. And it is for players too. Players don't get paid if there's no season. They are paid pro rata based on how many games they played. So obviously they wanted to play as many games as possible. But playing no games was a poor solution really for both sides here. But the incentives here were asymmetrical. 
in that players are the ones who actually incur the risk in the situation. Players are the ones, and this is true also of coaches, trainers, other staffers, stadium operations people. So when I, I'm talking about players, I'm talking about everybody on that side, everybody who actually has to go to work here and go to the facility, go to a stadium and potentially be exposed to the virus. Now, most of these players are, are probably low risk given their age and lack of underlying health conditions. But we do know of many players who do have underlying health conditions. And what we don't know is many players may have close family members who have underlying health conditions or, or who are otherwise high risk, perhaps just due to age, if they live with a parent, for example. So players and the, everyone on that side of the negotiating table, essentially, they face real risks. There is an actual cost, potential cost, which we can roughly estimate to playing games this year. Owners, on the other hand, have no cost. You could be a Major League Baseball owner, and you can put on a season this year, and you can incur absolutely zero cost. You don't have to leave the house. And I think that was lost in a lot of the media coverage of the negotiations between the owners and the players. And I felt like I was screaming into the void sometimes to try to reemphasize, no, this is not the same. These two sides are not equal. And what owners were, uh, I, mean, I think owners were acting rationally in their case, but it's because there was this asymmetry here of risk. All of the risk was on one side. Owners were able to, are able to put on a season without assuming any of those risks and probably without facing any consequences if they take on too much risk, if they did not necessarily put enough health and safety procedures or protocols in place to minimize the chances of an outbreak coming from a major league baseball facility. That phenomenon where essentially you're not paying the costs of your actions, specifically of the risks that you incur, is something known as moral hazard. And it is, as I said, a well-studied problem in economics. It goes back more than 200 years that people have identified this. It is the reason we have an insurance industry, and it is also one of the issues that people have with the insurance industry. If you know your car is insured, will you be a little bit more careless maybe when driving? Because you know someone will pay for it if you get in an accident. That is a problem that insurers face all the time. It is a huge problem in professional sports. And the examples that I talk about in the book are where we have general managers of teams who are very frequently asked to sign free agent players to contracts that extend much farther into the future than the general manager's own contract or own expected job security would last. The best example one I give in the book is uh, when Jerry DePoto was the general manager of Los Angeles Angels after the 2011 season, he gave Albert Pujols, with the full consent and support of his owner at the time, a 10-year contract. That contract expires after next season. Uh, Jerry DePoto has not been the general manager of Los Angeles Angels for more than four years now. And his contract was due to expire far sooner than Albert Pujols' contract was. And it turns out DePoto actually stepped down uh, before his own contract had even expired. He got to leave, got to go to Seattle, and has actually, I think, done a much better job as general manager there than he was doing when he was general manager of the Angels. But the Angels are left with the bill, essentially. They still have Al Albert Pujols' contract. Now, that contract turned out to be pretty much a disaster from day one. But the worst part of the contract, and everybody knew at the time that the Angels signed him to that contract, was going to be the back half of the contract when Pools was going to be too old to be a productive major league player. And that has absolutely turned out to be the case. Uh, it turned out to be the case, I think, sooner and more severely than we had originally understood. But it has absolutely turned out to be true. And Jerry DePoto has not been the one who's had to bear those costs. He got to walk away. This happens all the time. And it often happens, that's a case where DePoto resigned and he was able, he made the choice to walk away from that. But we have had plenty of general managers who've signed players to extremely long-term deals and then been fired. Dave Dombrowski, who was president general manager of the Detroit Tigers, again, with the full consent of his owner, gave Miguel Cabrera a contract that has about a billion years left on it. It's a question of whether, will that contract end first or will we get to the heat death of the universe? I don't know. It's pretty close. 
that contract had barely extension for Miguel Cabrera because he was already under contract, had barely kicked in when Dombrowski was pushed out by ownership, eventually went to the Red Sox. You all know what's happened since there. Again, this isn't even a specific criticism of DePoto or Dombrowski. The incentives were such that uh, they knew that they could sign these players to these fairly risky long-term contracts because there was a pretty good chance that both general managers wouldn't be around to face the actual costs of those contracts when the contracts went sour. Another example I didn't talk about in the book, but that just came to mind the other day as I was continuing to think about the topic to prepare for this talk, when Jim Bowden was the interim general manager of the Washington Nationals during the brief period when Major League Baseball owned the club before selling it to the learners who now own the team, his Bowden's time horizon as general manager was very short. He was interim. He knew that the team could be sold and he could be replaced immediately. Yet for some very strange reason, Major League Baseball gave him carte blanche to operate as general manager as if he were the permanent person in the position. And he went out and signed two free agents, two fairly mediocre position player free agents, Vinny Castilla and Christian Guzman, to multi-year contracts. And in the process, gave up two draft picks. He gave up the second and third round draft picks for the following year for the 2005 draft, which as it turns out has turned into an incredibly strong draft. That was probably rational for Bowden to do in that situation because his chances to keep his job or really to audition for another job at some point as general manager depended far more on the nationals being good in 2005 or just better than expectations than on waiting till June 2005, getting two more draft picks, taking two more players who would then go into the minor leagues and potentially take years to get to the majors. It was rational in that sense because there were no protocols, there was no set of incentives put into place to encourage Bowden as an interim GM to operate for the long-term good of the franchise. He was given, as I said, carte blanche, and he did probably what was in his own best interests in that position, which was, let me make this team as good as possible because I have no idea when the team's going to get sold. And if we win 10 more games over the course of the season, that might either let me keep my job or improve my chances to get another job somewhere else. As it turns out, he did keep his job and he remained the general manager for several more years before he was fired for completely unrelated reasons and replaced by Mike Rizzo, who is still the general manager today of the Nationals. Moral hazard, as I said, is an old and well-identified and I think relatively well-understood problem in behavioral economics. And the solution is relatively simple. As long as you go in understanding when you have the this asymmetry of risk and what often comes into play in terms of time horizons where someone is asked to think about the good of the organization for some period of time beyond when that person is likely to be employed by the organization or simply employed in that specific role. He may be reassigned to a different job. He could be promoted to a different job, but you don't want situations where people are promoted or reassigned out of a job and essentially leave a mess for someone else to clean up. And the way that you do that is to try to set up to realign the incentives for all of your decision makers so that you bring the time horizons closer together or so that the decision makers are forced in some sense to confront the costs or the risks of the actions that they take and that they're rewarded for taking actions that uh, are better aligned with the actual interests of the organization. Again, whether that be in the short term or in the long term. The third of the problems that I discuss in the book that I thought I could bring up today, uh, also more from the behavioral economics side and another one that might be more familiar to those of you in the audience uh, is the problem of sunk costs. And we, it's probably the one that all of us face the most frequently. And I will never forget when I was in graduate school and took an economics class, Professor Rajan, who's now at the University of Michigan, this was at uh, Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon when I was taking his class. The example he gave, because I think this was maybe just after a holiday, was when you get that new treadmill uh, for Christmas or for whatever. And of course, right away you use it because it's new. It's the novelty and you want to get in shape. And then after a few weeks, you get tired of it because we all do. And then your decision on whether or not to and how often to use it starts to be, well, God, I spent $600 on that thing. I really should use it. And that's emotionally satisfying in a way, but it is not rational. 
a sunk cost is uh, a cost that you've, it's already spent, regardless of whether you use that treadmill to exercise or use it to hang your clothes, you've already spent that money and it's not coming back. You're not spending more to use it. You're not getting some sort of refund when you use it. Now you may feel like you're extracting value from the treadmill, but you should not be comparing the value that you extract from using it to what you spent on it in the first place. The money's already gone. And I bring up the example in the book, Albert Pujols kind of takes a bit of a beating in the inside game. I understand he's a very nice guy. His contract is just particularly useful for demonstrating some of these problems. And in the case of Albert Pujols, as I said, that contract went south pretty quickly. And by his second year with the Angels, it was clear they'd made a colossal mistake and that they were never really going to get anything close to value, fair value out of the Pujols contract. They were not going to get baseball production out of him commensurate with what they were paying him. That said, he reached a point pretty quickly where the best thing for the Angels to do, just in terms of their goal of winning baseball games, was to start playing pools less. There was a point where it would have made sense to platoon him, so maybe only play him against left-handed pitchers and maybe selected right-handed hitters. Pitchers, there has certainly come a point since then where the best thing to do with pools would be to bench him or even to release him outright. They have done none of those things. He has continued to play full-time, every day, whenever he's been healthy enough to do so. That is absolutely irrational in this case. And it is, I think, a pretty clear example of the sunk cost fallacy at work. The Angels are not the only ones to fall prey to this. In this case, I think it is particularly coming from the owner because the decision to play pools regularly, every day essentially, has continued through a general manager change. Jerry Yapoto was the general manager. He left. He was replaced by Billy Epler. They have continued to play Albert Pujols every day. That leads me to believe that the command to do so has come from above those guys. And so in this case, the right thing to do would be to say, Albert Pujols is not a productive enough major league player to take up one of the 25, now 26 spots on our major league roster. And therefore we should release him. The counter argument that the sunk cost fallacy will bring up, and someone in the room will absolutely say this, I have been in these conversations in front offices, I don't believe that this has changed enough that you wouldn't hear this anymore, is we're paying him $30 million this year. How could we pay him $30 million to not play, to be off our roster, or to be on the bench for that matter? And the answer to that is that money is already spent. That is a sunk cost. Whether Pujols is DHing every day or is on the bench or is at home, the angels would owe him the same amount of money that because that money is already guaranteed contracts in baseball are more or less completely guaranteed. So the amount of money that the angels have to pay pool holes this year is fixed and sunk cannot be changed. How much they play him, whether they keep him on the roster is immaterial. The cost does not change. Therefore, the decision of whether to play Pujols at all should solely be based on what his expected productivity will be. If we play Pujols every day, if we play him part-time, if we don't play him, if we kick him off the roster completely, what makes the Angels the best team on the field? Are there ways that they could deploy Pujols that maybe would make him more productive just by playing him less, given his age? Would he be better with rest? Would he be better if they selected which pitchers he faced? Those are all rational considerations. How much they're paying him is not a rational consideration. And that is essentially the sunk cost fallacy. And the solution to that is also, I think, fairly straightforward. Anytime you are trying to make a decision like this, whether it's talking about a baseball player or talking about maybe a fixed piece of equipment, whether it's something in your house or something at work, your decision on what to do should be based on actual benefits and actual costs that are variable, that can change depending on how you use the player, the laborer, or the capital in this case. You should explicitly exclude any costs that are sunk, that are already committed and are invariable as a result. And once you lay out these costs explicitly, and I do it like this because, of course, I'm picturing a spreadsheet. You want to write this down. You want to have this clear in front of everybody so you can see, no, that, that fixed cost is just 
not there. The decision of whether to get on the treadmill or not has nothing to do with how much we spent on that treadmill in the first place because that money is already gone and it's not coming back. And I do think this is in particular, everything I discuss in the book, probably the easiest one to address just by writing everything down, by showing these are the actual variable costs and variable benefits of the decision that we're making. And once you have them laid out in front of you and record, and then the sunk cost is not there, it's much easier to make the rational choice and also to combat the person in the room who says, but we paid $10,000 for that piece of equipment. We have to use it. That's a completely human response, but it is fallacious and it's going to lead to bad decisions. And the very last thing I wanted to talk about just really briefly before opening this up to some questions, uh, and this came uh, from something I was just talking about recently on a podcast. I was asked about how, particularly in this environment now where we're seeing a lot of teams let go of scouts, how teams are using and should be using human scouts to go out and see players and evaluate players versus the advancing technology, which runs from video to new measurement devices. Uh, to gather information and to weigh that information to make decisions on players, whether this is to draft players or to acquire players uh, from other teams, maybe through trades. And my answer was, and this is my own philosophy more than anything else, was that we should figure out, teams should figure out what does the technology do much better than the humans can do? And use that to free up what the humans, what the scouts can do better than the technology can do. And the example I'd like to give, and I've given this for a couple of years now, because I've even recognized this myself, uh, because I go out and see players when, when we don't have a pandemic and we have minor league games, I go out and evaluate players myself as if I were a scout. And I don't really need anyone to tell me now that that pitcher, Joey Bag of Donuts, he's got really high spin on his curveball. He's got tight rotation on his curveball. I still use that language myself for descriptive purposes. But guess what? We can actually measure the revolutions per minute on a curveball. On any pitch, we get spin rates. Anytime there is a tracking device, TrackMan, Rapsodo, there are other, any of these technologies that allow us to measure or even just estimate the spin rate on a pitch, that's going to be more accurate than what a human scout, myself included, could tell you about that pitch. And I can tell you what it looks like. And I do like to do that just for the purposes of explaining things to the audience. They don't get to see the picture. But the truth is, it's much more beneficial, I think, especially if you're in a front office and trying to make a financial decision on a player, whether it's a draft, trade, a signing, to have the actual spin rate. Maybe the average spin rate, the range of spin rates, so you see how much it varies. So I would say to scouts, if you want to write that down, fine. But figuring out What's the spin rate like on a pitcher's curveball? I don't really need you to do that anymore. Instead, I want you to do the things that we're not getting from those devices. Talk to me about the pitcher's athleticism, about his delivery, consistency of his release point, consistency of his arm swing in back. How well does he seem to go from pitching from the windup to the stretch? And how does he respond to adversity in certain situations? How is he with runners on base? Does he seem to be calling his own game? Do you notice more or less confidence with certain pitches? There are many softer aspects of player evaluation that we're, never, we're probably never going to get from a machine. I don't know that I want to get them from a machine. I know what the machines can do. I know what they can tell us, and they can tell us those things better than humans will ever be able to tell us. So I would tell scouts, I want you to spend less time evaluating the stuff that we're getting from TrackMan. It is a better use of your time and you're giving us more useful information if you focus on the things that only you can do from your years of scouting, years of evaluating players, from the pattern recognition that's happening in your mind. And this player reminds me of these other players. And I see his delivery. I see his swing. I see his stance. That's reminding me of these other guys. And then we can sit down and talk about how did those other guys progress? What, do, what did you see that we could take and operationalize into different kinds of information to do some historical comparisons, for example. There are things that human scouts will continue to do that we will never be able to get from machines. And now that we have these machines that can evaluate things like velocity, launch angle, exit velocity, we should accept that 
and say, the job of the scout has changed now. We're going to take these things away from you because the computers, the technology can do that better, but we're going to allow, hopefully allow you to focus on the things that you do better as in-person evaluators. So that's just some of the topics that I tried to talk about in the inside game. There's, I think, 12 or 13 of these cognitive biases or illusions that I go through over the course of the book. Um, outcome bias, another one, availability bias, recency bias. Some of these are terms you might have heard, especially if you've read maybe Thinking Fast and Slow or other books in the field. I hope that my book can, if you haven't seen it yet and you do choose to pick it up, that it can serve as an entree for you into this world. There are a lot of really great books written on cognitive psychology and behavioral economics. And many of them just assume a little bit more of a background. Hopefully mine can serve as an introduction. And if you find it useful, I have a list of books at the back that I suggest for further reading that can take you in a lot of different directions. And I hope, uh, I hope I stoke your interest and then you can go on to read some of the real experts, the folks who've done the research themselves and find out more about how these biases play out in our everyday lives and in society. And it will allow you to make better decisions in your own personal life. Uh, and with that, I would love to open this up to questions. I see questions here in the chat panel, so I'm assuming I should just sort of jump in and uh, start to answer them. I'm actually going to go from the bottom up here. Uh, let's see. So from Ian, would you have the scouts study the data before they watch a player? I love that question because scouts talk about that question all the time. Uh, do you want to look at the stat sheet? Now, typically we're just talking about what looking at the player's basic performance. But I think you're also asking, Ian, you're asking about would I have the player maybe see the track man data, see the spin rates, see, see exit velocity and launch angle before they go see the player. My answer, and this even, and I apply this to myself, is no. And that's because of another bias that I haven't talked about today called anchoring bias. Essentially, I'm going to oversimplify a little bit. But if you tell me that Joey Bag of Donuts here has a very high spin rate on his curveball. What do you think I'm going to see? I'm going to see a high spin curveball. You've already told me that. You've put it in my mind. And I'm going to be on the lookout for it and watch that curveball and be like, whoa, that's a high spin curveball. Is it really? I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, I mean, that's what the data says. But I'm not going to get different information once you've fixed that in my mind. Now, there are situations you can't avoid. Right? If you're sending me out to see an elite prospect who's really well known, I probably know some of that information going in. That's particularly true for me, right? Because I, as a writer, am not originating these reports. I go out to see players in a typical environment where they've already been identified for me as top prospects, whether it's in the draft or in professional baseball. I know who I'm going to see. It's very, very rare that I go to a ballpark and walk out writing or planning to write about a player who I didn't know going in. That is, I think, more true for scouts, uh, particularly those on the amateur side, whether it's the draft or the international players we see signing out of, say, the Dominican Republic or other countries uh, beyond the U.S. and Canada. That I think it is more true that uh, those scouts can go in with no information, that they can go in blind, so to speak, and let their eyes, let the, I always use the expression, let the players come to you. I can, if you sent me to a ballpark and no, gave me no information on who was who, all I had was uniform numbers, I'm going to know who the good players are. And that's not because I'm such a good evaluator. It's because they stand out. The lower the level of baseball, the more they stand out. And so I would take that attitude towards the scouting staff. We can absolutely give you that information that you're looking for on players after you've gone to see them. But when you walk into that ballpark, go in cold, as cold as you possibly can, and let the good players come to you. Who jumps out at you? Even if you walk out of the ballpark and say, I'm not even sure why I liked that guy, but I liked that guy. That's information. Now, I'd like something a lot more specific. It's hard to operationalize data like that, but I still consider it data. And we can dive deeper into, well, why is it that you think you liked that player? Who did he remind you of? There can be a sort of interrogative process here, where, uh, which is more into uh, clinical psychology, but we can try to gather that information from you and see what it is that remind you saw something in that player that triggered some process, some pattern in your mind. Can we do that? Can we get that information out of you? I think we can. I would rather that than you coming out and saying, yeah, I really like that guy. Well, it's because you told me beforehand he was the fifth best prospect in their organization. Of course, I like that guy. 
that's not that useful. So I would not want to bias my scouts in any particular way. Hey, okay, Keith, can I, can I jump in? I'll of get, course. I'll get fired in front of everybody if I lose the reins on this conference. <laughs> um, so can I, I I'm, I'm going to run through a couple more questions. Absolutely. Wrap it up. Yep. Um, Perfect. So, so Mike has a question. I think this relates to the army as an organization here, mm -hmm. this answer that you'll give. If, if sports analytics teams look for market inefficiencies to derive value, what market inefficiencies should the defense department look for in the interest of national security? Um, uh, that's, I don't know. <sighs> and you could answer this even just what, what kinds of ways of thinking should we be looking for to find these efficiencies? Right. Yeah. Well, so the way that teams are looking for these inefficiencies is they're particularly relevant to, to this topic and to this question, I think. Teams, analytics departments, all 30 major league baseball teams have pretty sizable analytics departments at this point. And one thing that they look for is new patterns in the data. They have so much data coming in now. And a lot of the time is spent just like cleaning the data and sorting, be, being, getting the data into a form that's usable. But one of their main goals is looking through the data for patterns that other people haven't identified before. So for example, looking for certain characteristics of pitches that make them more, or I guess less effective against maybe specific categories of hitters. That this came out, for example, in when we started to get this very specific pitch data, physical characteristics of pitches, that certain teams suddenly shifted back, they shifted away from guys who could sink the ball and more towards guys who could throw four seamers, particularly four seamers with higher spin rates and pitch them and throw them up in the zone, at the top of the strike zone or even above the strike zone, because it turned out in the data that we could see in the data that those pitches when thrown to correct spots generated a lot of swings and misses. And that was something that had not been previously identified or recognized, at least not widely enough for teams to chase those as inefficiencies. And one thing that when I was writing Smart Baseball too, at least two different team executives said something to me of the effect that we need to find these things before anybody else does. And that might mean that we chase an inefficiency that's not real because we're looking at data often from a fairly short period of time and assuming that it is conclusive rather than waiting to find out. If we waited to find out, we waited for another year or two of data, we might miss the window completely. So I, this is a bit of a broad question because I don't really know much about how the military works. Um, I wish my dad were here. He would probably be able to tell me more about that. Uh, but it would be, I'm sure you have copious quantities of data. You're looking for, you're sifting the data and looking for patterns that haven't been previously identified. And then you need to make the decision of, What's the cost of jumping early to try to chase that inefficiency, recognizing there's a chance that it is illusory, that, you, that more data will show that, no, it was just a bit of, uh, it was fluky. It was a bit of a small sample size issue. Sometimes you'll decide that the cost to do that is too high. Uh, but sometimes you'll decide, as in these baseball examples, this is often for teams that are just chasing minor league free agents or looking for guys in the 15th round of the draft. Well, the cost, the opportunity cost of a 15th round draft pick is effectively zero. And so that's why teams were sifting through this draft data and saying, you know what, you found that guy at that Division II college in Louisiana who's got this high spin rate four seamer, just take him. Don't even worry about it. There's no cost because the other guy we were going to take in the 15th round probably wasn't a major leaguer anyway. So that's something you'd have to weigh is you're looking for these inefficiencies. You'll think you found them. Figure out what is the cost to jump early before anybody else spots that inefficiency. So I want to ask you a question um, more on kind of a, a you've, you've identified all these cognitive biases and those are the product of years and years of human evolution, and they're there for a reason. But in your opinion, what can we do about them in order to lessen the effects on our decision making? Is there anything we can do from our side to kind of negate these cognitive biases? So the consistent theme, each one of the chapters in the Inside Game ends with some note thoughts, often drawn from the actual research, published research, on how we try to combat some of these cognitive biases, whether at work or in our everyday lives. The one consistent theme you will see if you go through all of those conclusions is that it is about gathering the best data that you can. Most of these can be uh, 
I was going to say defeated, that's too strong, but fought, combated with more information. Now, there are challenges within that. That sounds easy, but of anyone who's here, who's tasked with actually gathering that information understands that, no, that's actually not easy. It's a matter of finding the, finding the right information, getting it, and then making sure that it is accurate and reliable. I mentioned before that teams have, most major league baseball teams have one or more people whose primary job in analytics is data cleaning because they're getting these huge data sets, a terabyte and a half a year of data just from the major leagues. There are a lot of errors in there and they've tried to find algorithmic ways to go through and pull out the error data. But the general answer to combating most of these is to identifying the right information, the right data, and then getting it. That starts with a process and saying, we're aware that moral hazard exists. We're aware that anchoring bias exists. Okay, what information do we need to get so that we can make this decision as rationally as possible? And then setting out a process. Okay, we know what information we need. How do we go get that information? What is that information going to look like when we get it in? Do we have to do anything with that information once we get it to make it usable? And you go through each step of the process around, I say information, it can be actual data, it can be other types. Obviously, we have subjective information that we all use in our decision-making processes. But making sure from the start that you have outlined a process that is evidence-based, that is data-driven, that allows you to see the biases coming. Because one thing I didn't say in the talk today, and I should emphasize, these cognitive biases are not they're every, they, they affect everybody. If you're human, they affect you. This is not an intelligence question. You can't be so smart that you are not prey to these biases. It's just how our brains work. And there's quite a bit of research on that, that's, that these affect everybody and that they're the result probably of evolutionary processes. It's a separate topic, but essentially don't think you're going to be smart enough to just not fall for these. We all fall for them. And it doesn't even matter if you've studied them, if you've got certain some level of intelligence, you went to fancy pants university, it's you are human, you will fall for them. And the, the goal it should always be to understand that you're human and that these cognitive biases apply to you and set up a decision-making process from the start that prepares you to work around them when they do come up because they will. Uh, so our next question comes from Alex Trent and she has, she has a good question about um, which, which will, could relate to how the army operates and how our organizational structure is. So she asks, when baseball wants or needs to modernize, does the change come from the top, the organizational level and work its way down, or does it start at the bottom of the team level and work its way up? That's a great question. I can speak specifically to baseball that this has almost perhaps universally been uh, top down that one by one organizations would change leaders. Uh, and at the start, it was teams just saying, you know what, no one else is doing this stuff. Some GM candidate would come in and say, Hey, no one else is doing this stuff. If we're one of the first two or three teams to go heavy on analytics, we'll have this huge advantage. And it was true. I mean, the Red Sox did that in 2003, and then they won the World Series in 04 and again in 08. And I, frankly, I think it, you could argue that that set them up well to continue winning and continue contending well into the teens. But particularly those first two, did I say 08? They won in 07, right? 04 and 07. They were one of the first. They were the first large market, high payroll team to go heavy on analytics. They were one of the first of any teams to go heavy on analytics. And that was because when Theo Epstein got the job as general manager, he modernized the front office and set up what at the time I think was the largest analytics department. I would say certainly among teams that chose to do analytics at all, the Red Sox were one of the most committed to making it a part of their actual decision-making process. Now, what happened later, more and more teams would set up analytics departments. Some did it on one fell swoop, some did it slowly, but eventually we got to a point where the few teams that didn't, Philadelphia and Arizona were the last two, when their respective GMs were let go, the new guys came in and the first thing they did was hire analytics directors and say, we need to get an analytics department in place immediately because now we're behind. So I do think you could have a situation, I just can't think of one in baseball, where it was kind of grassroots, some sort of skunk works operation that is happening within baseball operations. And some people say, hey, let's do, let's try these new analytics tools. Let's try this out. Once most of the industry has turned in a certain direction, though, it's really got to come top down because you need a pretty large financial commitment to catch up. The Phillies, I know Matt Klintak, I talked to him right after he got the job, and he was saying, you know, we had 
essentially nobody, no infrastructure, no people in analytics. We're looking at other teams that had at the time eight to 15 people. You need a pretty big financial commitment up front to get the technical resources you're looking for, to hire the director you're looking for, and then to staff up in fairly short order just to get to the point where your closest competitors are. Okay, thanks for that. Um, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, although I do want to know one more thing. Is Ryan Howard the preeminent power hitter of our generation? Uh, <laughs> I had to get that in. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. That radio host will never, ever, ever admit he was wrong. And I do kind of enjoy that. I suppose if you're just, if that's who you are as a sports personality, I guess just own it. That, that's right. So, and that's how he makes his living. Um, so I appreciate you coming on. I know this was kind of outside of your wheelhouse. Um, and it was for us, and that's what we like to do. We like to hear divergent thoughts so we can help the Army think differently about the future. So as Lee, I don't know if you saw in the, in the beginning, Lee Grubb showed that um, you will now be proclaimed an official Army mad scientist, so that will be in the mail. Uh, you can hang that on your wall. That is official Army proclamation. And we thank you for coming on, and uh, thanks a lot, Keith. It's my pleasure. Stay safe, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to manage this Zoom the best I can. Um, we're going to transition now to Mr. Lewis Shepard. Uh, let's make sure we have Lewis on here. Okay, everybody stand by. Yeah, you got me. Hope you there can hear is. me. We can hear Start you. My video. Yeah, great. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, Lewis is the Senior Director of Technology Strategy at VMware, the pioneering Silicon Valley virtualization technology company and the world's leading private cloud computing provider. Uh, and as Senior Director of Technology Strategy, he helps shape the strategy for the Palo Alto headquartered VMware Research Group and leads disruptive prototyping efforts of specific relevance to federal government agencies, particularly the national security community. And today, Lewis is going to be talking about a superiority engine for the information environment. So, Lewis, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks very much, Matt and Ian and uh, Luke and everybody else who has uh, been involved in uh, getting this going. Um, I benefit from all the speakers and panels that you've had uh, already in the series. That's phenomenal, including this morning. Um, uh, it's it's it's, it's terrible talking about uh, having to bat right after a superstar. Uh, so that, that was just a great session from Keith, and I really appreciate it, really enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> I will say, though, that uh, these sessions, as I've listened to them over the last uh, few months and delved into it, and, and this discussion over the last uh, couple of years, um, it, it really has been an outstanding litany of nightmarish visions and challenges. Uh, so it's a little on the dark side, uh, Matt. Um, and I've come to think of your sessions like a, uh, a fascinated, frightened child waiting for my next visit to the Disneyland of dystopia. Uh, and uh, this morning, thinking about this, uh, for some reason, I had, you know, uh, the early morning vision from Apocalypse Now, one of the great military films of the last century, uh, that scene on the beach um, after the strains of Wagner have died away, and uh, the M16s are still blazing on the beach as the guys are mopping up uh, uh, the, the beach choked by smoke from the village that's been set ablaze behind them, all the huts burning, and Colonel Kilgore on the beach looks around and he says his famous line, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. It smells like victory. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about victory out of this fire, uh, one of the readings that you um, suggested for people summed up this information environment sort of woe is me uh, attitude. Uh, I'm going to quote from it. Our lessons are that um, I think this was one of the ones from uh, the, the ADF uh, uh, scholars. Uh, our lessons are that information will be weaponized, that the very infrastructure and components comprising the Internet of Things battle space have already been penetrated, compromised, or optimized for our adversary's use. The Army should prepare to operate in an information environment optimized for our adversary's exploitation. 
And uh, I, I heard a, a bit of that theme in General Funk's excellent uh, opening remarks. It's difficult, he said, for the truth to penetrate the information environment. Well, I'm going to make a case for optimism and a strategy that I, I like to think of as uh, inherent overmatch uh, and sketch, sketch some opening thoughts about introducing ways to seize the initiative by operationalizing truth and the wheelhouse of a free society. Uh, let, let's not mistake our goal. Our goal cannot be to eradicate false information. And I think uh, that that kind of a daunting goal is, is what maybe drives a little of the um, negative focus. Uh, I, my favorite American writer, Mark Twain, uh, said, none of us could live with an habitual truth teller, but thank, good of, thank goodness, None of us has to, because there are none. Um, it's, it's not an optimal goal for any military organization anyway, since uh, operationally, um, the, the godfather of war memes, Sun Tzu, said all warfare is based on deception. Uh, so our goal, I think, uh, as a department and as uh, the Army, uh, might be to think about the twin elements of command and control dealing with uncertainty and controlling the tempo of engagement and dis discussing, di diving down into where we can gain advantage in those, in um, dealing with uncertainty and controlling the tempo of engagement in the information environment. So that's really what I'm going to talk about. And that notion of tempo, it's a really important one. You know, you can't read any of these, uh, anything in this field without coming across the quote. And it's always falsely attributed to Winston Churchill or somebody else. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, um, Cordell Hull, <laughs> Secretary of State in World War II, who said a lie will gallop halfway around the world before the truth has time to pull its britches on. Um, now, he, he said it that way, and it's great. A million people have quoted that. Um, that notion of tempo, he, he sort of rewrote um, Jonathan Swift, who a couple of centuries before, he actually wrote, falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it. All right, so tempo, extraordinarily important. And what I'm going to uh, be talking about this morning is uh, a discussion of how we can introduce and use OODA loop thinking into that kind of a race uh, between falsehood and truth. <clears throat> it, it's great that uh, Keith uh, brought up the, the war with uh, the vaxxers that he's unfortunately uh, engaged in, uh, had forced upon him. Uh, I can't really see hands, so I won't ask this audience uh, to raise their hands, but just think about uh, how many people here would intend to take a COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it's tested and available for public vaccinations. Now, I'm going to divine that probably, uh, I know in my circles, maybe, uh, you know, 80, 90 percent of people. I've read studies that the American populace as a whole uh, is uh, slightly south of that, but it's still a majority. Um, and the, the topic of this conference is weaponized information. And that has an effect on us as biological instruments. So it's a kind of bioweapon. Um, uh, I think Ben actually talked about the, the, uh, the hardcore of uh, Claude Shannon's network um, notion of information and then the messy, soft uh, aspects of cognition and uh, conceptual understanding of information. So. So let's use that uh, terminology of a vaccine. If there were a vaccine against the ill effects of disinformation and malevolent weaponized information, how many people here would take that vaccine? So that's really uh, what I'd like to talk about is, can there be such a counter weaponized information vaccine? What would it look like? What are the societal and military impacts if one could be developed and widely deployed? And then perhaps just as importantly, what do we do until then? So in the parlance that we use today uh, about COVID-19, we need to focus in the interim urgently pre-vaccine. We need to focus on therapeutics. 
and treatments and palliatives and health system mitigation and prophylactic prevention measures, the kind of social distancing we're uh, doing at scale here uh, this morning. So we're going to quickly go through some thought experiments uh, uh, here in, in my uh, uh, time. That there are indeed many counter weaponized information therapeutic measures, some of which have already been explored earlier in this uh, series and uh, probably later this afternoon. Um, I think the Global Engagement Center taught. Uh, but we're going to test the premise that there might indeed be a virtual vaccine. So I'll, I'll discuss that. And when I say virtual, uh, you mentioned that uh, my day employer is uh, a company that has that in its name, the uh, virtual machine software company, VMware. Uh, and um, uh, that company uh, grew, it's 20 something years old. It grew by virtualizing, originally virtualizing computation and the operating system. And uh, when you virtualize compute, you wind up having a platform. You can virtualize other layers on top of that. And so we uh, then profitably virtualize uh, networks and storage and uh, data virtualization as a plane uh, on top of that. And layer by layer building up uh, all these abstraction layers. And in reality, that's the key of, uh, of software. It's the magic of software. Uh, it's a very human concept that uh, doesn't need to be thought of only technologically. And so for our information topic, I think it's important to realize that abstraction layers are how we deal with everything. When you think of the game of chess, it's an abstraction layer of warfare, of combat, and of uh, state, state warfare. Uh, with the king and queen and all their pawns and soldiers and knights and rooks. Uh, chess is merely an abstraction. Uh, poetry, much of it, is merely an abstraction. It's so beautiful. The magic of metaphor and simile, uh, all the world's a stage. Once you start thinking about that, all the men and women on it are merely players. That's an abstract depiction of reality. That's information content. Um, each realm in uh, social media, in the operational information environment, uh, the realm of speech, uh, visual information, of video, um, memes are merely abstraction layers in that uh, OIE. Falsity is an abstraction layer, and it can be powerful and latched upon. It can be transparently uh, seen through and, and demolished. Um, truth. Truth is essentially, and I already see in the chat discussion, people saying, well, yeah, but you, truth is, a, you know, it's beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Well, I, I prefer to disagree. So I think that truth is the, use the language of software, is the gold copy, the gold disk. And the point of gold disk software um, really is not merely to have it um, as an icon and to protect it, but to actually use it. So information, information wants to be free. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I would be loath not to point out that uh, this concept of uh, veracity and falsehood as layers on top of each other, sometimes they get a little dense. Uh, Luke Shabro, I think we all love to follow Luke on, uh, on social media, especially LinkedIn. Uh, in the preparation for this, uh, Luke, uh, last week or a few days ago, posted uh, that wonderful meme of a uh, photo of Abraham Lincoln with the saying beside it, the problem with quotes found on the internet is that they are often not true, Abraham Lincoln. Now we all see that, we love it, we laugh. Um, one of the respondents, I think as of this morning, Luke, I checked, you had, I think, 22 comments on that. Well done. Uh, good engagement. One comment, I won't say who wrote this, but uh, you can't make this up. Uh, this poor fellow wrote, um, unfortunately, our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated in 1865. I highly doubt that President Lincoln made a quote about the Internet, which wasn't even established until 100 years after his death. So I find this quote in quotation marks, this quote humorous. 
Uh, you can't make it up. Can't make it up. Um, <clears throat> that kind of uh, information uh, put out and then reacted upon is really the lifeblood of this operational information environment. Um, one of the uh, economic um, uh, schools of thought that's uh, been very influential in understanding the information environment has, of course, been market theory uh, out of economics. And uh, many writers on uh, the information environment and the marketplace of ideas, even adopting that language, um, uh, are adapting uh, originally Adam Smith and the invisible hand. And Adam Smith's invisible hand, of course, was about all the disparate actors um, within a very uh, complex and distributed uh, economic marketplace and environment, um, each operating on their own self-interest without any notion of coordinating any larger architecture of coordinating. But that architecture of coordination actually became, becomes, um, in the perfect state, self-forming. And so you wind up having, again, an abstraction layer of economic coordination, which he called the invisible hand, very memorably. Uh, in economics, one of the uh, interesting developments in economic theory uh, was in the uh, late 20th century, looking particularly at 20th century developments in economics and in market developments, uh, particularly in Western economies and the United States, as its primary example was um, by a guy named Alfred Chandler. Uh, Alfred Chandler won a Pulitzer Prize. He's a historian, but a historian of economics. Um, Alfred Chandler, Chandler in 1978 won the Pulitzer Prize for history for his book, The Visible Hand. And The Visible Hand uh, discussed uh, that notion of the pure market economy but how it had been rivaled by the growth in the United States of the modern, what he described as the multi-unit business enterprise. And that notion of uh, administrative and managerial efficiencies and professionalism of the modern American corporation, multi-units, so a kind of quasi-distributed conglomeration of units within a company, think of IBM uh, mid-century, AT&T, which snapped up a bunch of smaller networks uh, in telecommunications, and uh, they gained efficiencies through that. And those corporations actually outperformed pure market coordination mechanisms. So Chandler called this phenomenon the visible hand. Uh, he said that uh, people operating within it uh, tended to be more professional and technical, uh, not focused on their own individual self-interest. They tended to prefer and prioritize policies that favored long-term stability and growth, not the immediate maximizing of profits. They used information and information flow at the center uh, to be able to optimize uh, for profit of this multi-unit uh, corporation at the center. So, this development, which was undeniable in the American economy and most Western economies in the 20th century of large Chandler style uh, uh, professional corporations, um, it led to the displacement of what we thought of as the pure free market by corporate bureaucracy. And I know that's something that Department of Defense people don't uh, know much about um, large organizational bureaucracy, but uh, corporate bureaucracy was seen as the most important coordinating mechanism for the economy. No longer this notion of atomistic uh, uh, driving of the invisible hand. Instead, the visible hand theory um, uh, relied on professional managers. And um, what, what became uh, quite interesting was, okay, so that was in the late 70s that this was pointed out. He wins the Pulitzer Prize. Everybody thinks, okay, that's the way the economy is doing. All of a sudden, just like in the Department of Defense, everyone began noticing, wait a second, this may not be actually optimal. Uh, this certainly scales, but it scales poorly and sclerotically, uh, and it sub-optimizes itself. So, uh, 
what wound up happening in the economy in the last quarter century and of the 20th century and the, the first couple of decades of this century has been, again, a pullback from that notion of the visible hand, the heavy organizational hand at the center using information and control of information and rapid access, ready access to information from uh, the edge. Um, and uh, that pullback has been called now by another economist named uh, Richard Langlois, uh, the vanishing hand. So that corrective has been the vanishing hand. The vanishing hand kind of says the opposite. Let's go back towards a slightly purer notion of the free market and have, um, you can think of this as coincident with the, the rise of startups uh, and technology driven uh, small firms, which are uh, identifying market uh, suboptimalities and quirks that they can take advantage of and entrepreneurially filling needs and doing this in a really rapid manner. So that's now called the vanishing hand school of economics and vertical disintegration of companies. And so you actually do. Uh, uh, Langlois has predicted that many large corporations would vertically disintegrate and begin to shed and break up and um, there wouldn't be such massive uh, merger and acquisition operation. And so you kind of see these uh, uh, tendencies. Um, I, uh, I think about these a lot in conjunction with Claude Shannon to understand exactly how uh, we achieve organizationally for uh, a military um, what Shannon was talking about, the resolution of, as Buchanan told us this morning, of uncertainty. Uh, but uncertainty is central to war. So uh, here's something I think about since I work for a, you know, a tech company. And since here we are talking together on uh, the internet, uh, I, uh, I think about the history of the internet and the development of the internet. I know we have some people in the audience here, a bunch of our colleagues from DARPA and also a lot of DARPA alumni. And famously, uh, uh, DARPA invented the internet. Uh, DARPA was really second in the race to build an internet for a while. And actually the people who came up with the idea of building something that would look like today's internet originally were, believe it or not, um, Soviet economists. And so I'll recommend a phenomenal book uh, that came out uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, ben Peters, How Not to Network a Nation, The Uneasy History of the Soviet Internet. It's been very influential in my thinking, How Not to Network a Nation. Um, and so I'm just going to uh, summarize a little bit of it and, and give you a couple of quotes. Uh, in the early 1960s, Soviet cyberneticists designed the most prominent network uh, project uh, in, in the state, the all-state automated system, with the mission of saving the entire command economy by a computer network. So we all have our, our perfectly accurate caricature in our minds of what the Soviet economy, command and control economy is like. Uh, the command economy of uh, uh, true bureaucratic inefficiency, um, always defeated by the uh, suboptimalities of that kind of centrally planned economy. Uh, and so those uh, Soviet economists and cyberneticists really, they saw this as well, undeniable. So their elaborate technocratic ambition was to network, store, transmit, optimize, and manage the information flows that constituted that command economy under the guidance of the Politburo and in collaboration with everyday enterprise workers, managers, and planners nationwide. And they built a, uh, you know, they attempted to build a massive networked uh, system, much like the internet, reaching to computers on every shop floor and in every uh, manager's office uh, for that uh, uh, storage and transmittal and, uh, and management of uh, data flowing from throughout the economy. Uh, the, the beauty of Ben Peters' book is in looking comparatively 
at what was happening um, at ARPA and DARPA with the ARPANET. Uh, although, uh, quoting uh, Peters here, although the American ARPANET initially took shape thanks to well-managed state subsidies and collaborative research environments, the comparable Soviet network project stumbled due to widespread unregulated competition among the self-interested bureaucrats, institutions, other key actors. Uh, and he's got a beauty of a bumper sticker uh, quote here. Um, he, he says, the first global civilian computer networks uh, developed among cooperative capitalists, not among competitive socialists. The capitalists behave like socialists, and that's the ARPA scientists. Um, while the socialists behave like capitalists. So the squabbling and bureaucratic competition at the lowest levels of the Soviet economic and scientific um, bureaucracies uh, competed with one another. He, he's gone through the archives, had access to the scientific archives and uh, details them almost comically. Um, and what we think of as that notion of Adam Smith's distributed competitive, uh, self-interested behavior. That's what was driving the Soviet effort, and it failed. And instead, what people like Ben Cerf and Bob Kahn and a bunch of others uh, who were all happily, collegially working together on the government payroll uh, uh, through uh, uh, DARPA's uh, funding and DOD efforts, uh, they actually collaboratively worked well. So the capitalists behave like socialists, the socialists behave like capitalists. So the Soviets tried using computers to control economic decision making with a complex three-tiered hierarchical computer network uh, that would uh, uh, feed information from and to 20,000 local computer centers, several hundred regional centers, one central computer center in Moscow. The root explanation, here's Peter's uh, summary, for Soviet technological problems does not lie in their technical incompetence. Brilliant mathematicians of the Soviet system. Uh, it's an advanced superpower state. They, they support and fund uh, science strongly then and now. The root problems are anything but technological. Uh, it was uh, a closed culture and the uh, the scientists uh, fought entrenched bureaucratic corruption, conflicts of interest at the heart of the system that they were trying to reform. Uh, and over time, the Soviet military consumed all the resources and hoarded all the innovations uh, from the civilian economy. So in a way, George Kennan, uh, who um, I think we all love and read, uh, George Kennan in his uh, 47, 48, uh, uh, long memo and X article when he talked about the Soviet system containing the seeds of its own decay, uh, that actually proved true in the Soviet effort to build an internet. They had that vision. They knew what the value of it would be uh, to the nation as a whole and to their system. Uh, it just uh, the paradox that they uh, ran headlong into was, of course, that their system was incapable of building. All right. So let's say a, a, a few words. That's, that's how you don't vaccinate a system, um, a, a large scale distributed biological system. Uh, that's not how you optimize it for uh, information operation. Uh, there are other ways that uh, you can kind of take a, an errant road. And unfortunately, I see many of these around town. Um, in the national security community, often in our effort these last few years uh, and currently to deal with uh, the challenge of disinformation and misinformation and so forth uh, that uh, uh, the Mad Scientist series have valuably raised. There is a current um, uh, DARPA effort uh, called Reverse Engineering of Deceptions. Uh, the response date actually for uh, that announcement it closes next week. So. You can look it up, R-E-D, DARPA does great acronyms still, RED, reverse engineering of deceptions. And I apologize if there are people who are on the line who may be involved in this. I understand the intent of it. Um, uh, I'll read a bit from the abstract. The reverse engineering of, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, uh, will develop techniques that automatically reverse engineer the tool chains behind attacks such as multimedia falsification, 
adversarial email attacks or other information deception attacks. Uh, recovering the tools and processes used to create these attacks can provide information that may aid in identifying an adversary. The RED program will seek to develop techniques that support the automated identification of attack tool chains and the development and maintenance of scalable databases of attack tool chains. Okay, that's, that's interesting, I think. Uh, another, for example, I'll give a couple examples and then uh, characterize them in my mind. Uh, another current line of work elsewhere is something that I, I would reject myself personally. I think it's the worst possible choice uh, in terms of a national response on this. It was laid out in a talk, I won't say who did it, uh, at the Moores Conference, the Operational Research uh, Society Conference um, last month. And, and I found it interesting, but uh, the, it's ab abstract. The title, An Internet Islanding Approach to Deterrence of Nation State Adversaries. Uh, and then just a bit from the abstract, publicly demonstrating the capability and willingness to disconnect the United States from the global internet offers substantial technical and political protection from international cyber attack. By denying the incoming network connections required by international attackers, the U.S. would directly benefit by stopping attacks. And by demonstrating the capability and willingness to do this and to deny attacks, the U.S. indirectly benefits by deterring attackers from launching attacks against the U.S. And then they point out that Russia plans to demonstrate their capability to disconnect Russia from the global Internet. Um, uh, China controls its Internet infrastructure and appears capable of blocking incoming and outgoing international Internet traffic using firewalls, great firewall of China. <clears throat> this seems to me to be playing their game. So I, I, uh, I would prefer, I recommend and suggest and, and have uh, advised on other different approaches. Now I mentioned earlier uh, therapeutics and many of them are valuable. Uh, you know, Cindy Otis and uh, Lisa Kaplan and others in the series have talked about wonderful uh, kinds of what I would think of as uh, metaphorically as therapeutics and what to do on better training, critical thinking training, online videos and training models, education programs, explicitly calling out disinformation and bias identification, identifying them early, uh, faster and better analysis and investigatory tools. That's all great. But these, again, are uh, prophylactic and therapeutic uh, with that, uh, I think, nutty idea to uh, Disconnect the United States from the internet. Why, why step away from the field? I don't like that kind of thinking. Uh, my idea instead would be to, my preference would be to focus on, um, I, I talked about a vaccine, a superiority engine to, to structure our responses and our capabilities in a way that would live up to uh, something that's embodied in my, um, something I learned at the University of Virginia where I went undergrad. Um, Thomas Jefferson, these words are carved. Slaveholder uh, Thomas Jefferson with all his flaws. He was right about information. Um, he said uh, here at this university, and by extension here in the new United States, here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. Now, this is a really interesting advance, I believe, on that Jonathan Swift notion of uh, truth limping behind falsehood. Jefferson said, if we have the engine of truth running, as reason is left free to combat any error, uh, he saw that as the superior approach, and uh, so do I. So, so let me, uh, in just the final couple minutes here, and I will do, I guess, some Q&A. Um, talk about what this kind of vaccine might look like. Uh, I, I posit that we should be pushing a digital control plane uh, inside OODA loop thinking and in information environment thinking. And this is, it should not be controversial. This is really, uh, it's, it's at the core of uh, JADC2. Uh, JADC2 defined by the Air Force as, quote, the art and science of decision making in order to act faster than an opponent. Uh, so 
Uh, I don't think we need to make this too complicated. I would focus on two big areas, one technical, one societal. The technical area uh, is basically to foster a lot more research uh, on this approach of how to actually be engaging um, in, uh, in the online environment in a, I mean, you can think of it as a really pro-American way, but, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, fighting for truth and using truth in the fight. Uh, and the second would be, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. Second is societal, and that is to reintroduce into our discourse on operating in the information environment a note of enterprising advantage instead of always focusing or primarily focusing on dystopia uh, to talk about enterprising advantage. So if we use uh, Silicon Valley as an analogy just a little bit, now there's a lot wrong with the Valley. It's got its institutional and societal uh, problems um, and biases. And I, I think it's great that those are being addressed and they need to be addressed uh, um, with more effort. But there's a lot right, and you can't deny its entrepreneurial engine, a perpetual motion contraption that's been tuned to produce unanticipated competitive advantage. That's what VCs identify and fund and reward. It's what the market rewards uh, is unanticipated competitive advantage. So let's understand what this cycle of disruptive innovation means for the operational information environment. In 1995, Clay Christensen, someone we've all read, introduced the concept of disruptive technologies and later expanded that to be disruptive innovations, business processes, and uh, uh, focusing on uh, those business processes about the crushing paradox behind the failure of big successful companies and industry leaders who place too much focus on pleasing their most profitable customers and not uh, uh, paying attention to the disruptive technologies that were already aggressively evolving to uh, displace them. So uh, he wrote a great follow-up book to The Innovator's Dilemma called The Innovator's Solution. And he talks about how those kinds of companies and operators can become disruptors themselves. His theory of innovation is that it's predictable, controllable, and that large players like say DOD and the Army can focus on sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. Sustaining information, I think uh, innovation is what the, the military, US military has been doing since the 50s, uh, since the 40s. Sustaining innovation is uh, where we're modifying or adding to something or improving something that already exists, but disruptive innovation actually changes the playing field dramatically. Now that's not something that we always feel comfortable doing in the Department of Defense and in the Army. Uh, I'd say the U.S. military has innovated really dramatically well in the sustaining side, but on the disruptive innovation and creating new fields of information play and reaching people who aren't already our partners, uh, that's been a problem. And uh, Bill Gates, I, I worked at Microsoft Research for seven years. Uh, Bill Gates, my boss when I joined, um, was uh, testifying to Congress in 1998 early in the year. Uh, knowing the only way really we think of Mark Zuckerberg not wanting to go before Congress, Bill Gates didn't want to go before Congress, but in 1998, it was obvious the Department of Justice was going to sue Microsoft for antitrust violation. They did it later in May. In March, he showed up on the Hill to testify about, well, you don't need to, uh, uh, to, to sue us. Uh, we're, we're not a monopolist. I think it's instructive, his quotes. Think about this from a, an Army standpoint. Quote, Microsoft and other vendors are offering innovative products in categories that didn't even exist two or three years ago. Every product on the market today will likely be obsolete in the same amount of time. The only question for Microsoft, he said, is whether we will be the ones to replace those products or whether some other company will do a better job. Now, that's been the goose that's laid the golden egg technologically and economically for the United States for the last 40 years, 50 years. Software innovation is viral. It's distributed. It has low barriers to entry uh, organizationally from a startup sense, more importantly, intellectually and from a programming sense. We think about abstraction layers 
the platforms, the cloud platforms, the software development, agile development tools, DevSecOps as a, a way of a process of innovation. This is instrumenting our conceptual world for the, the new operational information environment, and we need to focus on it that way. So as far as weaponizing information against their peers using truth, I would far rather be operating confidently and on their territory, uh, not focusing, for example, uh, just leave you with a couple of tidbit ideas. We focus a lot about uh, Google and Facebook and Twitter uh, as the field of play. That's our territory. How many of us have accounts on WeChat and Weibo and Tencent Chichi and Dubon, or uh, you know we think about uh, WeChat as the Facebook of China? Well, it's not. It's 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 uh, it's it's WeChat. It's its own thing uh, within one of the countries identified as a peer state adversary. So. Um, I'm heartened uh, by something that occurred just over the last month. Uh, I'll leave you with this fun tidbit, um, a, perhaps a model to follow in this kind of engaging uh, search for how we vaccinate and operate in a much faster OODA loop cycle. Um, and that's uh, the K-pop phenomenon. So one of the wonders of witnessing I'm going to quote from the New Yorker here. One of the wonders of witnessing a political revolution by people firmly rooted in online culture is watching new forms of insurrection develop and be deployed almost instantaneously. Now, there were malevolent actors and well-intentioned actors doing hashtag combat on Black Lives Matter and White Lives Matter. And into that fray stepped who? K-pop activists who actually mounted a grassroots internet campaign to elevate uh, voices of the movement fighting racism and police violence in America and flood the zone. They became an overwhelming force. Uh, it's understandable in 2019, K-pop fans uh, sent, Twitter says, 6 billion tweets, uh, north of 3% of all tweets sent by everyone in the world were K-pop fans. Uh, the account uh, number in the tens of thousands this is just an example of the kind of affirmative uh, dominating of the information OODA loop that can be done with creative thinking, and particularly by understanding that the engine of our uh, Western and American information superiority, that engine relies, as Adam Smith and Langlois have said, in the vanishing hand, the invisible hand, at the edges, not in centralizing as the Soviets tried to do, but in understanding the value of decentralized uh, innovation. And as we try to model systems that, uh, com that identify and combat fake news in faster and faster cyclic time, uh, I think it'll be wonderful to, uh, um, to see the advances that are uh, proposed for the Army to be able to use and for all of us to benefit from. Uh, okay, I should stop talking. Uh, Lewis, thank you. Um, so we're right up against where we're supposed to be taking a break, but I want to get... Monopolize one... my... Oh, yeah, it's, it's all... It, that's perfectly fine. I do want to get a question to you, though. So if anybody in the attendees needs to take a break, it's a virtual conference, do what you need to do. But, but Lewis, I'd like to ask you this question before you go. Um, it comes from Joe Burton, and he's... I, I like questions that, that challenge the status quo. So he's questioning the idea of victory that's been brought up a number of times this morning in InfoWars. Essentially what he's saying is InfoWars don't end. There will not be a mission accomplished sign. There is no victory here. So is this either a misplaced idea or if victory is possible in the information domain, what does that look like to you? Well, victories, uh, uh, you know, there is no static moment with a parade. Uh, victory to me is the existence of a robust free society where, as Jefferson said, we'll tolerate any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. Um, victory can be, you know, individual battle victory. Uh, the K-pop people celebrated and patted themselves on the back, but that doesn't mean that, you know, hashtag warfare is over. Um, so there'll be individual uh, victories where we, uh, I, I do think that uh, some of the uh, R&D work that is done at DARPA and, uh, you know, elsewhere, um, ARL and uh, all the great work being done um, in Army Futures 
um, on uh, kind of tactical um, um, efforts against malevolent use of, uh, of information. I think that's all valuable and it'll get us uh, individual um, battle victories. But in terms of, uh, I, I do like to think about the superiority engine being a generational attribute that uh, we as the United States have. And so I, I tend, maybe because I'm an old man, I tend to think in kind of Cold War cycles and the ability of the United States to actually uh, uh, maintain and exploit the upper hand across the, uh, the decades of the Cold War, uh, playing the long game and, and doing so effectively understanding that uh, it's a, a whole of society effort. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, we appreciate a very technical look at this problem. Um, you are now an official Army mad scientist. I am pleased, thank you. That's wonderful. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, we, we've got four minutes on our break. We're gonna come back at 11.05 and we're gonna talk to Davis Ellison who is the winner of our vignette writing contest. So we're gonna shut the cameras off. Everybody please come back at 11.05, thank you. Okay, folks, it is 11.05. Uh, we're gonna get started back up again. So our next speaker is Mr. Davis Ellison, and he is the winner of our vignette writing contest. 
So um, this summer we we had a crowdsourcing contest where we asked folks to tell us about what they think the future of the information environment looks like. We asked them to do it in a short vignette. And Davis was the winner with his uh, vignette entitled Catch a Fish. So he's gonna be describing his vignette and then answering a few questions for us. Uh, Davis it, uh, graduated with a master's in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he both studied and worked in Germany and the UK. He has experience working in international organiz organizations, think tanks, academia, and developing concepts for warfare development. And he's currently an employee of NATO Ally, Allied Command Transformation. So Davis, let's get you all set up and the floor will be yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll just first thank the mad scientist team for setting all of this up and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. And like uh, was said, I'll just do a quick reading of what I wrote and then make a few comments and then throw it open to the rest of the crowd for Q&A. So catch a fish. The Westerners were the easiest, so quick to believe. Shen opened his messages on our free Siberia, not surprised to find yet another set of French, Norwegian and American youngsters willing to die for the cause of some land they had never even heard of six months before. Our free Siberia was only one of several subreddits Shen had created over the last year, the others being in other languages and focusing on other breakaway regions of Russia. Each of the pages were his babies. He had birthed them, raised them, and continued to shape them entirely on his own. These pages were subtle enough to avoid notice. The Westerners never even looked. Their focus on the famed Unit 61398 and the PLA Strategic Support Force blinded them that a young lieutenant like him, Yang Shen, a junior officer of the PLA Naval Air Force stationed with the Northern Fleet in Qingdao, would have some role to play. Hell, Reddit had gone unnoticed by most of the Western analysts and researchers who were so focused on their own Twitter and Facebook accounts that they couldn't see that well over half of their own young people connected through Reddit. Those analysts probably thought Ivan was still trying to pull election in fake Facebook groups. Shen knew better. The Russians made it even easier. When the National Guard shot the monstration protesters in Novosibirsk, it didn't exactly make it a hard job to build up sympathy online. Sympathy was the first step on a long journey for many of the fighters. The biggest surge came after the video of that young artist being shot in the head by a sniper. Nasty business, perfect for Shen. The trick was to post multiple times a day, every day. The easiest part is Shen needed no approval from his superiors about what he posted. Chaos was the goal and chaos is what he delivered. Some old colonel had used some axiom from thousands of years ago to describe what Shen did. Disturb the water and catch a fish. He had no use for aphorisms that made the elderly feel warm and spooked the West. Shen only wanted results. User Groovy Lucy had clearly taken the next step. Hey, Eldar, some old Siberian name Shen had found on a quick Google search. We are all set. It is finally time, free Siberia. Shen had provided the young man's group an old, of a set of old but reliable Type 81 rifles that the PLA usually only used for militias in rural backwaters and user Groovy Lucy was just part of one group in Novosibirsk, among other cities. The uproar would be massive, new shots heard around the world, especially when the Russian forces cracked down hard. It would be big and messy, distracting. Distracting enough for the scientific teams on Severnaya Zemya to deploy their shipping container air defense systems, and for the Patriots of the Maritime Militia to achieve their missions across the Kamchatka Peninsula. China is a near Arctic power, quaint, Shen thought. So that was the story, uh, not a particularly long one, uh, but some of the thoughts that I had going into it, you know, we have a lot of these sorts of discussions that we've had today uh, regarding information operations and the environment over at NATO. And one of the, some of the things that always struck me is one, how incredibly easy it is to organize and to achieve deception as an effect online. Uh, you know, just an, an example, you know, one of the things, you know, looking into this before writing uh, I was able to not personally connect, but I was able to find the information of People's Protection Units recruiters via Reddit, just a small subreddit on, you know, on YPG. So it's not hard for non-state groups to organize there and go relatively unnoticed, particularly if the subreddit is small. And it can also be very effective. Uh, I don't know if many remember, but during after the 2013 uh, Boston bombing, 
there was a subreddit on uh, find the Boston bomber and that led to numerous false accusations and people being arrested and held when they, you know, sending police down the wrong way. So there's definitely places where kinetic effect can occur very quickly from uh, organization online. And it's also the, the important part that I always noted is that these efforts tend to channel organically grown social movements or existing divisions. You know, one example being, uh, you know, with the election in 2016, just taking those already existing political divisions rather than creating them out of the blue and using them against us. And it's no uh, coincidence, in my opinion, that the uh, result of the election coincided closely with Russian operations in Aleppo and Ukraine uh, in December 2016 and January 2017. And finally, the main point of the uh, scenario is that the, you know, with proper mission command initiative, and with a generally wide scope of commander's intent in this space, relatively junior officers or civilian employees can achieve a great amount of success fairly quickly, particularly on platforms that they're familiar with and use more routinely rather than it being a top-down driven effort. Um, so there can be a lot of bottom-up initiative in this space with proper authorities and uh, proper mission command. So with that, I won't belabor any points and I will throw things back to the crowd and the mad scientist team to moderate any Q&A. Okay, Davis, thanks so much. Um, I think what stood out to me about your vignette was that, you know, Reddit's one of the most popular websites on the world. It connects millions and millions of people all over, but it's just one example. This is happening in many different places and it's going to continue to happen in many different places. Um, and it's going to get even more proliferated uh, as, as time goes on. So we do have a question in the Q&A here from Caroline Duckworth. Do you think autonomy at lower level analysts or cyber defenders is important to fighting the speed of disinformation? Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, it's, it's definitely the type of thing that demands initiative rather than layers of approval, particularly when it is, uh, you know, it's cyber operators strategic I'm sure many of us are familiar with how strategic communications can be a bit of a difficult process depending on how hierarchical an organization can be but if someone is encouraged and enabled to take that sort of initiative themselves there's a lot that can be done so I would always you know hammer my fist on the table and say that that type of initiative needs to be pushed as low as possible in terms of whether it's developing operations to achieve effects in support of operations or in defending them uh, on that daily basis. So we've got a question from Richard Uber. He's wondering, um, so you were on Reddit for, to do your research for this, but have you been on GitHub? Have you done any research there? And uh, do you have any insight on how the programmers and coders would build their tools and bots through that? Um, I, I'm not a programmer myself, but I'm definitely familiar with GitHub and uh, how people tend to use it. And it's just, it's to me in a general, another example of how uh, crowdsourcing and organically driven uh, developments in this space really are at the forefront of a lot of this. And uh, even, you know, we tend to talk in, you know, national security or, in, uh, you know, multinational alliances like where I work, uh, you know, the industry is ahead of, out ahead of, uh, the government side, but I would even argue that things like GitHub are even out ahead of industry in that regard because it allows even more freedom uh, to develop tools uh, in a fairly unlimited way and gives people a lot of access to things very quickly. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, a good answer and actually a good question because we don't think of GitHub on the usual list of social media sites because it's more um, for practitioners to build things and help each other out as as opposed to you know, frivolously sending pictures to each other and talking about cats and things. Um, so uh, that's about all the time we have for your questions. I really appreciate it. And folks, the um, the vignettes are going to be posted. Mr. Ian Kersey, I think, has already put links to the uh, to the vignettes out, or has or or will in the in the future in the chat. There, um, we had a great turnout. We had about I think forty eight total vignettes that came in, and um, Davis's road to rose to the top. So we appreciate you, Davis, coming on and talking about your vignette. And thanks for being here. Thank you. Okay. And now we are going to transition to our next set of speakers, uh, who it's Dr. Gary Ackerman and Doug Clifford of the Center for Advanced Red Teaming of the University at Albany, SUNY. 
Um, Dr. Ackerman is the director and Doug is the program manager. They're going to be talking to us today about the lessons learned from our um, virtual war game that we ran with them uh, earlier this month on 1 July. Uh, it was an excellent event. I don't want to steal any other thunder. Uh, wonderfully, I'm really looking forward to the lessons learned. We, we pulled in folks from all over. We executed a, a war game in a distributed fashion, uh, looking at disinformation. So I'm going to now turn it over to Gary and Doug. Let's see if I can get them up on the screen there. Okay. There's Gary. Take it away, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks very much, Matt, and to everybody at Mad Scientist. Um, uh, you know, it's been great working with you, and it's definitely been enlightening uh, on our side. Um, today, we're going to, I don't know if you have the slides teed up, Matt, or, or if we're supposed to be... Uh, no, I've, I've got them. Give me one second, I'll pull them up for uh, you. No problem. They're far more interesting than, than, than my image. Um, but I'll, uh, to preface that, uh, we, we, the idea behind this, um, okay, yep, it's, there we go. Um, probably just have to, have to flip back to the beginning. I think it's at the end. Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, the idea behind this was, if we go to the next slide, uh, the event was called the storm after the flood. And we can go to the next slide, please, uh, Matt. Um, the objective of, of the war game uh, was actually to, to really, rather than, than answer, provide any answers, or rather than to uh, provide a, uh, a, a definitive simulation or to test out uh, uh, defensive measures, the objective of the, the war game was to stimulate new thinking and appreciation uh, of how the weapons of information, weaponization of information is evolving. Uh, and especially some of the complexities involved um, uh, in a well-coordinated information operation. Uh, the the multi-layered, multimodal um, uh, nature of it. So if you go to the, the, the event occurred July the 1st, it was um, a, a roughly an hour and a half, uh, was quite well attended. We had over uh, 270 uh, attendees and the platform uh, for the first time that we've tried this uh, on, on this kind of a scale, was to use a Zoom webinar, which uh, thankfully worked out pretty well. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, that's just a, a little bit about the project staff, but I do want to acknowledge, acknowledge our fantastic staff and also um, uh, also the, the wonderful uh, support that we got from the mad scientist folks who are listed there. But if we go to the next slide. Um, the, the exercise itself was a 75 minute uh, uh, Zoom webinar session uh, the participants, uh, we had a, a set of panelists uh, uh, representing a pre-selected blue team, and they adopted the roles of um, a, a several entities to represent several entities in an ad hoc uh, National Security Council uh, committee that had been formed um, to, to address uh, this developing situation uh, within USG. And their, um, uh, their task was to Kind of make sense of uh, was a sense making task and to make recommendations that could then ostensibly be taken up to um, the national security advisor and POTUS uh, as as a set of potential options uh, for 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 reaction. Um, I played the facilitator um, and I conv convened this ad hoc group uh, within the simulation. Uh, the, there was a lot of uh, audience interaction. We built this specifically because we wanted the audience to be able to interact. And you'll see afterwards that uh, a, a lot of the insights that emerged actually uh, came from the audience. So uh, it, was, it was actually a very, I, I think, good idea to involve the audience. The audience was involved in two ways and they had to kind of um, switch off on their roles, but um, you know, they were more than up to the task. Uh, they acted as a pink team. And we saw the pink team is that uh, we had a uh, had series of red injects and the audience chose which of the next moves that red would make uh, that got sent that Blue was presented with. So although uh, the audience didn't come up with uh, uh, red moves uh, from whole cloth, they got to select from a menu of red moves uh, which ones were presented to Blue as, as, the, next, uh, as the next in the chain. Um, and as well as that, the audience also acted as a shadow Blue team. So while our, while our panelists who were experts 
were discussing on how to respond, the audience also sort of got to vote on you know, what, what, what are their main response that they would actually um, um, be interested in. And we kind of crowdsourced that. Uh, and then the project team obviously was behind the scenes uh, serving as, as a white team to make sure this, this sort of this interaction occurred uh, efficiently. Okay, if we go to the next slide, um, a little bit about the preparations before we jump into the actual uh, 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 conduct of the war, war game. Uh, we, we started out by selecting a basic game structure that met the objectives and the practical constraints of trying to run a large distributed war game during COVID. Uh, we then developed an exercise protocol in coordination with the mad scientists to make sure that um, we, we uh, uh, hit all the main. Uh, we had a, a, a developed a scenario and the, the, the underlying kind of adversary in the scenario was that the adversary, which in this case was a high level uh, PRC military psyop cell, uh, was acting opportunistically but drawing on operational and strategic templates prepared well in advance. So, so the important thing about this was that, yes, they were reacting to, to and exploiting uh, current fast moving uh, developments, but this was uh, in the sense of, uh, within, within the context of they had pre-prepared scripts that could be adapted, um, that they could draw on pretty quickly. And they were exploiting a natural disaster to simultaneously diminish, diminish US influence in the Southeast Asian um, area, um, uh, you know, area AOR, and also exacerbate political instability and weaken the social fabric in the United States. And this fed into sort of the development of our initial triggers and, and our various injects. Uh, we then created blue team roles. Now we, we initially wanted a very large blue team to, to reflect reality, but this also came down to uh, where the uh, practical constraints of using Zoom limited the size of the blue team. Um, so we, we, we had to kind of combine some roles together. In reality, the blue team would probably have three or four at least uh, additional members. Um, but we selected the roles um, and, and developed them. Uh, we had the uh, identified appropriate um, uh, experts to uh, play those roles and then we invited them to participate and, and did some coaching. Um, we also then developed the series of red injects, which is um, we identified and selected a, a number of potential actions that the adversary could take at each stage in the game. Uh, this was done, uh, we have a great team of interns um, that uh, did a lot of background research and helped shape these. And then the mad scientist team did a wonderful job of making these into uh, uh, believable injects. Uh, we did a lot of uh, testing on the platform because we'd never done this before, contingency planning, we did a lot of pre-briefing and rehearsals. Um, and then we, we ended up, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, we ended up uh, actually uh, diving into the, the war game on the day. Here's just a, a, a quick list. I'm not going to go too much into this, but this is all available on, on the website, especially everybody's bios. But here we had the participants in their roles. That was our blue team uh, roles. As you said, we, as you see, we had some people from uh, the military. We had some, some people from uh, academia uh, representing various elements within, within the US. But each of these individuals had some background um, uh, in this area or with the idea of uh, information operations and psyops, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, now I'm going to hand over to uh, Doug Clifford who will take, uh, take you through the actual game itself and how it progressed. And then I'll come back at the end to, to uh, cover some of the takeaways and lessons learned. Over to you, Doug. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Ackerman. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to go now through, uh, next slide please, um, the exercise timeline and each round of the event in more detail uh, following this. So the scenario consisted of three simulated three month long rounds, uh, which took place between July of 2027 and March of 2028. Uh, in the first round, uh, the trigger was introduced with three additional injects. Um, these injects were, were not selected by the pink team. Um, uh, these injects help set the stage uh, in addition to the initial trigger. Um, subsequent rounds each started with a summary of previous actions taken. Uh, injects in later rounds, uh, as mentioned, were selected by the, the ping team, the, the audience, uh, from a predetermined list of injects uh, using the Zoom polling feature. Um, so you can see at the, at the bottom of the slide here, 
um, that the initial trigger and the three additional uh, injects uh, started round one in July of 2027. Uh, two uh, subsequent injects selected by the audience were presented to the blue team, which took place in October of that year. And then starting round three, uh, there were two additional injects selected by the audience uh, presented to the blue team. Uh, in, in subsequent slides, you'll, sleep, you'll see a, a timeline graphic at the bottom, uh, which will just kind of help you see as things progressed uh, uh, through the exercise. Uh, next slide. So the initial trigger, uh, as you'll see on the right here, uh, was a large scale 250 year flooding event in Southeast Asia that came as a result of monsoons and torrential rain, building on a long-term US military and political relationships with countries in the region, uh, particularly the Philippines. Nearby US military forces, as well as other specialized military assistance assets uh, from other COCOMs were deployed to assist with relief efforts. Um, again, on the right, you'll see how the, the inject was presented as a, a New York Times article. Um, this uh, is what set the stage for the, the uh, overall exercise. Uh, again, this is what began uh, round one for, for the exercise. Uh, next slide. So immediately following the initial trigger, uh, the panelists were presented with the following initial injects. Um, these again, were not voted by the pink team, but they further developed the scenario. So you can see the range of issues, <clears throat> excuse me, that were presented to the panelists and how quickly the issue became uh, quite complicated. Uh, the first inject was a cyber attack on Google and Apple's uh, IDP uh, tracking infrastructure. Um, that was distributed as you can see on the right as a memo uh, from NSA. Uh, the, the second inject was a cyber attack on Philippine telecommunications infrastructure. Um, Four million residents of Davao City uh, were without internet access. Um, Globe Telecom refused to comment on rumors of increased activity, activity at a cable landing station uh, in the city. And finally, uh, disinformation uh, to increase isolationist sentiment in the US, stating that several prominent far left and far right wing politicians have made calls for Congress to repeal the Foreign Assistance Act, Act of 1961, uh, which provides a legal basis for US military and non-military assistance. Um, so after these injects were, were distributed and uh, introduced to the panelists, uh, they began their, their first round of deliberations. Um, and that's where a lot of the, the content uh, um, that, that feeds into the takeaways later on uh, came from. Uh, next slide. So this is a graphical representation of the attendee responses to the trigger and initial injects through the use of the polling function in Zoom. Uh, everybody was able to select multiple answers. Uh, again, all that apply. Um, we received 167 total responses. Um, as you can see, 42% uh, found it realistic uh, um, and 17% found it thought provoking. Um, it, it is interesting to know that 38% of the audience uh, selected that this is a scenario that we as the US are prepared to deal with. Um, however, as the scenario developed, it became very clear that the ability to even identify how to deal with this type of scenario uh, can become quite challenging. Uh, next slide. So this slide uh, provides the polling results, uh, the attendee input on the next step for the adversary or red to take. Uh, in this case, uh, this, this is the precursor to the beginning of round two. Um, the, this polling function uh, was introduced to the audience without panelist view. Uh, they were moved out of the uh, webinar room so that they could not see the, the, um, the polling and the voting for the, uh, for the, the next round of injects. Um, the two options with the highest number of votes were selected from, from the pool of four that you see here. Uh, the numbers were fairly close, as you can see, um, but the two with the most votes were to manipulate the Philippines into denouncing IDP tracking as an NSA operation and the, uh, the cyber, a cyber attack causing U.S. to release false uh, NOAA alert of an impending monsoon. Um, so those were the two uh, injects that uh, began round two. Uh, next slide. So here you'll see that the first inject uh, was presented as um, a video. You'll see a, a still shot of it on the right, um, but this was presented as a video uh, that the folks at the, the uh, at Mad Scientist did a fantastic job at putting together. Um, and uh, 
It's uh, a video of breaking news where President Duterte accused Google of allowing the NSA to access their IDP tracking systems. Uh, the second inject was presented uh, as three separate social media posts. Uh, the first being the false uh, NOAA alert uh, due to a cyber attack. And then the subsequent frustration and lashing out by local populations regarding the impact of preparing for the impending monsoon. Um, and those social media posts were tagged with things like hashtag what storm and hashtag thanks USA. Um, so this, this quickly became um, uh, quite a complicated uh, scenario. Uh, next slide. So uh, this slide shows uh, another graphical representation. This time it shows the attendee uh, recommendations on how the US should focus their efforts in response to new developments. Um, as you can see that the options that were, were selected most were to focus on managing the political fallout and refuting claims. Um, and the second was to covertly respond with our own cyber attacks and information operations. Uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion during the event um, as to you know, whether we should manage political fallout or we should try to not be on our heels and, and lean forward on our toes and take more effective action. Um, and that, was, that, that led to some, some of the takeaways that you'll see uh, later on. Um, next slide, please. So here you'll see input um, from the attendees. This is now leading into the, the injects that will be presented for round three. Um, uh, the results here led to uh, the, the top two, again, uh, being introduced. Uh, disinformation to implicate the U.S. in influ influencing Philippine elections, uh, which led to, you know, leading to increased tension with the Philippine population. Uh, use an anti-surveillance uh, theme to undermine U.S. public trust in government, uh, causing tensions within U.S. borders among the public. So it becomes a, an issue uh, uh, within our borders and outside. Um, again, further complicating uh, the issue of the scenario. Um, so this, this led to a, somewhat of a shift in, in the conversations, um, particularly between those who are focused more outside of our borders and um, the participant playing uh, CISA and, and having to focus more on um, things within our borders. Uh, next slide, please. So the first inject uh, was presented as a news article from the Wall Street Journal. Um, which detail, uh, gives details of a whistleblower that released audio, video, location, and accelerometer data collected by NSA on American citizens on U.S. soil, uh, claiming that it was collected by NSA using exploits in the IDP tracking system deployed by Google in the Philippines. Um, the second was presented uh, as another video of breaking news um, that described American aid workers uh, that stayed beyond their welcome uh, and were caught trying to influence the Philippines presidential elections allegedly paying troll farms to boost content to support pro-American candidates. Uh, in addition, uh, candidate Del Rosario's home was set on fire, uh, and this led to additional social media tags such as Yankee Go Home. Um, so it became uh, much more destabilized uh, between uh, the local population in the Philippines and the U.S. presence there. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as, as round three uh, uh, came uh, to an end uh, and, and uh, led to the, to the closing of the, um, of the scenario as a whole, uh, attendees were again polled on what the U.S. should focus their efforts on in response to recent developments. Uh, not surprisingly, the highest amount of recommendations went to managing political fallout uh, by actively uh, review, refuting claims. Apologies. Uh, a shift in the second recommendation, though, turned to simply doing nothing um, and, uh, and waiting for things to blow over. Um, I think this also fed into a, a great deal of, of stimulating thinking on, on uh, taking action versus just uh, simply doing nothing. So that was a very interesting uh, result for, for us. Um, so at this point, the, the uh, round three came to a close. Uh, all panelists, facilitators, and attendees who were acting in role uh, left their role uh, and this began the review and feedback phase. Um, so that's just kind of a, an outline of the, of the event as it uh, went from round one through to round three. Um, and now to take on the, the takeaways and the um, uh, feedback from the event, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ackerman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clifford. Um, 
the the just I want to sort of say here that as Mr. Clifford laid out, it was it, this is this has been made kind of easy for the for for uh, this audience now to kind of make sense of what happened. Uh, this was not always as clear to the participants themselves. Uh, a lot of the information was fairly ambiguous. Uh, they were receiving news reports without having. Uh, you know, we, we, we've already been anchored by what was the, what was really going on behind the scenes. Uh, they were just receiving sort of the the uh, outputs of that or the results of the disinformation campaign. Uh, they were not always aware of uh, what was what, what was actually occurring. So this this created a lot of uh, fog of war and 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 a lot of confusion. And a lot of the time, the um, the uh, uh, the panelists in, in in this ad hoc group. We're, we're merely trying to play catch up and, and uh, gain situational awareness on, on what was actually occurring, uh, let alone of how to respond. So what we didn't show and what Mr. Clifford didn't show was the, the, the uh, intense discussions that occurred um, with the blue team, between the blue team. Um, you, can, you can, as I said, you can, uh, you, you can watch the videos of this, but there was a lot of discussions that kind of highlighted this. Uh, when we moved to the, what was also very interesting is that many of the, uh, uh, I'd say the, the responses and chat comments from the audience actually picked up on a lot of these factors, picked up on this, the ambiguities and the complexities involved. Um, and, and so uh, now I'm going to sort of, after the event, we, we kind of collated all the comments from the uh, panelists themselves, as well as all the comments uh, that we received in the chat. And there were, um, I think, close to 200 comments in the chat. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of input uh, uh, from the from the audience. Um, okay, so now if you go to the next slide, we'll we'll start going through these. Um, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes uh, on each one. These are the takeaways um, uh, from the panelists themselves, uh, based on their own perceptions, uh, having actually gone through this and and having to be faced with ambiguous information and and trying to uh, uh, you know, respond in some way. Um, first is, and, and this mentioned before, the adversary often has the initiative in information warfare. This, this is not just because of the, the differences in tempo, uh, operational tempo, it's galloping half around the world, uh, falsehood while, while truth is, is barely catching up, um, but it's also because the defender often has to prove a negative. For example, they have to prove they didn't do some activity that they were uh, um, uh, accused of doing that has been alleged by the misinformation. And this can often be very difficult, especially when the accusations are made against organizations which are secretive in nature. Um, it, it would say that a complex and coordinated information operation uh, will overwhelm the, the US government with multiple narratives, creating a hall of mirrors. And um, it, we're kind of uh, handicapped on a number of different, different um, uh, uh, facets of, of, of our operations. So that was kind of one thing that came out very strongly. Um, Number two is trends in the information environment are outpacing laws, regulations, and policies. There were, there were a lot of ideas about, uh, you know, we could do this, um, and, and perhaps we should do Y, we could do X. Uh, but then there was a lot of also saying that, well, the U.S. can't do this because um, this is uh, with outside the bounds of U.S. law, or outside the bounds of U.S. policy, or outside the rules of engagement. And it was very clear that the different agencies really did not have a very good idea of what they were allowed to do uh, quickly. And it was the idea of they would have to first go through an onerous process of, of uh, evaluating, getting permission, uh, working through policies. As we know, that can take months, if not years. Um, they, 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 they weren't clear exactly what they were able to do um, because they weren't sure you know, what, what, kind of what the, the rules of engagement were. Um, the third one is that, uh, and this is quite obvious, obviously, but uh, there was that attribution is an essential issue for countering disinformation. We need to know what was going on and where it was coming from, but there was also a tension between truth and attribution uh, in that the, the more effort was being, the, the panelists actually, um, at least in the beginning, said, well, we can't do anything until we find out what exactly is happening and where it's coming from, then we can decide what to do. But while this was happening, the, the disinformation campaign, information operations were, was gathering momentum and really getting outside of the capability of the US to, to respond properly. Um, so the, the, there was kind of this tension between uh, attribution uh, and, and finding out the truth of what was going on 
and at the same time uh, needing to respond uh, in order to sort of regain the initiative. Um, so that was something that was viewed as a, a as as a, a shortcoming or a potential vulnerability that we have. Um, the fourth uh, element that the panelists uh, identified was there really must be a whole of, of community approach, not just a whole of government, there has to be a whole of community approach because, um, and that all stakeholders need to be brought into the conversation, uh, both the public sector, the private sector, partner countries, NGOs, and they need to be brought in quickly. They can't be brought in as an afterthought, um, especially in this particular um, in this particular scenario, um, a lot of what was happening was being sort of uh, uh, American companies like uh, uh, Google and Apple were being uh, either leveraged or exploited or brought into the fray. And uh, a lot of, as a lot of US businesses represent the US in the foreign operations. And these may be likely targets or vectors of information operations. Um, the idea was um, messaging needed to be coordinated across all stakeholders from top to bottom. Um, and this was something that uh, it was it was kind of barely discussed. The the ad hoc group kind of said, well, we, we, we they kind of assumed that this was a U.S. government response rather than a U.S. whole of community response. Uh, and the fifth uh, element that was that was sort of highlighted is uh, credible transparency is key. So transparency is essential, but it, it had to also be credible because without credibility, transparency may just be simply viewed as propaganda. Um, so the idea is um, there had to be transparency with all stakeholders um, uh, up and down the US, uh, US government uh, uh, and uh, right up to leadership. So leadership had to, had to have a transparent, be transparent themselves. Um, the, the, the idea was that if we can't coordinate a message and we can't act cohesively uh, it, we, and we had multiple messages, this would reduce any kind of uh, effectiveness of any kind of response. Um, the, 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 another thing that was highlighted was we may have deficits both domestically and internationally in building credibility and trust in the agencies, which will actually probably be responding or working uh, uh, in these uh, types of information operations. So uh, in not only the agencies themselves are vulnerable, but their credibility is vulnerable, which kind of hampers the response again. Uh, this is something that, that, that was brought out that's a key element. Um, Okay, so now we're going to kind of uh, uh, look at um, those are sort of the key things that the panelists themselves identified. Um, now we're going to look at, uh, at elements and, and takeaways that were identified from the comments that the participants, uh, the attendees gave. So if we go to the next slide, um, there are another, we, we took a sort of top five on this. Uh, and, and a lot of these echo um, the, those of the panelists, but sometimes coming from a, a slightly different viewpoint. So the first was we, we need to be kind of proactive in defending against weaponized information. The, the idea is, um, especially with respect to building trust and credibility. So that's kind of built on the idea of credibility. And it said long-term proactive investments in trust, transparency, and credibility will really help and pay off in the event of a large-scale information operation against the US. Uh, and also help build resilience against uh, other information operations. Uh, the idea was this is not something you can't start establishing trust, transparency, and credibility when you're, when you're being attacked or when you've just been attacked. This has to be done uh, in advance and it's kind of a reservoir that has to be built up. Um, the idea is that, um, that uh, this credibility has to be built, uh, again, uh, uh, built up both domestically and uh, internationally. Um, and and the sort of so that when a counter narrative comes or when denials come, they're actually uh, believed. Uh, as I said, transparency without credibility is not very useful at all. Uh, another one that came out, which we've kind of identified already, is um, adversaries can tangle us in our own red tape. And and the participants uh, a, a, um, identified this specifically uh, in more in terms of uh, legal. Uh, um, uh, legal bounds and, and uh, mandates, but this is sort of more, the, the audience kind of uh, identified this, that, um, you know, the, the boundaries between foreign and domestic, between public and private, these are all blurred in an, in an information operation. And uh, the adversaries know this, and they don't have the same limitations that we do many of our adversaries, whether it's legal or policy or social. Um, 
and that, that, that they can actually exploit this uh, intentionally. Um, and this sort of further highlighted uh, the need for proactive uh, 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 preparations and response. Uh, we cannot, because we cannot uh, respond and coordinate quickly, we need to have kind of these things ready to go and set up. Um, the last one is attribution is a double-edged sword. So this is also kind of, the, it goes back to the uh, tension between attribution and response. Uh, so it's a, you know, the, the idea here was that fast attribution is more likely to be inaccurate, but accurate attribution may be too slow to be effective. So there's that tension again. Um, so the idea is both for both counter narrative and retributive purposes, attribution needs to happen quickly to have an effect. Um, and inaccurate attribution made hastily is likely to further erode trust and goodwill. But the, uh, the desire for perfectly accurate attribution is, is the bait for the sort of red, red tape trap that, that, that sort of is highlighted in number two. So the general idea of this is that, look, we, you know, we don't have all the answers to this, but are there partial uh, attributions in that? You can say, this identifies something as is definitely an attack. It may be one of X, Y, and Z actors, even if we, we acknowledge that we're not certain exactly where it's coming from, but we do as much as we can and it's kind of evolving. We, we, we usually, instead of waiting two years down the, down the road where you can identify, ah, this was a particular unit of you know, the PLA, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that, that was something that I, I think was, was, was highlighted. Again, there was a need for clear, clear rules of engagement, um, you know, when to escalate from countering narrative to retaliation. There was a lot of discussion about, you know, what warrants uh, uh, different uh, responses and different levels of responses. And the, large, the, the last piece that came out is that the US doesn't really have a clear strategy for, for leveraging out of US government even if whether or not we have a clear strategy for levering within the US government, that's another discussion. But the, the idea was there was no clear strategy for leveraging partner nations, non-governmental organizations in our response to information operations. How can we sort of build a coalition, coalition of the willing uh, that, that will back us up and um, will help us rather than, than hinder us and create friction? So those were the sort of key takeaways um, from that we uh, uh, discerned, you can actually go back and, and, and review some of these takeaways uh, with the materials that, uh, that are posted online. But you know, going to the, to the next slide, um, in, in terms of thinking about the utility of this, of this, uh, uh, th this whole exercise, uh, we, we asked the audience to sort of say how useful it was and the majority found it useful to some degree. Um, a, a few people found it not very useful at all, um, but it, you know, the vast majority found it useful. And there's a uh, comment from one of the participants that, um, that, that you can see on the slide now. Um, so the idea behind this was just to stimulate thinking. It doesn't necessarily uh, provide any easy solutions, but hopefully uh, it, you know, it achieved its objective and we believe it does of uh, stimulating uh, at least uh, uh, revealing some of the complexities involved um, and some of the things we have to deal with if we want to counter uh, information operations and weaponized information in the future. So I, I, on behalf of, of the CAR team and uh, mad scientists, I want to thank everybody who was involved um, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you might, that you might have. Okay, thanks, Dr. Ackerman and, and Mr. Clifford. Um, so we will, I will pull up the Q&A now, and we have time for quite a few questions. Okay. So okay. Um, so the first one comes from Ronald Watros. How do we better prepare for counter-propaganda efforts given the policy in the U.S. that prevents all IRCs but public affairs from engaging Americans? What needs to change an exercise designed to better prepare joint and interagency spokespeople to counter mis- or disinformation? Uh, uh, well, well I, I will give you my opinion on this. I'm not sure it's the correct opinion, um, and I'm sure there's people who disagree with me, but I go back to, to sort of uh, to reference Davis Ellison's excellent, excellent piece. If we're going to have sort of distributed, decentralized uh, um, sort of army of one type of, of, of uh, threats that we're going to be facing on the, the information operation side and weaponized information, we need to become I think uh, as it goes back to this idea of having networks fight networks, we need to actually decentralize some of our responses. Acknowledging that as, as soon as you decentralize and take things out of the quote unquote uh, uh, 
the hands of the professionals, whoever those may be, um, you gain uh, uh, you gain tempo, you gain uh, rapidity in your response, but you obviously you're going to get it wrong sometimes. So if we have 50 different people responding, you know, three or four of them are going to sort of really mess things up. Uh, but if you design a system that's more resilient and robust, you can you can uh, uh, you know, absorb those those uh, failures. If you've got another 47 people, uh, you know, really on the button doing doing what they they need to do. So part of the solution, I think, in being proactive is having a set a toolkit kind of ready to go, just as the adversary in this particular scenario had sort of templates that they adapted to take advantage of a current situation. Perhaps we could have templates um, and not just sort of one template or two templates, but templates at all different levels that are ready to go um, to, to deal with an information operational weaponized information that then could quickly be spun up in a decentralized way and kind of uh, um, to, to counter a lot of the, uh, a, a, a lot of what is, what is uh, occurring. And this, this sort of looks, this sort of got back to me when, it, when you started thinking about what the US is trying to do to counter online radicalization. When they try to centralize things in the State Department, uh, when a jihadist uh, entity posted a video, uh, by the time they got permission to uh, who was going to respond, in what way they were going to respond, what the response would look like, et cetera, et cetera, um, it was you know, five days later and any response was essentially useless. So they kind of lost the momentum, lost the initiative. So if we can decentralize things, hopefully we can, we can be both proactive and decentralized and therefore respond a lot more quickly. So um, yeah, that, that, that's just kind of my, my, my first thinking on that. Uh, I guess going to uh, Robin McCrate's uh, um, uh, second question about the uh, ambiguous data points. Yes, there was, uh, there was a lot in this that was ambiguous and it also wasn't clear immediately that Cybercom uh, you know, had any role to play. Uh, the, initially, the, case, the internet went down and it wasn't clear that this was a cyber attack. It, you know, initial indications uh, intentionally were that it was uh, uh, a, a physical break in the cable. Um, so, so it it, it is. I, I do think that um, uh, you know there, there there were a lot of ambiguities, and whether or not the initial uh, scenario in terms of Manila requesting U.S. government assistance that that uh, I mean, uh, we, we just chose that as a scenario. It's debatable whether they would actually do that. Um, so uh, Ian basically said, yes, was there any discussion on proactive measures? The, the discussion was that the conclusion was that we don't have enough of those and we need to have those. So that came out of that. Uh, did the Wargame allow the routine to, to consider any proactive options? Um, uh, yeah, so, so again, this was now, part of it was artificial in the Wargame in that we didn't really allow the, uh, we didn't really equip the participants with a kind of menu of proactive options. But uh, uh, in any case, it was identified um, uh, um, by many different parties that there is, while there are some proactive ones, is this isn't something that the U.S. can kind of just sort of pull off the shelf and, 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 and sort of utilize, or at least there aren't those kind of rules of engagement, even if there are the tools themselves. So it wasn't even, a, 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 you know, it wasn't even understood who would be best to respond at what level the decision making would take place, et cetera, et cetera. So um, th those are some issues that were definitely identified. Um, so uh, uh, um, going to the next question uh, by, by, from Carolyn uh, and, and Luke, uh, what actions by Red really surprised you? Um, uh, you know, I think, I think, well, for us, didn't really surprise all because we came up with a lot of them by red. But uh, you know, we didn't. Uh, we actually uh, had our, our our large group of interns uh, actually uh, put forward ideas for different actions red might take. And one of the interesting ones I thought was messing with NOAA's um, um, weather prediction, modeling prediction, in that it, it would have a knock-on effect, especially in this high, highly sensitized uh, environment of real monsoons and hurricanes and flooding. Um, for NOAA to then get something wrong would really undermine U.S. credibility in the region. Um, and we also thought, uh, uh, it was also thought that NOAA would not be the obvious target uh, of disinformation so that we might not be protecting NOAA's modeling as, as, as much as we protect some of our other systems. So it might be kind of a low-hanging fruit for an adversary to, 
to manipulate the modeling and the knock-on effects uh, in terms of uh, geopolitical effects and cultural and social effects were, were, were very, very large uh, compared to the, uh, to the uh, vulnerability of the target. Um, so there's uh, another question was based on this. And oh, by the way, uh, if Mr. Clifford wants to weigh in, um, Doug, if you, if you have anything, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to uh, um, you know, defer to any, anything you might want to add as well. I'm just running through the questions. Um, based on the war game, focused on the Pacific, do you think there's a major cultural differences in campaigns launched or are they very similar in characteristics? I think there's underlying, stra underlying strategic similarities, but I also think that it's important to realize that adversaries will opportunistically exploit local conditions. They kind of localize and customize um, amplifying existing political, social, uh, economic uh, fault lines. Um, now, whether that's in the US or in Southeast Asia or in Europe, um, any adversary can identify fault lines and basically, uh, you know, sort of like fracking, inject their own disinformation in it as, as kind of the, the liquid in fracking to, in order to, to, to create a much bigger rupture. Um, so uh, I'm going to sort of another, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Joyal asks, if the response of our actions is to clarify on truth, why not act to blunt the disinformation as soon as possible? I, I agree. I, I think it's just sort of how do we get from point A to point B in doing that? So I think that is um, uh, 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 important. Uh, Edward uh, said that given how many have pushed for whole of government community approach for years, how will the results of this red team influence or inform doctrine development? Uh, as I said, the, the role of the red team was just to sort of draw attention to this. It's up to, I guess, uh, all of the folks that are, uh, many of the folks that are actually uh, uh, on, on the line now who are listening from different uh, communities, government and non-government, uh, to kind of think about how do we actually achieve that. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, as I said, it's always much more, in, uh, uh, it's much easier to identify the problems than to solve them. So what we wanted to do is to highlight the problems, uh, the solutions we'll hopefully get to after lunch, but uh, as I guess that's, uh, I'm deferring the risk of that uh, as, as we heard in the baseball turn. So I will be no longer the manager of this, of this discussion when that occurs. Um, so, uh, but, but seriously though, the, you know, it is that the solutions are much more difficult than the, um, much more difficult, uh, you know, to come by than, than we're making it sound now. Um, the, the, uh, the point organizer, Nick Chadwick asked by, um, uh, uh, who's the point organization, DHS, et cetera, et cetera. That was one of those that was one of those uh, discussions. Uh, we didn't know who was going to be point. In the scenario itself, this was kind of an ad hoc group uh, at the NSC made up of representatives from various agencies saying to the, the president sort of what options to take. And then the idea was that the president would make some decisions and that would, depending on those decisions, that would sort of get routed through the relevant agency, whether it was, if it was more kind of diplomatic, the, those parts of it, and there were some diplomatic responses to assure our allies, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and assuage their concerns. And that was handled through the State Department. There were some, uh, obviously, some of the, the intelligence collection and trying to figure out more what was going on was run, run through those agencies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the idea is, what did we predispose this game you know, to favor the adversary? By, uh, uh, of course we did. Um, we didn't, uh, we, the adversary took the action first uh, we didn't give them uh, early warning of any actions on the adversary. Uh, so yes, we were definitely on the defensive and in a reactionary mode. Our panelists were, the blue team was, but we, we did that to sort of highlight some of these issues. Uh, hopefully in, in reality, we will get some early warnings of some of these activities. Um, we'll be, we could be more proactive um, in, in blunting some of these information operations, but I wouldn't rely on it. Um, hey Gary, can you take one more question? One more question, okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to sort of look here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to look at Michael Blackstock's uh, question. The disinformation listed seemed to target the wider populace. While I know this was the near future, did you ever consider intentionally using second order effects of disinformation uh, to target a malleable US leader to shift their resolve? We tried to get at that a little bit. And if we'd had multiple rounds beyond the three rounds, we might've got into this more. However, it was one of those situations where it, if you actually look by the third round, you know, there was a major political problem within the US of the NSA being accused of spying on Americans 
um, with whistleblowers. This was vastly complicating any other responses, and this had kind of sucked the air out of the room. And POTUS was probably going to be completely consumed by that, uh, even though this was all part of the same component, uh, same same uh, campaign. So the idea was that there were second order and third order effects. Um, the the interesting thing was it was a multi pronged uh, uh, disinformation campaign focusing on what was going on in Southeast Asia, but at the same time having a domestic U.S. component uh, that. It, it, you know, started out slow, um, basically related to what was going on in Southeast Asia, but then then sort of uh, uh, took over. And the idea of that was not only to destabilize the U.S., which it was, but to actually uh, also distract the U.S. from from responding correctly in the AOR or responding a drought in the AOR. So I think that's all we can do uh, in terms of questions. We're happy to to sort of we, we encourage people who weren't able to attend. Um, to, to look at the, all the materials are archived on the Mad Scientist site. Um, but we definitely think that uh, we, would, we would love to red team this further, do a lot more uh, red teaming, a lot more simulation, especially on the response side, um, and, and have that strategic interaction between red and blue that we weren't able to do. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, and thanks again to Mad Scientist for tackling this really important topic. All right, thanks, Gary. Thanks, Doug. Um, Great job. I think what this showed, uh, not only did we get great insights out of it, and that was, that was you know, really what the mission was, but we showed that we can be an agile team, that we don't have to have war games that are at a large venue where, you know, hundreds of people come and travel. We can do these for low cost and we can still get some great ideas out of them. Uh, so thank you both for coming on here. Gary, being a mad scientist is probably old hat for you by now. <laughs> You've done that before. Doug, even you as well. Um, so we don't have new proclamations for you, but your continued success as a mad scientist is still there. Um, so for everybody else, we are going to break for lunch now. Um, it's going to be quick, 15 minutes. Go fix yourself something. I'm really getting Southern now. I've been down here too long. Go get yourself some food. Um, come back here at 1215 and we will continue on. 1215. Thanks, everybody.
Okay, folks, it is 12.15. Hope everybody had a chance to go grab something to eat. Uh, we're going to get started with our next presenter who's going to round out the first section of our event today, and that is Ms. Kara Frederick. Kara is a fellow at the Technology and National Security Program at the Center for a New American Security, or CNAS. And prior to joining CNAS, Kara helped create and lead Facebook's Global Security Counterterrorism Analysis Program. She was also the team lead for Facebook Headquarters Regional Intelligence Team in Menlo Park, California. And prior to Facebook, she served as a senior intelligence analyst for U.S. Naval Special Warfare Command and spent six years as a counterterrorism analyst at the DOD. And while at the DOD, she deployed three times to Afghanistan in support of Special Operations Forces, served as a briefer to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations slash Low Intensity Conflict, and as a liaison to the National Security Agency. And today she's going to be talking to us about the assault on authenticity. So let me spotlight her and we'll be good to go. Okay, Kara, all yours. Awesome. Thanks so much for the intro. So again, my name is Kara Frederick. I'm a fellow in the technology and national security program at the Center for a New American Security. And most of my research focuses on emerging technologies, digital authoritarianism, disinformation, influence operations, and digital surveillance. Um, as it was stated, you know, I spent my career as an Intel analyst, so I kind of approached this problem from that standpoint, uh, first at the Defense Intelligence Agency, um, and then for a Naval Special Warfare Command, and then transitioned to corporate intelligence at Facebook, which was um, a really interesting, I think, deep dive into, you know, what technology can do, what it means when technologies are leveraged to influence the population, uh, wittingly or unwittingly. Um, so everything that I say uh, from now on, I sort of approach from, from that lens. Um, and then sort of as a, a scene setter here, um, I think I, I wanna talk to you guys a little bit about the military intelligence field when it comes to weaponizing information, uh, but then really get into the meat of it. Um, and that is all premised on this idea that the digital revolution was, it was supposed to be a liberalizing force, but reality is really turning out to be far more complicated. Um, again, many components to this military intelligence, I'll, I'll discuss as background at the top, um, but I think what is um, of particular interest to a lot of researchers like myself is, you know, the social media, that vintage of the information environment that's been getting a lot of our attention since 2016. And I've said this phrase, you know, sort of over and over again, but I think it's important to um, let people who don't, you know, work in Silicon Valley or the tech sector right now understand that, you know, when I, I left the intelligence community to go to um, a Facebook and a big, you know, big tech firm, I think what was lacking was a, a geopolitical cognition. And I say that because, you know, we were so focused on, on shipping and iterating and, and, you know, making sure products got to consumers as fast as possible, that they made people's lives better and they got out the door um, with as, you know, really little lag time as, as possible. And there wasn't this consciousness of, you know, what we do could have pretty severe geopolitical implications. And that's really coming to the fore with uh, the Twitter hack last week, where I think, you know, Twitter really got away with one. They um, saw the, the peddling of this Bitcoin scam, but at the same time, it, it, you know, a lot of the takeover of these high profile accounts could have been used to disastrous effect, to sort of heighten geopolitical attention, to do something in the vein of the 2013 AP Twitter hack where uh, it erased about um, 136 billion in equity market value in three minutes before the stock market was um, uh, righted itself again. So there are things I think that could happen when it comes to uh, the tech sector, as, as we well know, um, and I, I won't harp on 2016 too much, um, but I think that these companies have now developed a consciousness of, of that and are sort of um, making sure their policies reflect what they can actually do in the world that doesn't, isn't just confined to monetizing and shipping and, and whatnot. So that being said, you know, how does all this weaponizing of information apply to the army and the military and the intel field in general? You know, what does the future look like from an information perspective when you're in the military and you're fighting against other militaries? Um, I, I'll say that here's, you know, sort of the scope of what we can do now. Uh, we have the analytics to transform data into insights from intelligence preparation of the operate, operating environment to 
threat warning to predictive battle space awareness to targeting, um, something that I used to do uh, when I worked uh, for the military. Um, so advances in artificial intelligence, particularly machine learning, as I'm sure uh, Ben talked to you about, uh, are going to lead to efficient intelligence exploitation, uh, surveillance and analysis. Um, AI increases the scale and the processing and analysis of large volumes and variety of data to extract meaning, to detect patterns, as you've all heard before. Um, but what I think is really important is that a lot of this technology helps us to fuse data from multiple intelligence sources and really flag those items of interest for humans, something we've been talking about a lot. Um, another use case of sensitive site exploitation, uh, commercially developed algorithms can really help parse through SSE, and quickly extract relevant information from SSE data uh, that can lead to follow on operations and new targets, um, you know, sort of better PED processing. You've all heard of Project Maven, don't need to talk about that. Um, but it's really interesting in terms of, you know, our great power competition that is sort of reverberating through the halls of uh, the military these days and the Pentagon. Um, services are already working on processing data as close to the uh, sensor as possible instead of having to send it back to a decentralized hub for processing, which helps reduce vulnerabilities in contested environments to jamming and intrusion attacks. Um, this also helps transfer the analytical burden away from humans um, early in the Intel cycle. So they can sort of reserve that rigor for later and um, let machines do what machines are best at and humans do what humans are good at. Uh, situational awareness is also something uh, that I think is, is important to discuss. When it comes to deep neural networks, um, they can be used for image classification, for drone feeds. I'm not going to talk about Maven after just mentioning it again now. Um, force Pro and threat triage. Um, it's something you don't, I don't think, hear, hear too often, especially uh, in the counterterrorism fields um, of what I'm used to. Uh, but this can really help rack and stack priorities. Um, AI can help ID predictive trends that lead to uprisings. IARPA is doing a lot of good work on this. Um, and then computer vision and object recognition algorithms are, are super handy here. And lastly, uh, in going over the state of what we can do with um, new technology is sort of predictive maintenance, right? This is another national mission initiative um, along with humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. Uh, there's a lot of ways to help fix some things before um, it breaks. And then I want to talk a little bit about some of the vulnerabilities that are being presented in the information environment now as it relates to technology sort of supercharging some of these capabilities. Technology can also leave us vulnerable to all sorts of um, attacks, uh, especially in the information space. So uh, first and foremost, you know, data poisoning, uh, reward functions that can be hacked. Uh, where a system's behavior can also be manipulated if adversaries decide to feed a system data that causes it to learn incorrect behaviors. Um, you've all probably heard of the Microsoft chatbot, Tay, um, who was parroting uh, racist and anti-Semitic language after less than 24 hours on Twitter, uh, since taken down. Um, and then lastly, uh, before I sort of go into what I really want to talk about, is um, adversarial data. So adversarial inputs from a malicious actor, uh, clearly these can look like uh, nonsense images or random noise, uh, can pretty easily fool neural networks into believing the images are something else um, and with high confidence. Uh, so there's that famous, uh, I think I have an image here, of you know the the school bus uh, made to look like an ostrich. Um, you know, fooling images can be embedded in physical objects. Um, the 3D printed turtle identified as a rifle. I'm sure you've all talked about that. Um, and then you know, adversaries again looking at the picture on the slide uh, that can make a tank look like a school bus. So huge implications for you know whether or not if you're looking at ISR and then um, you're made to to see a a school look like a terrorist compound. So some of the malicious um, uses of technology kind of pervade in the information space yet to be determined. Hey, and hey, then, Sarah, sorry to interrupt. We don't see your slides. Do you want me to push them from this end? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. My fault. Oh no, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm talking like uh, a computer is actually um, making them happen. Give me one <laughs> sec. No worries. Okay. All right. You just tell me where to go and we'll go. Yeah, let's go all the way to, um, you can pause on a couple of them. So let's go all the way to 12. Facebook, as you guys have seen, 
uh, that's Bagram, that's kind of what the battle space used to look like. Um, and the contrast is um, the battle space now looks like slide seven, which is social media. I don't have slide numbers. Just tell me which one. Keep going oh, yeah, or stop. So next, Sorry. Next up. No, no worries. Uh, next up. Yeah. So this is kind of what we're we're talking about, like the researchers being interested in the new information environment, social media being at the fore. So you can go to the next slide. Next slide. Kind of went over that. Next slide. And here are some of the fooling images. Sort of I was talking about how deep neural networks are easily fooled. Um, yeah, I didn't even think to ask where we were going with that. So um, appreciate you letting me know. And then uh, we'll go to adversarial inputs. Yep, and this is what I was talking about in terms of the adversarial input that unperceptible to the human eye kind of looks like nonsense or, or confusing images. And the computer said with high confidence, this is an ostrich, which clearly it's a school bus to the human eye. Human beings see things different, much differently than a deep neural network see. And so that's sort of highlighting the vulnerabilities when you're talking ISR, when you're talking okay, what am I looking at on my HD screen in the talk? Okay, I'm, I'm seeing a, um, a terrorist compound, but an adversarial input is basically, could say it's a school. So if we're relying on machines to sort of spit out those assessments, what does that mean for decision makers? So sort of just kind of a um, ominous sort of um, harbinger of what our adversaries could potentially do to us, taking advantage of the vulnerabilities that exist with regard to deep neural networks. So next slide, please. And this is just sort of AI and contested domains, you know, highlighting the vulnerabilities to hacking intrusions of data links. Um, we're not going to be able to depend on those secure comms links that we we did in the field, um, you know, over the past two decades. Uh, I like to tell people I wasn't worried about when we were stacking ISR um, the night before um, uh, an operation. I never really had to worry about the uh, Taliban Air Force um, jamming or intruding or, or any of those um, potential uh, contests that we're, we're going to have to worry about when it comes to more um, developed adversaries in that regard. So no, no more depending on those secure comm links when it comes to the bird to the ground station. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So Here's another um, idea of uh, sensor proliferation, right? So uh, IoT, we'll talk about that a little later, but I like to think about this in the context of um, you know, global governance and uh, what our societies are shaped like and um, you know, how our values are reflected in technology as it's, it's created, as rules are created around it, um, and as it's deployed in society. So, I wanted to give a, a perspective of what military and intelligence and, and all of that looks like, what, you know, something germane to army, the army, and then sort of not depart in any way, but, but make sure that there's sort of a, a smooth transition between how we think about, you know, some of those harder tech concepts to um, more different cognitive security um, and information security considerations. Um, and I think this is it, it, the contest between free and open societies and closed repressive regimes is, is critical. It's critical to have that um, and those tensions in the back of your mind when we're thinking of how to combat the weaponization of information, especially in society. I know Olga at the end of this is sort of gonna talk about whole of society approaches and whatnot um, and uh, how they're looking about at this um, information in the, the social sector and what we can do about it. So for me, there's sort of a grounding in, you know, army military intelligence. And then now what does it mean when you broaden that out to broader society? Um, and especially as, you know, our national security strategy says when we're competing with Russia, China, and the big guys. So I really think that technology can alter the balance between these two types of society. And the bottom line is that um, weaponized information through technology can be deployed at scale using a small number of people to wield major influence. So it makes perfect sense if you're an authoritarian that relies on political control of your population and critical stability to rule. So three things um, tech helps these authoritarians do well, and especially through information, 
is enforced control through messaging. Um, technology increases the breadth, efficiency, and precision of this information, of tailoring things like propaganda to audiences, especially based off who they are as individuals. And I'm sure this audience has heard all about micro-targeting, like tailoring a, um, a message or an ad to a segment of the population based off of their digital online behavior. Same thing can be done with propaganda. Uh, digital surveillance, you know, uh, regimes can monitor their population through new means. Technology that's AI driven, like facial recognition, can be used to keep track of populations. It is happening in the Western province or the Western region of Xinjiang uh, in China. Um, I'm sure, again, you've heard all about um, some of the uh, human rights violations that are being waged against the, the minority Muslim population there. Um, and then, third, pattern detection and behavior monitoring. So, a lot of data sources can be aggregated and synchronized, um, fused together to allow autocrats to look for patterns in citizens' behavior. Um, this is to potentially identify dissenters or religious minorities like the Uyghurs. Uh, we know this is happening um, with the integrated joint operations platform where the bread and butter is the interoperability of the systems that make the data uh, um, make sense. So you can collect all the data you want, but if 80% of it uh, is on the cutting room floor and it cannot be within a system that can be fused and that can talk to another system, then the quality of your analysis and your assessments is gonna go down prodigiously. Um, the interoperability of data, I think is critical here if we're gonna assess uh, not only the intent of a regime, but the actual um, efficacy of some of these uh, data collection intent um, or at least ideas of what they want to do when it comes to controlling a population. So that data interoperability bit is critical and AI can clearly help parse through the data and spit out ass assessments um, with a, that are more fulsome just generally. And then um, are we on, can we move to the next two slides? Uh, so we've got the AI driven technology sort of these are some examples. Um, I think what's of note here is that multiple countries are developing AI optimized chips to make it possible to conduct facial recognition on smaller and smaller devices. So, you know, facial recognition in the pocket of every uh, police officer, um, you know, in some of these more repressive areas abroad. Uh, synthetic media deepfakes, AI enabled digital forgeries. Um, we have some great people who help us out with research at CNAS, who are actually, they run labs that are devoted to um, detecting some of these digital forgeries and sort of mitigating the potential effects that this synthetic media can have on society. So a lot of interesting um, deepfake detection algorithm development that's occurring um, in civil society right now, some worth following. Betaworks Lab does it uh, up in New York. Um, they're a, a venture capital firm that basically invests in these workshops that sort of create these products that confront synthetic media. So um, interesting plug for them. They're doing good work. Um, and then clearly micro-targeting, uh, like I said before, tailoring content to specific sections of the population. Um, and uh, Miles Brundage had a, a good paper that came out you know, years ago in 2018, where he sort of talks about imagining if um, you're, create, you're tailoring state-created propaganda to specific users based off their online profiles at specific portions within the, uh, of time within the electoral process. So if you're looking at a swing state and you're pushing information to a specific sector of the audience in a specific sector of a state that stands to weigh um, inordinately in an election, then you're talking electoral influence there waged through technology and things like micro-targeting. So interesting, again, the geopolitical implications of what information and information pushed deliberately can actually do. And then I think worth noting, but I'm not going to talk too long on this at all, is there's an eagerness to sort of export these technologies and the laws and policies that govern them um, to like-minded states as efficient ways to sort of stabilize their populations on the cheap. So you can see the allure of some of these technologies when it comes to making sure that their populations are um, suppressed adequately. Um, Zimbabwe is one of them, uh, Venezuela, uh, and I've talked about this before, but you know, Chinese company ZTE storing the data generated by a smart chip based ID card that many citizens have to use and register after they vote there. So um, just, you know, another way that this is sort of pervasive um, and led by by China, which is frankly at the bleeding edge of the use of these technologies as an advanced surveillance state. 
Um, some colorful examples of this, um, and this is AI-driven technology, I'd say, are um, to be found in the next couple of slides. So if you go past um, AI-driven technology, you'll see the Jennifer Lawrence, Steve Buscemi mashup, which I'm sure everyone's seen before, kind of gross, kind of disconcerting. Mm. But, you know, kind of a, a fun way to, to show what people are, are doing these days. Um, there's political versions of this, you know, Trump speaking perfect Mandarin, um, obviously a fake. Um, if you go to the next slide, you have Obama and Jordan Peele. Um, and this is a video a little bit too risky uh, to do this um, on one of these virtual conference formats, but it's a video that plays, um, it's synthetic where Jordan Peele used footage of Obama's public addresses and created an AI generated video to make Obama say anything he wanted. Um, and they, it's you know pretty realistic facial expressions and ticks that Obama has. Um, so the idea is to imagine faking what a leader of an opposing country is saying to uh, heighten tensions, incite nation states to war. Um, and you know this is really interesting to me, especially in light of the Twitter hack, you know, where uh, some teenagers um, were able to sort of take control of these high profile accounts and they used it to, to just do their Bitcoin thing, only raked in 100, over 100K. But, um, you know, to me, it's sort of like what, what happens if, you know, somebody uh, takes over Joe Biden's account and when it comes to Florida, um, Joe Biden says something like, oh, you know, results are in already, uh, stay home because I've won. That kind of thing, you're talking, um, again, geopolitical implications, um, huge issues there um, with, it, you know, there's a cognitive security element, meaning with the way people intake information and what they do um, inside their own heads, and then uh, information security element, which is the hacking portion itself. So the combination of the two, uh, the hacking and the spreading of disinformation, I think that one-two punch is something that we're going to be on the lookout for. Um, this was evidenced in uh, last year, 2019, after the Soleimani strike, uh, there was a Kuwaiti um, Twitter, official Twitter account that uh, was hacked, and it was used to say that U.S. troops were being withdrawn from the region, sort of stoking those regional tensions at a time of um, uh, an already interesting time of conflict. So it's, um, it's you know, the things that could happen are, are go move beyond Bitcoin and people use the nuclear war example. I mean, that's one thing too. Um, but imagine if, um, you know, President Modi's account was hacked and uh, given what's happening in Pakistan, you know, troops being sent across the border and people taking advantage of those, um, those moments is, um, is something to, to think about. Um, and then the barriers to entry uh, for this kind of thing are getting lower and lower as well. Um, shallow fakes, slight digital modifications of video, like the one you probably remember with Nancy Pelosi seeming drunk, they're proliferating. Um, that transfixed media for a week, which is not really saying much now, but um, still it caused a big stir. And then these videos can diffuse more broadly and at lower cost. Um, and then if we move on to the next one, I think it's a GPT-2 example, which is a research firm OpenAI uh, created GPT-2 uh, using natural language processing. So this is a language model um, that generates um, computer generated text uh, from, you know, a couple lines of text written by a human made to look like um, the rest was written by a human. Um, again, Silicon Valley based research firm OpenAI pioneered this. They have, GPT-2 is pretty easy to detect at this point, but their next iteration of the model of GPT-3, um, we threw up some examples in our, our CNAS annual conference last week. Uh, one of the summer sessions there on synthetic media and the audience could not tell they were um, most of them were wrong but it was a pretty much even split between determining what prose was real and what prose was fake so these are getting better and better um, and I think NLP will be something we focus on um, a, a lot in the future I mean at Facebook we were just starting to to really get it off the ground when it came to counterterrorism. Um, out in the press is a lot about suicidal ideation and the use of NLP to really detect whether or not somebody is saying, um, you know, I'm killing myself in jest or they actually mean it based off of um, classifiers um, and um, they're a pretty sophisticated use of NLP. So it's sort of a real world example of, of how that's being used to, to combat a problem. Um, so why do we care? Uh, next slide, please. So this is the 2013 AP Twitter feed hack that I talked about. Um, a false tweet was sent out saying that somebody attacked the White House. 
Um, and then um, about a minute after the tweet was posted, you started to see the effects on the Dow. Um, 150 point hit in total, $136 billion um, erased in equity market value for three minutes before everything was fixed. Um, but these are some of the, the things that can actually happen given the weaponization of information if a malicious actor continues as hacking um, uh, operations. Olga's gonna yell at me for calling everything a disinformation campaign and operation, but um, I'll, uh, I'll avoid her later. And then next slide, uh, Russia propaganda. Uh, state-sponsored propaganda sat on YouTube uh, for months before it was labeled state-sponsored. Um, luckily, they've uh, made some policies that really um, hew to the values that, you know, more information is better. Labeling this information is going to cause people to sort of think for themselves, um, which brings me to a case study um, of Taiwan on the next slide. And I'm sort of calling this beta testing election integrity tentatively, so no judgment until this uh, fully comes out. But um, the lead up, I think, uh, to Taiwan's 2020 presidential election really offers some lessons to the United States for these external oper influence operations that um, we can expect and are emanating from Beijing in the future. Um, so this is sort of a Taiwan and China focused um, example. And I'll talk a little bit about Russia towards the end, but um, you'll get more uh, focused and better people on, on Russia um, uh, later if you haven't already. And then I think you know China's party state likely attempted to influence Taiwan's election with a variety of tactics, um, including uh, content farms, YouTube propaganda, which is uh, kind of the new thing, and then businessmen traveling from the mainland, um, all kinds of things. I think um, what is most remarkable about um, the, the Taiwan case study leading up to their presidential election in 2020 is the, you know, the growth of, of Chinese netizens and activists. And I'll talk more about that in future trends, but it's not just, um, you know, a clean state sponsored, we can connect this to the IRA, to the GRU um, in the Russian sense, or, you know, the, the, the PRC. Um, we, the alignment of patriotic activists online with the objectives of the nation state is something that we're gonna see more and more when it comes to political warfare. And the Taiwan presidential election in 2020 is I think the perfect example of that. Um, so I'll talk more about those techniques a little later, but I think what's most important for the case study is what did Taiwan do to sort of confront this? And it is important to note that a lot of studies have come out, particularly um, the Stanford Internet Observatory, um, who have great analysts there. Um, they just wrote a new paper with the Hoover Institution worth checking out. Um, but they basically said they couldn't detect anything directly attributable to the PRC. Um, so, you know, getting better at attribution. And I think that's in large part um, a response to the growth of these these netizens, you know, these uh, regular private citizens who, of course, the party state it knows that this is happening. Um, but you're not going to like in the Intel world, you're not going to find that piece of SIGINT that says, you know, you do this, like go forth. Here's your directive. You've got it in hand. Everything's nice and tight. Attribution sealed. You're not going to find that anymore. Everything is getting muddier and muddier. Um, that's kind of like a trite a uh, phrase in you know our community but um you know that's the case it's when you're the patriots align with the objectives of the nation state and then um you get uh what you saw in taiwan and what they did to try to fight against this was um inoculate their own social sector so they implemented a robust fact-checking ecosystem um what the digital minister calls um and i popped over there actually in january so flew there um, right as um, the president was um, uh, actually the official vote count was out and then sort of talked to um, a bunch of people in the cabinet and whatnot um, afterwards to, to see what they found, some think tanks there, some universities, researchers. Um, and they thought that the fact-checking ecosystem, they sort of lauded its merits. You know, These are galvanizing regular citizens to volunteer their time um, and basically say, you know, this is what was said by KNT, um, the opposition party who didn't win, DPP, um, ended up winning. But they basically said, this is wrong and here's why, here's a link, that kind of thing. And these were ordinary citizens volunteering their own time to, to do so. Um, and then what they did on uh, legally, which is, is really interesting here, because I think there, there's a potential for there to be sort of a, a slippery slope to authoritarianism itself um, with the anti-infiltration bill, which was really designed to um, prevent investment by you know, hostile powers um, from gaining a foothold in Taiwan. 
this was eventually signed into law in January 2020. But I think what's important about that is it created a legal mechanism to sort of impose costs on those who are attempting to interfere in the election, in this case, um, using uh, influence and investments monetarily. Um, so those were just, you know, two of the measures. And I think growing out of it, um, they also call it, which is pretty funny, nerd immunity, which I thought was hilarious. So that makes um, increasing social sector awareness that these things are happening, that um, Chinese citizens and uh, members of the party state themselves are attempting to do this. Um, I thought that was uh, pretty funny. So nerd immunity is what uh, the digital minister calls what Taiwan engaged in to sort of prevent some of these more insidious forces from taking hold um, around the election. So there's a lot of differences in terms of scalability. You know, what is what works in Taiwan is not necessarily going to work in a big place like the United States, but I think there are some takeaways, and that is to measure the effectiveness of disinformation. So a really interesting quote um, from my interviews over there was, um, disinformation in the election is like a ghost. You know it's there, but you can't exactly see it. So I thought that was like, oh, okay, really? So, you know, when it comes to the intelligence community and the military, you know, we are, we are, we need to know who did it so we can impose costs properly. Okay, so let's do it. Let's measure if this worked, um, what exact impact uh, it had on society, find a consistent methodology for doing so, and then direct your investment that way. So I think measure that effectiveness first and foremost. Um, there's some interesting scholarship too in the US in 2016, and uh, the scholarship um, discusses the effects of Russian disinformation. And a lot of it is finding that it really served to entrench people in their partisanship. Um, so instead of making people um, change their minds, a lot of the propaganda and whatnot was um, indeed um, uh, me sowing the discord that it was meant to, right? It entrenches people further in their hyper-partisan groups. Um, so I, I found that interesting. So measuring how effective disinformation um, really is could, could be helpful. And that's something they said needed to be done in Taiwan too. I think advertising when a foreign power intervenes in electoral processes um, is critical. A, a great report that I would point everyone to is um, by Alex Josky in um, uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, who just came out with a, a report called The Party Speaks For You. And it's, um, it's about the United Front and CCP influence globally. And he talks about the need for intelligence communities to really publish um, the reports on what these nation states are doing. So, you know, it, clearly at an uh, unclassified level, but let the people know for the social sector awareness portion, um, let it, let everyone, let Americans know, give a public accounting for what actually happened. Um, and that way, you know, your guard is up. You're more of a discerning consumer of information. Um, and then build that expertise uh, surrounding countering influence operations. So Taiwan has a leg up um, given their history on the United States. Um, but, you know, there is a need to continue to develop those language capabilities, those um uh, uh, that regional expertise that, um, frankly, a lot of tech companies have now. Uh, we need that in the intelligence community too. Um, so great uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed by um, Seth Jones and um, uh, Jude Blanchett from CSIS, uh, basically saying, you know, every speech by Xi Jinping should be uh, translated into English and distributed to the masses. Americans need to know what they're up against um, and giving, uh, you know, building that expertise and those language capabilities and having people to translate that, I think is critical for um, the social sector awareness um, idea that we can learn from Taiwan. Um, clearly continuing to invest in public private collaboration. Um, given the, the new techniques we sort of saw in Taiwan when it came to the use of YouTube. Um, so, you know, content farms on YouTube, that's what, you know, people were, were talking about. Facebook was kind of old news. We're not really talking about that anymore. We're talking about um, new platforms. So if, if the public can, um, meaning the USG can collaborate with uh, these private companies, uh, you know, nobody's safe. It doesn't, it shouldn't just be Twitter. It shouldn't just be YouTube it sh or Google. It shouldn't just be Facebook. Um, it, it basically has to be everybody. And I'll talk more about that collaboration too um, amongst tech companies that should be occurring as well. And that is occurring. Um, and then, you know, again, another trite phrase, but I, I really think it's important to help allies inoculate themselves against interference um, of our foreign adversaries. And 
to me, what's the most interesting here is sort of fostering alliances between like-minded uh, democratic nations resistant to CCP political influence. You know, why should we stop, um, uh, uh, well, <laughs> given the national security law, maybe we should think twice about uh, providing succor to Hong Kong, um, but why should we stop that uh, collaboration that's happening between Hong Kong and Taiwan, um, especially at the technical level, um, there is know-how, um, you know, I had it uh, anecdotally told to me, exchanged between Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, we do have a formal mechanism as well, but like, let's let's give more resources to um, them sharing their TTPs to confront authoritarian regimes that are really trying to dismantle and undermine um, the democratic impulses within these societies. And I'll give, uh, before my time runs out, sort of a, a clear, um, example of what that has looked like in the past, but in terms of future trends, so next slide. Um, I'll sort of skip over this since we're running out of time and I wanna be able to, to take some questions. Um, but I think the biggest thing here is that um, sensor proliferation, you know, connected devices, um, UAS, robots like drones and decoys, you know, this is going to amount to an expansive attack surface um, rife with vulnerabilities. So something to, to consider with, you know, the power of technology also comes um, some vulnerabilities. And then moving on to the next slide, evolving strategies, just super quick, uh, China, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna continue to peddle CCP talking points through organs of the state and patriotic activists, like I said before, you know, these Chinese netizens organizing messaging campaigns on their own, um, cheerleading for the regime to sort of uh, what I like to call creating the conditions to soften the populace as much as possible. So the old, you know, Lenin, Stalin, communist adage to, um, you know, uh, hit, go through the mush before you hit steel, then stop. It's that kind of thing. Expand the surface of that mush as much as possible. Um, so you're less likely to hit steel. That's kind of what they're doing by creating the conditions to soften the populace. Um, they'll, they'll continue to continue to, um, to co-opt those patriotic activists to push propaganda and artificially boost CCP messaging. Um, you know, you've heard about the 50 Cent Army and how they um, were cheerleaders for the regime to the tune of 400, um, 450 million uh, social media messages a year, you know, these bureaucrats toiling about. Um, now they're, they're outsourcing some of that. Um, and uh, they're they're doing it to confuse and and so discord a la uh, Russian techniques. And I, I will credit um, uh, the Institute for the Futures, Nick Monaco, has done a lot of the, uh, good work on this, especially as it relates to COVID, which I think is important. And that's sort of revealed um, the organization of the messaging campaigns. Um, you have um, what he calls informal groups volunteering online to organizing these trolling campaigns against Taiwan and Hong Kong in particular um, as they're sort of striving for freedom. So again, I would just signal that political objectives of the state are aligning with the objectives of its citizen activists, and they're going to use them as sort of a bullhorn and amplifiers as well. Um, I promised you Russia. Here's a little bit of Russia. Um, again, the Stanford Internet Observatory has done a, a great, um, great work on this, um, much better than mine. So um, just hitting the highlights, Russia multi-pronged approach. Um, they have distinct objectives and techniques to get them there, and they're constantly updating them. Um, for example, they use various methods of distribution to get their uh, narratives to real media sources um, and then out in the digital world in an obfuscated way. And again, this is a lot of Stanford's work. Um, they're not just buying ads, uh, posting and commenting, but instead getting their narratives propagated through other sources rather than, you know, fake personas, rather than, you know, the bots um, that were kind of on the slides earlier. Um, but these are real citizens and activists. Um, so when you get, when the information comes into your feed, it's making, um, me, an average citizen, more likely to question the provenance of the information because I'm getting it from real citizens. I'm getting it from real activists. Um, but what's important is that their objective is still to sow discord, right? Intensify that polarization, keep Americans divided, exploit those domestic fissures by weighing in on both sides of controversial debates, um, racism, guns, NFL, the annealing, things like that. Um, and the ultimate intent is to undermine the faith in our democratic system. 
um, malicious actors, as we've you've probably heard before, they don't have to manipulate voter rolls. Um, they don't have to tamper with results to succeed. They simply need to undermine Americans' faith in the integrity of the process and institute a pervasive sense of mistrust in the system. And that's a win for them. That's a win for opponents of democracy like the CCP, which is why you see them targeting Taiwan and Hong Kong so much. Um, and even, you know, pre-National Security Law Institute in Hong Kong. Um, so, you know, in terms of what we should focus on, um, as you know, people who look at this stuff is you know Russia's broader aims of attacking voter confidence in the republic, um, and not get caught up in whether you know Moscow prefers a particular candidate or not. Um, they're they're what they have in the bullseye is our democratic system and our set of values. So that's something I I kind of try to remember um, before you sort of get lost in the granularity of all this. So what should we do about it? Um, I think number one, uh, and this is the next slide on recommendations continue to develop those technical fixes, right? Tech companies have done a great job at directing a sustainable percentage of engineering capacity to automating the detection and identification of some of these state-run um, operations. Um, they can leverage the things that they do. At Facebook, we did things like hackathons. You know, let's, let's devote a hackathon to detecting um, foreign influence campaigns, right? And they should sort of experiment with um, funding similar ways to do it, to seek new technical fixes to the disinformation problem. Um, and uh, one thing I will highlight and something I worked on specifically at Facebook was increasing collaboration among companies. So um, uh, one of the great counterterrorism policy bodies at Facebook had this idea in 2016 for creating this hash sharing consortium. So a hash is like a digital fingerprint um, of images. So if one image um, of, say, an ISIS flag was uploaded to Facebook, the companies got together and were able to prevent that image of the ISIS flag from getting uploaded to YouTube and Twitter at the same time because Facebook had um, the consortium that would flag that as, you know, among the group that was something that was undesirable on the platform. So there are ways to do that with disinformation campaigns. Um, increase that collaboration among YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, all the smaller companies too. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, potential Twitter um, competitors coming up now and things like that. So bring everyone in, big companies, small companies, even um, civil society, like an outgrowth of this is the GIFCT, which is the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism, who brings NGOs and um, a lot of these companies together to sort of uh, show them how big companies, uh, little companies, et cetera, can all work together to prevent um, the propagation of this stuff on their platforms. Same thing can be done with disinformation, probably a little less cut and dry, um, but there are sort of ways that they could have a disinformation detection consortium, I think. Um, and part of this can be sort of establishing an industry standard on what constitutes disinformation. You know, are these malign foreign influence campaigns something that are universally reviled among tech companies or should be? I'd say so. So um, you can have a foundational element that's technical, but you can also move to um, you know, broadening out the the scope of this group and uh, have everyone speak the same language, same as in the U.S. government and interagency and whatnot. But you have other speakers that I'm sure will cover that. Um, and then I'd say um, third to last, share information and analysts. I think some of the the best things we did overseas in terms of counterterrorism was having everybody um, joint uh, uh, integration of intelligence and operations, right? Everybody was sitting together in one room, sharing information at the analyst level, because we know a lot gets lost in, in you know, mid management level and higher and higher than that, and have these analysts collaborate. There should be some form of unclassified analyst exchange that happens, um, bodies that sit together, they're co-located, um, that talk to one another, um, that, you know, maybe say things that shouldn't get put in writing and things like that. These forward leaning fusion cells were, um, I thought, very competent overseas. So we can do something like that for disinformation. And I can explain more offline um, on that as well, because we have two minutes left. Um, and then set up mechanisms to measure the effectiveness of disinformation campaigns, like I talked about before establish a standard and consistent working vocabulary for dealing with these operations in the government itself, along with that consistent methodology for measuring the impact. Um, and then finally, again, you know, formalize that information transfer between vetted dissidents now in Hong Kong um, and uh, Taiwan. Um, there's existing American Institute in Taiwan 
global cooperation and training frameworks that are fertile ground for this kind of thing. They had great workshops um, as vehicles for these conversations. Let's invest in those. Let's continue to do so um, because just talking with some high level members of the DTP, uh, the DPP afterwards, um, they're basically telling me that we do this, but it's not formalized, like figure out a way, um, open the American largesse to, to really help contest the undercutting of these democratic impulses around the world and democracies will be the better for it. I will end there with one minute left. Okay, so um, first off, wow. Second off, I'm gonna give you a second to catch your breath while I pull the, the share down and pull the questions up. So we're right at the end of time, but I want to ask at least one question. I'm, com I'm gonna combine two questions in the Q&A that are sort of foundationally related here. So intelligence analysis typically, typically looks at intentions and capabilities of adver adversaries and the IOT world, which changes so rapidly. How can this be done by collegiate investigators, open source researchers and ordinary citizens who are often the expressed targets of IO influence operations? And the other uh, question that combined with it is what can the US as a nation do on that, uh, on that side of it as well? So what can the, the common citizen do and what can the nation do to to combat disinformation and to identify and target even American influence groups or networks or individuals? Yeah, so I, I get this question all the time and I think I'm gonna disappoint everyone because my what I believe to be true, um, I, could, I could tell you something that briefs well, um, but what I believe to be true when it comes to the average citizen is that you just have to you have to be a discerning consumer of information. You have to engage critically with your material. And I, I truly believe that, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. I, I see some comments in the, the chat about social justice warriors and things like that. Um, I'm, I'm on the side of more information is better. Um, let people see everything and let them discern what they actually believe um, and what they don't. And, you know, prior to CT, all the counterinsurgency, hearts and minds stuff sort of, um, it, you know, rang a little hollow to me. I thought it was a little too squishy. Um, but I, I sort of come back to it because, because it's true. Like, ultimately, it depends on the individual and their ability to look at information, determine if they think it is uh, salutary for their life and their future actions, and then move from there. I mean, it, the responsibility is with the individual. And I might be revealing some of my, my principles there, but I, I really believe that to be true. Um, more information is better. What YouTube's doing, what Twitter's doing now in terms of labeling, um, this is propaganda. This is peddled by a state organization like Russia and China. Um, giving people more information, I think is better um, and let them make a choice. Um, in terms of what we can do as the United States, I think it's that, and again, this people say this over and over again, but it, it, it's really the only thing that matters. And this is in the conversations that I have with people in Silicon Valley over and over again, mostly on the research side, um, that public-private collaboration is huge. And I know there are incentives on both sides um, to talk and not to talk, but the only way that the US government is going to be able to perform uh, optimally is to use the talent, the regional expertise. Um, Thomas Ridd has a great Twitter thread on this that I saw um, having just come out of Facebook and I was like, he's right. Um, the graphing capabilities, the regional expertise, the language capabilities that these private sector companies can recruit for. Um, the only way the US is gonna be able to get access to those is to, to play nice with uh, the private sector, um, it, you know, sort of tough, tough news, but but that's the case. And and I think there are you know patriots within uh, those companies who are who are willing to reach out and and do that. I mean, there are um, uh, there are ways of of formalizing and advertising things um, that don't necessarily need to be at you know the top of um, the New York Times. But I think it's really really important for the U.S. government to have access to what tech companies can do um, to you know wage this this fight and tech companies themselves. I mean, yeah, you've heard like the election war rooms and things like that, but um, I think they're really upping their um, risk forecasting game. And part of every part of those that game should be um, thinking through geopolitical implications. What happens if uh, political leaders, uh, you know, on the other side of the world, Twitter account is hacked have a scenario and a contingency plan for that, have a war game um, that involves the geopolitical aspects of all of this, because 
like I, uh, I think I've said before, like Twitter really got away with one when it came to just the peddling of the Bitcoin scam. Um, it could have been much worse and it could have involved, um, you know, multiple nations. So it's something that they have to put in terms of their mitigation strategies. So private companies, U.S. government, individuals, everybody has a role to play. Um, and not everybody is as, as good at um, contesting this threat as, as some are. Kara, thank you. I know we ran a little bit over time. I feel pretty confident in, in saying that we could have a mad scientist Kara Frederick two-day conference and we still probably wouldn't mind everything that you've got in there. So I appreciate you being here. Uh, lots of good things. I mean, absolutely a ton of things to take out of this. Um, we're going to now transition. Kara, thanks for coming on. Um, you are now an official Army Mad Scientist. And now we are going to move to our next presenter. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Neil Johnson. Uh, let's make sure we've got Dr. Neil Johnson up here. Uh, Dr. Johnson is the Science and Engineering Technical Advisor in the Information Innovation Office for DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. <clears throat> Dr. Neil Johnson supports DARPA's media forensics and semantic forensics forensics programs as a science and engineering technical advisor contractor. He joined DARPA driven by his passion for digital forensics and getting the right tools into the hands of practitioners. And he has nearly 25 years of expertise in analyzing multimedia. So Dr. Johnson, I'll spotlight you. And Hello. the floor is yours. Would you like me to put your slides up now, sir? Um, you want me to drive them or you can drive them? I'll do them from here, sir. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's fine. Good afternoon, everyone. So some of these we'll, we'll go through um, a little quick because um, they're eye candy. I'm waiting for them to get running. <clears throat> so I'm also a former academic. I used to be the uh, Associate Director of the Center for Secure Information Systems at George Mason University. Uh, I have uh, many years, um, about uh, 20, in doing operational related uh, media analysis and forensics. After 9-11, I left academia to put my powers to fight evil. Uh, been doing that ever since. And I uh, still uh, have my hands and feet in, uh, in academia. I, I, I'm an adjunct. I taught uh, 13 years media forensics at George Washington University. I teach cryptography now at George Mason University. And I'm also a lecturer on an ICDOD wide um, uh, forensic media analysis uh, course. So you might need to click on enable editing and, uh, and run or F5 and uh, see if we can get this, this slide running. There's a couple that have animation in them. Yep, stand by for one second. All right. Between fans and traffic and dogs barking, we'll see how this goes. Oh. There we go. All right. Okay, so I'm actually going to talk about uh, a little bit about two programs that have been going on at DARPA. One is ending. That's the media forensics program and the uh, semantic forensics program is uh, kicking off hopefully in uh, August. We're still in uh, negotiating contracts with performers. So there's limited information I can tell you about that uh, as far as the performers and, and what they're gonna be doing back in camp provide some of the background information for the program. Uh, next slide. So when we look at media, now media is anything pretty much that comes in. It's the, the physical media that data is stored on, it's the devices, it's the communication channels. Multimedia is the image, video, audio, text information that uh, is passed through these channels or stored in these channels. Now the media forensics program metaphor was focused on detecting manipulated or augmented uh, image and visual content only and trying to differentiate and identify whether uh, it has been uh, modified, yes or no. Not so much discussing about intent. We get into that with semantic forensics. 
this is an example of an image that would be provided to an analyst. You know, North Korea sent it out, and it shows a, a landing craft exercise. And it's like, okay, they having exercise, great. Is there anything unusual about it? Is there any other intelligence we can gather from it? Well, there's a tremendous amount of information that comes along with this type of, of data. We may get sensor information, camera, uh, email addresses, tons of, of stuff coming out of the metadata, that's data about the data, but also about the content. And in scrutinizing this image, there's some anomalies that start to pop out and say, well, why did they do that? Or, or what's unusual? And next slide. If we take a look up close, there are some characteristics that defy the laws of physics, um, there are no wakes, and there's duplicate pixels showing rooster tails behind a couple of landing craft that are identical, again, defying the laws of physics. We also have later information that provides some uh, showing six landing craft on a beach where the original image showing them in the water shows us eight. Why is it important? What is North Korea doing by modifying this image? Is, are they showing a greater capability or wanting to show with them what they have? Why is eight versus six important? There's a lot of questions that come, come around this. Well, next slide. When we look at the types of manipulation that can occur and the amount of data that gets ingested or has to be handled in receiving media either in pipes on stream or in captured uh, seized media and uh, drives and computers and, and that, there's hundreds of thousands, there's millions of media types, images, video in particular. And in fact, the number of tools that are used to augment or manipulate media um, far exceed the capabilities of detecting in the numbers. Uh, as a forensic analyst, I, I ran a DOD forensics lab for, for over 10 years. And sometimes when we, when we were getting started, it took a lot of effort and a lot of time to tease apart all this information. And we were looking at you probably dozens of images uh, at a time, one person would, a couple videos. But when we look at the growth of visual media content on the internet, it's been really exponential. Um, in 2018 was the last time I, I updated this chart. There's nearly three and a half billion visual media content items uploaded to social media each day. That's tremendous. And as an analyst, we just can't keep up for it. So the one reason that metaphor came into play uh, in about 2014, 15 was the, the concept of being uh, pitched to, to DARPA was around how to at scale mitigate this, this amount of data and provide indicators that would be useful for analysts and help them triage the information and get to answers or at least where they should focus on attention faster. Next slide. We want to dive into a little bit of the deep fake and synthetic media for a moment. Um, when Metaphor started, deep fakes didn't exist. Synthetic media was, was on, in its embassy. We can see in the upper uh, left-hand corner, that was what a synthetically generated face looks like using a generative adversarial network. This is um, where we have a discriminator and generator. One's generating images based on what they're trained on and the discriminator says, is it real or is it not? And when the discriminator can no longer tell you whether it can differentiate between real and fake um, or real and synthetic, then it passes through the system. And we can see the progression of improvements through uh, 2018 and the upper, upper part where we're getting some photorealism in the images. Now, in the past year, year and a half, um, StyleGAN 2 has come out, which improves the, the perceptibility of these images or photorealism even better. We'll see some examples of that. Uh, down below with other types of manipulation, um, in the previous talk with the Jordan Peele driving um, Obama's face and features and saying something he didn't say is a puppet master type of approach. That's the lower left where we have an actor um, making expressions and making statements and they're driving the ex expression and facial movements of a target video to make it seem like the person is saying something they didn't. Now this technology in this form 
does not change the voice. So the way the reason the Obama video was somewhat compelling is that um, uh, the actor is a gifted impersonator and impersonates the mannerisms and speech patterns and tone of Obama and is able to make it seem like it is him. But we'll take a look at how successful it really was in light of new state-of-the-art detection techniques. In 2017, the uh, app DeepFake was created. It is a specific algorithm. Unfortunately, the term DeepFake is being hijacked. Um, everybody that's listening probably understands what it means when I ask you, do, you, do you know that if an image has been photoshopped or what does it mean to Photoshop an image? Well, Photoshop is a piece of software, but it has come to be understood that when someone is manipulating an image, if they say they Photoshopped it, we all understand that's what it means. The same is going true with the term deepfake. Deepfake is a specific algorithm that replaces the um, above the brow to below the mouth region of a face and does a face swap and then blends in. It does a pretty decent job. And that's why we can see Nicolas Cage in many, many movies he wasn't in. Um, however, fake, deep fake has now turned into um, more of anything that is generic or, or synthetically um, altered in some manner. I've even heard uh, people refer to some shallow fakes, uh, many more manual type of manipulations as being deep fake just because it's, it's falsified information that is disseminating across the internet. The puppet master approach in manipulating faces also goes into an application algorithm called Everybody Dance Now, which was published in 2018, where now an actor can take control of a target's body, their entire motion. This was actually done, I believe, in, in uh, Brazil with one of the politicians showing them dribbling a, a soccer ball in uh, an office hall while responding to questions to the press. And then there is uh, different methods of the uh, voice synthesis, as well as augmenting what is being said in media based on changing transcript. And in 2019, some researchers um, worked on technique where modifying the typing in a different transcript would change what was being said in a video. And in this case, it was actually dropping the price of a Microsoft stock. And in the prior talk, um, talks, we heard about how some of this disruption can really cause a real effect in, a, in the economy transactions before they're caught and, uh, and recovered. Next slide. This is an example of a real person and the style GAN generated image. Now, this is a first generation style, style GAN, old 2018 technology. The new version is much more compelling. I will tell you that the boy is fake and the woman is real. There are some telltale signs that in StyleGAN 2 are starting to disappear, but algorithms can still pick up on it even when uh, humans begin to fail. Next slide. Uh, this gets into the kind of what I was talking about where deep fake lies. Going from the um, left uh, to right, we're looking at different types of manipulation, everything from um, processing data to cover up tracks and anti-forensic techniques to the traditional cheaper fake uh, Photoshop uh, capabilities or copy move or we'll, we'll in paint or we'll put in some different objects. Then into the synthetic and partially synthetic arena where uh, machine learning and AI is really starting to take more and more of a role in modeling the environment and either producing completely new media or augmenting media that already exists to, to add objects, remove objects, and make it even more compelling. Those two columns tend to be what is all referred to as uh, deep fakes now, even though we're looking at a specific algorithm. Uh, next slide. So the process, I'm hoping this kicks off. It doesn't look like it is. Um, it's not really something that a person is going to uh, obtain videos and build really compelling fakes from scratch on their home computers in a reasonable amount of time. To make a really compelling image and video, it takes a considerable amount of processing power, 
as well as time on the order of days or even weeks. Some examples from Click um, a shift face online showing replacement of actors with their CGI models and, and improvements in, in providing that media from, from Hollywood takes days. It could take weeks. Uh, there's been a, a competition that's been open, uh, red versus blue team by Lawrence Livermore for some performers on how well they can generate media versus the defense side of how well can they attack at increasingly or decreasingly amounts of time. And it gets to the point that if you're looking at within a day, the generators just aren't performing as well, even when throwing a number of GPUs or high-performing computers uh, toward the problem. Uh, next slide. The arrow probably should be going in the in the other direction as far as, as skill and capability. This is a notional chart uh, we put together in looking at the types of, of manipulations or augmentations that people may be familiar with or are hearing about and the amount of skill and resources required. Where the lower left-hand corner near the, near the axis is, is low skill, uh, low resource. Now, yes, we can still take advantage of GANs people have uh, in going to this person does not exist.com refresh a web page and you get samples of completely synthetic photorealistic faces and we've seen those used in some um, dis disinformation um, events and we have the shallow fakes the shallow fakes takes a little bit of hands-on we're probably copying moving the Pelosi video was was mentioned that was uh, adding frames uh, in a video to slow down the motion of a person. The pitch was raised in the audio to keep that consistent. So basically the video was slowed down and it made uh, uh, Pelosi seem like she was uh, a little bit incoherent and slowing her speech and just moving slow. The opposite happened with Jim Acosta video where frames were removed and it's artificially sped up a portion of the video to make it look like he was striking instead of just raising his hand. So the original videos are available for both for comparison and these follow in the line of cheap fakes. Now, both of those have been referred to as deep fakes, but they're not. And then when we look at green screen and making a compelling green screen, you can see that this is not a really great one here. It's better than nothing. But to make a really good one takes a little more time, a little more skill, and a little more processing power, as does CGI. A lot of Hollywood work in, in face, age regression, progression has been relying on CGI. Uh, we've seen examples of where of good and bad examples. The uh, Irishman, which was a, a movie released um, by Martin Scorsese, used CGI to progress and regress the age of the actors. And it was somewhat distracting because it wasn't that great. And online, some YouTube videos have popped up where people have taken the uh, segments of older movies from these same actors and use deep fake or face swapping technology where they're replacing the old actor's face with the young actor's model, same person, same uh, mannerisms and voice and things like that but the younger face much more compelling than what, what Hollywood has released. That took several weeks of effort to perform that. When you're looking at creating new algorithms, this is when you start to get into what's start as low resource groups. This would be uh, at the university level, uh, master students, about $50,000 um, built a system that essentially recreated GPT-2 when OpenAI didn't release the model. Uh, a university was able to basically recreate it. And then we have nation states. This is the US, uh, China, Russia, possibly Iran, and capabilities uh, uh, going up to the near peer. So this is really compelling, um, better fakes, harder for people to differentiate, as well as applying other techniques that will further confuse the analysts in discerning what information should be paid, paid attention to or um, where have manipulations occurred. Next slide. So here's a couple other examples. This is one that is uh, machine learning AI generated. This is completely generating a scene. 
Now, I'm not manipulating someone. I'm creating a new event or new story. And with my Bob Ross-like professional skills, I was able to mock up the image on your left and just identify what I wanted this, the texture to resemble, whether it's mountains or sky or water, and click the button go in the middle, and it generates the image on the right. Now, what is interesting about this, you can go to it. It creates a fairly low low resolution images. I'm talking about not talking about uh, really photorealism, uh, but it does a pretty good job. And then a user can select the different styles on the bottom, and it will apply those styles to the structure you're painting. So this gives a lot of control to the end user. Some of the um, generation techniques for faces such as StyleGAN and StyleGAN2, these are basically uh, random number seeds that are fed into the generator and uh, images or faces are produced on the back end. Now, depending on where a researcher can insert themselves in the stream, they may be able to control the, the texture, age, hair, eyes, uh, position, uh, other face features, gender. Um, but from the start to finish, if it's just the uh, vanilla system, you're starting up the generator and you're getting a variety of faces out. What this tool offers is complete control over the synthetic environment that is being produced. Next slide. Another method uh, where machine learning is making more progress is in the in painting and object removal realm. Now, Photoshop has been doing this type of thing for years, uh, but not with machine learning. Uh, in the newer versions, they are starting to apply some of those algorithms. Uh, this is one that was developed by NVIDIA. Um, stay of the art in the in the GAN uh, hardware, as well as research in developing these photorealistic uh, uh, media. So here we have the original on the left, and I'm just highlighting, uh, painting over what I want to get rid of. And then the in-painting tool by NVIDIA uses the rest of the image as a model to fill in these areas to um, remove objects I'm not interested in, in keeping. Next slide. So how do we detect that an augmentation or manipulation has occurred? Traditionally, uh, forensic tools available for doing this type of analysis um, rely on examining one item at a time. Uh, there's a lot of triage that goes in to, to segment out the types of media an analyst has to, to examine. And then one at a time, we're looking at these with a tool similar to this. This is one that was developed um, by the NVID project as EU project uh, for examining uh, manipulated media. We load the image into the interface and a number of algorithms are, are processed and we see mask for potential manipulations taking place. So depending on type of algorithm that we're looking at, there's different indicators. The far right gives us a heat map of, oh, there's maybe something going on with the hair. Um, the one on the far left says, okay, the whole thing looks like it has been compressed a couple of times. So there's artifacts that reveal double JPEG compression. The one next to it says, oh, it's, it looks like there's, there's something going on with the eyes. This image, this entire image is synthetic. This is a style GAN or may have been a program image. As an analyst, if I'm relying on the images across the bottom to provide indicators to me, I can say, yeah, it looks like there's something going on, but I'm chasing down rabbit holes in not understanding what the algorithms are doing and explaining what it's, is actually going on with this image. Next slide. And we've seen these type of manipulations, both synthetic and cheap fake. On the top image, we're looking at the uh, kind of photoshops with the MH17 shoot down. The Russians were claiming that the Ukrainians uh, aircraft shot down um, the, uh, the MH17 um, and provided this image as evidence. And some uh, independent researchers at Bellingcat pointed out that, yeah, things don't add up. Uh, the attacker craft is inconsistent with what um, the Russians were claiming. The fact that Jumbo Jet isn't the same model as MH17, and they were able to find this same background in a Google Earth um, search of, the, of that region. 
So this was a composite of several images that the um, allegedly the Russians put together and were initially being touted as, oh, here's, here's evidence that you know, we, didn't, we didn't cause this problem. In the Catalan independence uh, movement, there were a number of images that were showing online. It, it, it was a rallying cry for independence, a lot of emotion around that. And some images were real and some of them were less so. What we're seeing on the screen in the upper right is, yeah, it's a protest. There's a clash with police. That clash happened. What didn't happen was the presence of that flag. That flag was photoshopped into that scene as a way to elicit a response, an emotional response, and get people saying, you know, this is, this is important. This is part of the passion that's going on. But this event, as that occurred, didn't happen. When I teach forensics, I explain to my students, I said, when you're, you're going to manipulate data, you're going to augment it to improve the intelligibility, do what you can to avoid introducing additional information or changing the story. And we're talking about what's happening between these images and, and the manipulation from what is the story, what is the event as it occurred in the sensor versus how is it being represented to the public or social media or across the news? And is there something that is changing that story, changing the dynamic, changing the meaning? If so, why? Sometimes we care, sometimes we don't. I'll talk about that a little bit later. In the lower images, we can see the, the automated or, or semi-automated techniques. Already seen examples of the Jordan Peele uh, Obama video. And then there's also the Katie Jones. Katie Jones is an interesting one. It was a, a honeypot LinkedIn page that was established to uh, find out what kind of responses and links uh, could be provided. The Katie Jones face is from um, a StyleGAN generator. That person does not exist. The profile is not of a real person. And the KJ's profile got invitations to speak at conferences, um, got links to about 50 different um, individuals, some high level um, Intel and DOD folks before it was shut down. Who did it? I'm not exactly sure. But it was an interesting case, and this is a fake persona that was developed for LinkedIn as a, as a way to bait people that may be interested in the Russian Eurasia studies around the Center for Strategic and uh, International Studies. Next slide. So on the Media Forensics program, there's several different ways of examining media through using machine learning techniques that were applied over the past four years. We're looking at digital integrity. This is, can we trust the bits and, and pixels that are being shown on the screen? Um, what's going on? And here's an example of, of looking at the duplication of the pixels with the rooster tails. Then is what we're observing consistent with physics? Do laws of physics apply? And then there's semantic integrity. Semantic gets into the meaning of what is being shown and the construct and content of what is shown relative to other information we may learn about it. Weather conditions, shadow, or the shadow is consistent with the time of day of this reporting. We have a date and time stamp we can pull out, off of this of, of, from the media, from time it was uploaded to time it was received. What's that time series look like? How fast is it propagating? Where's the source information? All that gets into the semantics. And then these measurements are fused to come up with an integrity reasoning score across the digital, physical, and semantic domains. And a reason for coming up with that score is it gives us an indicator that can be indexed and searched and filtered on. It's a great way of providing triage of a tremendous amount of, of data to narrow down what we need to pay attention to. Now, is it important if it says we have high integrity and we can trust this media because it looks like it, it came off a camera? Absolutely. Because we have camera data, we may have software information. There's a lot of, of wealth of information that, that can be gleaned from data that comes out of software and sensors. If it's been manipulated, is that important to us? Well, yes, because 
the te tools and techniques we would use to chase down sensor information or other metadata, some of that information we or process we wouldn't even apply if it's been augmented. If I'm analyzing video and I get one that has the YouTube or Google tags in it, there's a whole lot of stuff I'm not going to do because it didn't come off the camera and that data didn't wasn't preserved. Uh, next slide. So the Metaphor program ran for about four years. Uh, we ran yearly evaluations um, across uh, probably a hundred different. We have over a hundred different analytics that are, are running. Um, and have been evaluated. And what these charts get to is uh, each one of the gray lines in the lower left are performance measurements. We're looking at rock curves, receiver operator characteristics, the trade off between true positive and on the uh, y axis and false positive rates on the, on the x axis. And uh, a near perfect example is the image on the right, where we have um, nearly zero uh, false alarm rates with. Uh, a true positive rates for um, for many. The left image shows the red line is a fusion score. So this is where we have a number of analytics that are returning scores on a type of manipulation. Some are high, some are low. Negative is also important and provides more information. What the fuse score offers is a wrap up or roll up of the contributing or what's important features are being flagged upon and presenting that in a way to come up with a single integrity score for a media type given a number of manipulations that are being detected. Next slide. So some of the research that has happened since deep fakes have come out. So about halfway through the program is when deep fakes showed up and then we were asked, you know, we understand that metaphor is designed for more traditional forensics uh, looking for uh, image and video manipulations. Can this also apply to, to deep fakes as they're are gaining speed and, and a lot of interest? And the answer is yes. Um, there are some characteristics and artifacts that are introduced by these systems that um, are quite detectable. Uh, the, the chart on the bottom right makes me very happy. This is a rock curve on log scale. What does that mean? That means the value, the detection accuracy is so close to zero. We look at it on a log scale to, to differentiate between the algorithms. Otherwise, they would all look like they're nearly a perfect detector. Um, we have a classification accuracy on those of over 99%. The uh, image on the lower left is comparing um, real versus fake Obama video, the fake one being the Jordan Peele. Now, this is a, turned into a protection, um, personnel protection models that are being used and modeled um, for all the, at the time, all the candidates that uh, were in the potential running for U.S. presidency during this cycle. So there are models being built for, for Trump, for Biden, um, it was for all the other all the other candidates as well as some others that are that are higher up in the um, uh, chain of command that um, models are also being built on. And this is in a concert with the UC Berkeley and uh, Kitware. Kitware is a prime on Metaphor, and everybody has a tell. And what they're learning are the tells, and that even with a per impersonator as gifted as Jordan Peele, he doesn't have the tells that Obama has. And we can differentiate a video that he impersonates as well as one that um, was real at, from Obama. And we're doing the same thing um, for other candidates uh, to include the president uh, for this upcoming election. Uh, next slide. So that kind of the nutshell of what goes into our system. Media goes in, we look at different types of integrity reasons and build a fusion and then the, a score of how much can we trust this as being authentic? Um, or has it been manipulated to a point that, that you know, we need to understand why, if it's important to us, that we have less trust into the data? Uh, next slide. That just gets in, into the fusion and, and the goal is just to, to um, trigger on the, or identify the, the weights of the scores and provide a single score. Uh, next slide, we'll go ahead and. Move that. That's just more of the fusion scores and the impact. Next slide. This is an example of an interface of, a, of a, the prototype system, metaphor prototype system, where we load in an image 
And as it's being uploaded, the gallery fires uh, or the, the uh, analytics fire. And we see a list of analytics on the right-hand side. Each one of these boxes represents a type of analytic. Uh, these are all Dockerized containers. This is a modular system. Each of the analytics can be pulled out with, and accessed uh, with API across a number of systems. In fact, we're having a demo day on August 11th. Uh, it's gonna be virtual, uh, DARPA uh, sponsored demo day for Metaphor. And there's gonna be multiple systems of, that different agencies are using that are taking these types of analytics and plugging them in to augment the analysis that they are providing. And what we see in this example is a gallery on the on the left loading in the Catalan uh, image. And the percent scores that we see uh, on the thumbnails are the um, integrity scores. These are the fused scores um, based on the this, I believe, if you use the boosted uh, fusion model. And we get the score, which is, is low in this case, uh, to put my cheaters on to see what that is. It's about this is zero. OK, very low. Um, which means we have we have low trust in this being an authentic or, or uh, unmodified uh, image, and then we also have uh, analytics that show these show their scores or masks. And what we're viewing on the screen in the middle is a mask overlay with hot spots of where uh, significant manipulation may have occurred. Uh, the analytics on the on the right um, identify which analytics are being triggered. Uh, as well as the fused results at the top. The ground truth one is, is for our own internal research. NIST provided um, challenge problems, and there's a lot of data with these challenge problems. So NIST would identify what the ground truth is and where the manipulations occurred and provide those masks. So if this was an image that was used in, in the NIST evaluation, we would be able to load it and compare how well the analytics are performing as compared to the ground truth mess that that would show. Uh, that's just that's not something that would be available um, necessarily uh, that, that people would be interested in because they're for the most part you don't have the ground truth when you're in a forensic shop uh, processing data. Next slide. Um, let's cycle this until they, they show up. So challenges, um, oh, go back. What happened to the bullets? There we go. So there's some challenges were popping up. Um, I, I started at DARPA in uh, November, 2018, halfway through the program. And uh, there was a lot of challenges around, well, we expect most data on the internet is gonna be compressed multiple times. We see that, we know that. Uh, there's also anti-forensic techniques that are being applied as, as well as adversarial inputs. Some of those were discussed a little bit earlier where noise patterns can be introduced to, to uh, incorrectly uh, classify and identify media. So we started introducing these as augmentation techniques and manipulations to media to find out how well the analytics that are being developed uh, perform. Still room for growth, still room for... Um, for understanding the impact for some of these. Um, also reasoning across multiple assets and modalities. Metaphor really was around image and video only. Audio came into play when it, it tied to uh, consistency with what is being shown in the image, either through speech or uh, environmentals. And then there's characterization. If somebody took out a, a beach ball or a person on their beach picture um, to, to make a, a, a prettier or better uh, vacation photo? Do we really care? Probably not. Um, when they start to remove, um, you know, politicians or insert weapons or um, try to mask the school buses as tanks and vice versa, we care. So we need to get into this characterization of intent and malice versus Am I just doing a white balance to make my image better looking to me? That's not so much interesting as it is some of the others. And then really getting into to threat models that um, and use cases that transition partners and the communities that would be using these type of tools care about. And next slide. So that brings us toward um, semantic forensics. I, no, I'm about have a few minutes left, right? So semantic forensics gets into all the modalities. And this is where one 
Uh, the program is gonna be kicking uh, off in August. Uh, next slide. And what we're looking at is detection. I've already talked to you all, all about detection on the image and video side. This is detecting image, video, audio, text, the associated distribution and presentation of media. Attribution is the manipulation or source of media consistent with who they claim to be, or can we attribute them to known actors? And then the characterization is uh, the intent, malice or not, across multimedia to defend against large scale disinformation attacks. Next slide. Now the techniques across modalities are getting better and broadening. Uh, we see a combination of text and images. We have a, a false ad down in the bottom. That it, Those bedrooms don't exist. They were all synthetically generated. However, what we are observing are, are semantic inconsistencies in the way that media is being generated. Next slide. Let's see if these pop up. Okay. What we have in the text was um, carpeting, 24 seven carpeting in bathroom with seating for two more people. There's some words and phrases that just fall out and, and, and are semantically incorrect. It is a school bus being classified as a tank or a tank being classified as a school bus are semantic inconsistencies. These to me point to failures in the machine learning and AI approach. And because to the human eye, we can still differentiate and determine what these objects are, but the machine learning algorithms are mistaken. There's a level of semantics that's missing, and this is where we're going to get into with the semantic forensic program and using some of those features and, and diving in further. It's beyond faces. It's images, it's all kinds of images, uh, cats if you like, vehicles, buildings, We've seen fake resumes, GPT-2 and GPT-3 uh, have some really compelling um, generated media. GPT-3 was used to, to create uh, um, synthetically generated uh, dad jokes because dad jokes. Uh, next slide. And what we're looking at is, is where these different modalities can, can play. We've already seen the targeted personal attacks with the some of the deep fakes. There's generated stories or augmented stories um, that are inconsistent with what is being captured. And then there's the random fake, which is pulling together ransomware and deep fake or augmented data. Now, most of you on the call are probably familiar with uh, a security background checks and that kind of information. What if we can augment that information and make it look like you're saying something you shouldn't be saying? acting in a way you shouldn't be acting and providing a reporting evidence that puts you in an environment that you weren't in. And if you don't pay them a ransom, then they're gonna ruin your credibility or probably interfere with your uh, investigation process. Next slide. Um, let's go ahead and next slide. Next slide. So what we're going with notionally uh, in the semantic forensics is looking at uh, across modalities. We have text, image, audio, video. Consider this as type, kind of like a news feed or, or source. And the presentation, it, it, it attributes to a, a news organization, an author, and says it's a rainy day, a violent group of protesters gathered in front of the U.S. Capitol building protesting Social Security. Well, there's some consistencies that we can pulled together. So if we go to the next slide, we hear that there's a group. We can see there's a group. We can hear child cheering. Uh, cheering. We can see that it looks to be a protest. Okay, that checks out, but there's inconsistencies that are they're semantically relevant. Next slide. And this is where we look in. There doesn't appear to be violence. There are kids present. There are people hugging in scenes. The signs are holding up uh, information about equality, uh, one on health. It's not related to social security. What happened? Why is this ha why is this presented in this manner? Next slide. As in the Catalonian uh, example, it is probably to uh, elicit a response to a targeted audience. So diversity, or I'm sorry, <laughs> so um, discordance between groups, and further polarize them. Uh, we've seen that in, in ads, we've seen it in tweets, 
And so it's a way of how do we help people uh, understand and whether they can trust media and provide information. We're not trying to, regardless of what Rolling Stone magazine has said about DARPA, we're not trying to censor the internet. What we are trying to do is provide meaningful indicators so that consumers can say, hey, there's a red flag to this. Maybe I should check the source. Maybe I should see something else as to this event taking place. We've seen Twitter and Facebook already going down this path and raising red flags and saying, this may not be correct. You may want to check your source information on that. Some of the algorithms that are developed through, through social media sites are using researchers that we funded on, on DARPA to provide this. Next slide. Is this malicious? It's certainly an augmentation, a manipulation. Do we care? Probably not. It's interesting and entertaining. Next slide. What about this one? Here, the story is being changed and is politically charged. Neither of these two images could be derived from the other. They both have a common ancestor. That's the provenance and pedigree. But one, the Junk Education Act of 1982 is more original. That's what the text that went on the signs and we support ROTC was a uh, manipulated one that was uh, posted on the internet. Next slide. This kind of gets into the, the different technical areas that we, we have on the program to include in the bottom right, a red team. And this is gonna be state of the art, uh, staying up with state of the art. I mean, deep fakes was kind of a surprise um, on the DARPA program partway through. We're not gonna be surprised again. And we actually have the, the challenge curation and red team side is gonna be uh, researchers in, in state of the art, as well as following what's coming out uh, internationally in these areas and curate, uh, help curate challenges, as well as feed to the evaluation data uh, and use case and threat modeling um, for the program. Next slide. So that kind of summarizes the, the programs of where we're going, where we are, where we're going, uh, kind of four years plus in a, in a nutshell. Uh, a few minutes going over. These are just some some questions on on what we need to continue to consider, and, and and some of what we're addressing in the uh, upcoming program. Next. Okay. Not sure if you have any questions. Um, I did not have the chat up because I, I didn't want to get distracted while trying to uh, drive through these. So Dr. Johnson, I don't want to let anybody get away without answering at least one question. So we'll, sure. we'll make up the time. We'll, we'll, we'll kill that break later on. Um, so here's, here's one from Alec. Um, they, want, they want your opinion on whether or not it makes sense to create and distribute tools like these for the public. Do you think these tools can be made user-friendly enough to enable people who don't have a background in forensics to use them? Absolutely. Um, within reason. There is not a single agency um, that can take on this problem. Uh, I really do see news outlets and social media as being the front line um, that comes into the end consumer. Uh, that, that's the, that's, you know, where the data is coming in. That's the, that's the attack vector. Um, I would love to see tools like this in every social media, um, every news agency, um, defense, forensic shops, there's different levels of expertise and different levels of the analytics that make sense. I'm not going to hand over forensic tools to my mom, but what I do want my mom, what I do, do want her to understand is getting from a news source or social media feed that if there's an indicator that says, this may not be completely true. Um, here's a link to a fact check or here's uh, some additional information. It gets into the, uh, somebody mentioned the the uh, true sandwich, I think, in chat earlier. I, I love that, where disinformation and misinformation is going to happen. We've been living with it forever. As long as people com can communicate, going back to, to Cain and Abel, there's, you know, I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's disinformation and misinformation. It's going to happen. But what we need is our indicators that can help us have trust or at least some kind of indicators. We're living with spam all the time in email. 
why not have something like a, a, a spam filter, at least an indicator? I'm still getting in my inbox. I have a choice that I can dump all spam tag in my spam box or look at it all. But it's an indicator and gives me some control over what I'm going to ingest and how I pay attention to it. I love that my cell phone provider says possible spam when I get the email. I'll let it roll the voicemail. And I think most of the time it is. It is spam. I'm OK with that. And I would like the same type of um, checks happening and at least indicators with media as it is being consumed and disseminated. Um, I, I, I think that that uh, having this in the, in the public and out is, is a good thing. Well, Dr. Johnson, thank you for that comment, that answer. And thanks for kicking off the second half of the conference here when we start talking about solutions to it. You're now, you are now an official Army Mad Scientist, so we thank you for coming on and talking to us. Uh, thank you very much. So up next, we have the Technology Engagement Team and the DisInfo Cloud, Alexis Frisbee and Christina Emmer from the Global Engagement Center at the U.S. Department of State. So Alexis is a contractor at the Department of State's Global Engagement Center, where she supports efforts to counter foreign state and foreign non-state propaganda and disinformation threats. And Christina is director at Park Advisors, resp responsible for managing projects at the intersection of disinformation and countering violent extremism. So welcome both. I'm going to try to make sure you guys are on camera here. So I think as soon as one of you starts speaking, you will be good to go. Excellent. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I think you already did a great job of highlighting who both Christina and I are, um, but I'm Alexis Frisbee. As, you know, as noted, I am part of the Global Engagement Center's Technology Engagement Team. I'll go ahead and let Christina do her own self-introduction here. Hello, Christina Nemer here with Park Advisors, which is a small consulting company acting as an implementing partner to the Technology Engagement Team responsible for running some of the initiatives that you'll be hearing about later on. Thanks for having us. Yeah, let me echo Christina was saying, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we've been pre preparing for this uh, presentation, I think since, since February. So uh, I think that's when you guys first contacted us and um, it's been a really exciting part of the, the conversation. We're really looking forward to being here today. Um, I do wanna, um, of course, kind of highlight uh, the background of what we're getting into within this conversation to, to set up the smoothest transition possible. But um, as, we, as has kind of been discussed and is, is clearly the, the face of this presentation or the face of this conference is, you know, we're looking to understand the problems and solutions to information warfare, or weaponized information. Um, and the, the GEC has been brought on um, to, to kind of describe some of its actions and specifically the technology engagement team. So I first wanna just kind of highlight areas in which the GEC, uh, what it is that we do, um, why it's important within the counter propaganda and disinformation space. Um, and then I'm just gonna to touch into uh, the role of the technology engagement team within the GEC and background on how, uh, on what has really directed our mission and our efforts. Um, and then I'm gonna hit on two specific initiatives which are really kind of the, the, the of this presentation are uh, testbed and also disinfo cloud um, and we're going to discuss how they assist in kind of the solutions to uh, weaponized information. So I, I think before I, I hopped on this call I had a chance to to browse through some of the um, weaponized uh, information webinars that you guys have previously hosted um, and there were nine preliminary insights that, that were listed out. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to highlight three of them because they, I, I believe that they are discussed or really addressed by the presentation that we're getting to, getting to today. Um, and that is the information environment is rapidly changing. Um, that is that there is a variety of tools and strategies that uh, individuals, both military and civilian can apply to mitigate the effects of weaponized information. Um, and then finally, the, to combat weaponized information, uh, military and co corporate co uh, cooperation is, is essential. So um, the GEC has worked on this. And uh, I think if you can put up our slides, if that'd be great. Thank you. So the GEC, is, as, as you can see from the mission statement there, um, we, are, we are, are mandated to direct lead 
synchronize, integrate, and coordinate efforts of the federal government to uh, recognize, understand, expose, and counter foreign state and foreign non-state propaganda and disinformation efforts that are aimed at undermining um, uh, the policies, security, or uh, stability of the United States, uh, Un United States allies and partner nations. So this was a mandate that was directed to the, D uh, the uh, Global Engagement Center and the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017. Um, originally, the GEC was established uh, to, with a focus specifically on counterterrorism. Once this NDAA was passed, uh, the mission expanded. And if you want to go to the next slide, please. Once the uh, NDAA was passed, there was a variety of um, kind of conversation around how does how does this how does this affect? Um, sorry. Just making sure you're on the right side here. Yeah, apologies. Uh, the screen sharing is defeating me right now. You'd think uh, this far into the conference we'd have it down, but no worries. Stand by. Well, it's it's easy enough to to kind of go through, and, and I think you'll get the visual here um, in a second once I as I kind of go through. But ultimately, um, once we had that expansion, or once the the GEC was given this expansion of a mission, it's 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 a huge addition to the mandate from where it originally starts out. Um, and so there was a need to add in more teams. So the GEC ended up kind of adding in, originally it was focused on counterterrorism, like I said, but it ended up adding in three additional uh, threat focused teams. So that would be the uh, China, uh, Russia, Iran, and then of course counterterrorism. And then on top of that, uh, the GEC is really focused on a data driven mission. So it wants to make sure that what we're doing, uh, the vision is that it, is, is, it has data and statistics behind it. So we've established three functional teams um, and the three functional teams are data, data and analytics research or uh, analytics and research team. Um, and they uh, do a great job at supporting all the threat teams and, and also the technology engagement team and kind of putting um, the, the ideas um, and, and putting data behind the ideas that are coming out. Um, and then we also have the interagency and international coordination cell um, and this is a, a group that is really essential to ensuring that there is collaboration within the interagency and that there's communication within the interagency. Um, in some of these previous presentations, we've been hearing a lot about how uh, this is this is utterly essential, right? We can't be siloed in how we approach this um, this issue of disinformation and misinformation. So ultimately, getting oh, brilliant. Um, so ultimately, getting into understanding um, what other uh, groups are doing out there um, and also you know how uh, how can how can we make sure that we're engaging with them the uh, inter, uh, interagency and international coordination cell has been uh, truly key and then finally there's the technology engagement team um, and the this is again one of the, what we're kind of drifting into in terms of discussion today but I did just want to highlight that the TET is not the only group within the GEC. Um, and we are certainly not the, <laughs> what we're discussing today is certainly not the only um, uh, uh, approach the GEC is taking to counter propaganda and disinformation. But um, if you could go to the next slide real quick. But ultimately the, the mission of the technology engagement team came from a sub uh, directive or sub mandate of the uh, National Defense Authorization Act. And that it was, uh, the GEC was mandated to facilitate the, the use of a wide range of uh, technologies and techniques by sharing expertise among federal departments and agencies, seeking expertise from uh, external sources and implementing best practices. So as you can see from our mission, um, you know, we've, we've really drawn from that and we've established ourselves uh, a, a series of dedicated efforts for the US government to identify, assess, test and implement technologies against the problems of foreign propaganda and disinformation. I and mean, we do this by working with interagency colleagues, but also by reaching out to academia, by reaching out to think tanks, and, most, and very importantly, by reaching out to uh, private industry because as has been said, said before in previous uh, presentations here, um, there really needs to be uh, conversation and collaboration between these, between private and public, um, because it, it is a, a, a global effort, right? It's not just a, a government problem, it's not just a private problem, um, it, it truly requires us to have a conversation. So if you wanna dip over to the next slide, please. Um, ultimately, some of the goals of the technology engagement team was, is, as I pointed out, about synchronizing the U.S. government and industry's response to, dis, to disinformation trends. 
um, and, and being able to better understand um, and access technologies to counter propaganda um, and disinformation, we want to be able to increase that, that understanding and that access across the interagency, but also across, um, again, private, uh, private industry, private company, um, in the sense that we really want them, we want there to be uh, interest in what, what ways that people can, can identify propaganda and disinformation. Um, I do want to highlight that, again, the GEC has a, uh, a mandate or a focus on foreign propaganda and disinformation. Um, so if you want to uh, dip over to the next slide again as well. <clears throat> the TET has, has specified its focus into looking at um, what, what industry is doing. Um, and this is highlighting kind of what people have already been discussing, but looking at, you know, increased reliance on the internet has expanded or has further enabled this information. Um, propaganda disinformation has been going on uh, pre-internet pre times, but the expansion into internet has uh, it certainly allowed it to prom promulgate and kind of get eyes on it faster. So there has been the development of uh, social media, fake social media accounts, uh, bot, bots and sock puppets, including also trolls. Um, you know, there's this uh, insight into rapid social media account regeneration, um, deep fakes, which we've heard extensively about now, um, but also cheap fakes, right? So there's, there's, it's not um, one category. There's definitely uh, shades of, of disinformation and propaganda that come through. And then of course, natural language generation. So we're talking synthetic text um, and things along those lines. Um, next slide, please. So when we're considering how to approach the problem of, of disinformation, we also need to be really aware and cognizant of how people are getting information. Um, and there are a variety of ways in which we are influenced every day. And we, <clears throat> excuse me, we being the entire population, not just one person or another. We are all influenced, we are all biased, we all have our backgrounds, our, our interests. And <clears throat> um, where we come from, um, who we engage with, what we read, um, you know, what we respond to, these will influence how we consume information, what information we consume. Um, and really, this, this, is, this is great. It's, it shows that we have very different perspectives and, and kind of different lives. That's, that's important. But if you go to the next slide, you can also see that there is a concern <clears throat> that we trap ourselves in information bubbles. And also, there's a concern of intellectual laziness. These are, these are the words of, of scientists here. Um, but there, we have these psychological predispositions to disinformation online because we kind of fall in these two camps sometimes. We, we just, it's easy to click on something, to read it and say, I'm comfortable with this. I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna stay, I'm gonna stay in this zone. Um, and at the same time, it's easy to kind of not wanna drift away or, or think beyond what, what is being presented to us. Like, does this, does this actually impact us? Um, you know, is this being manipulative uh, or it, should, I, should I perhaps think about this a little bit more deep or do some more research? Um, we're all very busy people. So I think that that can really impact the way we receive and the way we discuss information or further yeah. spread information. So going to the next slide, um, you know, there have been a, a variety of ways in which uh, kind of discussing solutions or approaches to consider, um, you know, there's Several have been mentioned prior to this, but I, I'll just kind of highlight again, there's, we're, we're, technology is not the only way, but it's the way that we're focusing on um, in, this, in this particular conversation and, and also what the technology engagement team focuses on. But there are certainly conversations around legislative or regulatory um, uh, narrative or educational uh, kind of shifts or um, impacts that could be made to disrupt or diminish disinformation or, or perhaps uh, assist in countering disinformation. But again, the TET focuses on the technological aspects. So on the next slide here, um, we see different solutions that the technology engagement team considers um, when discussing, discussing solutions or considering solutions surrounding um, tools to address uh, propaganda and disinformation. So this is counter, counter propaganda and disinformation tool categories that we've identified um, throughout some of our own research uh, and 
course, these are not the only ones that exist out there, uh, but we highlight on them because we find that they are um, important, important to both the interagency um, and foreign partner, foreign government partner colleagues we interact with, but they also have impact right to um, media groups. So if you, for example, if you consider uh, blockchain based content verification, um, these are something like uh, creating a fingerprint on a, a, something that's immutable. Um, you take a, a video, say uh, in Syria, white hats record a chemical attack um, on a regular fan, uh, on a regular camera app on your phone. And then they post it and adversaries can come back and say, well, that didn't happen. It's not real. Uh, you have no way of proving this. This is fake news, right? There are ways that um, groups have now created um, a blockchain based verification that you, you, you hit this, you open a certain app, you hit record and it starts from the minute it starts recording, it starts transcribing that into a blockchain, right? Um, and this essentially creates an immutable um, uh, uh, kind of recording of what the event is happening. So when that gets posted later, if adversaries come back and say, no, 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 this didn't happen, the recorder can post it saying, no, this is the original. There have been no edits made. You can see if there were edits made, if so, where they happened. That also makes it easier to track if um, a video is altered later on down the line or if a picture or something is, uh, audio is altered later on down the line. Um, again, that's just one technology solution. We see a lot of social listening tools. This tends to be uh, of great interest um, in terms of understanding the information environment. In order to respond, we certainly want to um, be able to know what we're responding to. And so you see a, a, a big uh, kind of industry of social listening tools out there. Um, ad tech is also uh, kind of one of the hot button items right now as well. So again, um, as we cycle through this, I wanna make sure that I say these are not the only solutions or, or categories out there, but these are some of the ones that we've been focusing more heavily on um, in, in our um, various initiatives um, and kind of what we do. I think that that's probably an easy way to then uh, shift to the next slide and discuss our various initiatives. Um, so the technology engagement team has uh, highlighted, uh, set up a variety of efforts that really do well at supporting and interlinking with each other. So we have our tech demo series, um, our tech challenges, our TET tech testbed, um, and then also a couple of other engagements, um, including Disinfo Cloud. So the two, as we mentioned earlier, that we want to focus on are Disinfo Cloud and, and the testbed. So I, I, if you want to just shift to the next slide, I think that it's easiest to uh, quickly highlight the tech demo series help us in identifying um, tools and technologies that are out there. Uh, next slide, please. And our tech challenges, uh, uh, this has been mentioned, but these uh, help us work with our foreign partner, partner foreign government partners in, um, in, in that we host these events overseas. They're one to two day events and they're meant to find tools or technologies from the region we host these events. We recently had one in uh, Taiwan uh, and uh, it was a very great um, uh, event that drew a lot of attention. Um, and there were two winners that are two selectees that came out of that. And again, it was, a, it was an exciting event and it had a lot of interest from the uh, government there because it was coming up on the uh, elections during that time or was right around that time frame in February. So again, these are a great, great way for us to see what other tools are out there to see what people are working on within certain regions. Um, and then to also to work on integrating them in support of our foreign government partners, uh, which I believe is what um, one of the previous presenters was discussing and that we really need to ensure that, you know, the, that we, the United States is, is coming through and supporting our, our foreign partners and our allies, because it is not just a U.S. problem. It is, this is a, a, a broader issue. So uh, I think on the next page here, I'm going to actually hand it over to Christina Nemmer uh, to take over on the test bed portions, which are the bulk of what we want to discuss today. Thank you very much, Alexis. So moving right into the tech test bed, this is where we start seeing a little more action. A lot of the initiatives that Alexis was talking about are ways that we identify different tools in the counter disinformation space, of which there are many and more are added every day. 
largely falling into the buckets that Alexis was talking about. But for the GEC and the technology engagement team specifically, the question then becomes, all right, we've identified a tool. Now, how do we know that it actually works against the problem set? How do we assess it? How do we validate it? So thus was born the technology test bed. Now, this is meant to, again, identify different challenges faced by the U.S. government, by the GEC and its interagency partners, as well as foreign partners, um, as well as foreign civil society organizations, people, stakeholders working in the counter disinformation space who are constantly challenged by different um, issues um, when it comes to countering, identifying and pushing back on disinformation. And so the test bed is meant to operationalize that. And I will walk a bit into what it looks like. So here I will ask if we could skip ahead to slide 17. Let's go this way. Right there, perfect. Thank you. All right, so we get a lot of questions as to, you know, what is the test bed? And the first thing I will say is that the test bed is, is not a simulated environment per se, although that would be a fantastic effort. Rather, it is a, it's a methodology. It's, it's an evaluation and testing methodology that we have split into three different stages. So in the first stage, that is when we have identified a tool and these tools come to us either from some of the other GEC's initiatives like the tech demo series or the tech challenges that Alexis was just talking about, or they could just be tools that we come across in our day-to-day -day research um, and operating in this space. So we identify the tool and the stage one vetting is just open source. Everything we can find out about the tool, who's the company that has built the tool, um, are there any security concerns we need to be worried about? Uh, what is the technology behind the tool itself? As much as we can find out from their website, from news articles, from Crunchbase, anything like that. Uh, at each stage, we have a list of nine criteria against which we are assessing the tool. So that remains constant. Um, following that stage one, we write a report, a, a quick uh, summary. It's like a one to two to three pages, everything you need to know, just a quick glance. What is this tool? Assuming that it is a valid tool in the space, we would move it into a stage two, technical due diligence stage. Now, this is the part where we reach out to the company. Uh, we request a, a remote demo. And then we send them a technical questionnaire that they are, of course, free to fill out as much as they're comfortable filling out, understanding that there's always going to be proprietary information that a company may not be comfortable sharing. But the purpose of this stage, too, is to kind of go a bit deeper uh, to be able to put together a report on, you know, how does a tool actually function? What are the technologies being used? We are trying to cut through a lot of the buzzwords that people throw out all the time. Um, you know, they're saying they use AI when they're not. They're saying they're, it's built on blockchain when it's not. So we do want to make sure we're accurately uh, reporting on what the tool is and how it technically functions. So that also then results in about a 10 to 12 page report. Now, uh, assuming that everything does look good, we would move into the fun part, which is the actual product testing. And that is the stage three of the test bed process. Now, the, the, the methodology itself, it's not always linear. Um, as you might imagine, conducting a stage one open source assessment is a simple, simpler process. Um, it, it takes the least amount of time. It, it doesn't require outreach. So a lot of the tools that we have identified um, and, and are currently have our eye on, which is just under 200 at this point, but constantly gaining steam, we're constantly adding, identifying new technologies. The majority of them have been through the stage one uh, assessment because it's, it's the easiest. Um, we're, we make sure that not every tool is going to be tested per se, simply because the testing is driven by the use cases of the GEC, the interagency, forum partners, other stakeholders. So we wanna make sure that there is a demand. Um, then, uh, so essentially what it looks like, excuse me, I'm getting a call, should I have to my phone here? Um, what this looks like then is uh, we put together a short-term test. These are not long by any means. They are meant to be quick action, um, uh, wherein we set up a four, to six to eight week test. Um, and we provide up to 25,000 per test. 
that is something that uh, the GEC makes available. So it is a resource available to the interagency and other partners. But 25,000 to scope out a test that's paid to the tech vendor. Um, and we scope out the test based on uh, the use case provided to us. And again, that can come from a variety of, of stakeholders. When we set up a test, um, there are two ways that it can go. So the first way it could go is if um, a, a stakeholder, whether it's a, some, a team within the GEC or whether it's interagency comes and says, I have this particular use case, I have my eye on this tool, I'd like to, before I take a move towards acquiring or license tool X, I'd like to see how it performs against this use case. In that case, uh, it's simple. We have the use case, we have the, the company, we can set it up. Um, other times we'll get the use case. And even though we might know that there's a tool or two that could fulfill um, and provide the solution needed, we don't necessarily want to bias the process. So we will send out a call for submissions to our tech vendor community of interest. Now, again, because all of the tools that we have our eye on, they've gone through at least an initial vetting stage. When we do a call for submissions, it's not a long process. We put out the prompt, we give tech vendors one week to respond by submitting a one page concept note of how they would address the solution. And then from there, we um, quickly assess, we rank the proposals, we work with the requesting end user to see what are their top two or three, and then we set up that test. So you might be wondering, what does a test look like? I'm gonna walk you through. Could we please go to the next slide? All right, so this was a test. Um, the premise here was about the dark web and what we can track from the dark web to the surface web specifically. Can you track early or identify early indicators of disinformation campaigns on the dark web before they make their way onto the surface web? Now, um, there's always, I'm sure people can take issue with the premise. Um, I think a lot of times people think of, you know, fringe websites and how like 4chan, 8chan and how narratives might start there and then become a little mainstream. But um, the, the deeper question is, can you actually even start tracking that on the dark web? Uh, does it happen on the dark web? So this is a case where we, we took the, the prompt and the use case. Um, and the first thing we did was we, we uh, gauged and assessed different dark web analytics technologies, web scrapers, to see what might be the, the most comprehensive solution we could work with in this scenario. Um, so after a quick assessment uh, of about eight or nine different technologies, we settled on one called Terbium Lab, which does very comprehensive uh, dark web crawling. And so we worked with Terbium Labs. Again, we set up uh, a scope of work with about eight weeks, provide up to $25,000. And in that test, we then uh, identified together what might be some indicators of a disinformation campaign. Um, and again, it can always be added to and improved upon, but some of those indicators were, you know, compromised social media data or stolen voter registration lists, um, other PII, hacked accounts, uh, stolen accounts, things like that. And so um, Terbium Labs then went and started crawling to see where it was finding those types of indicators and what that might lead to. To make a long story short, um, ultimately what this test found is that you cannot say with 100% certainty that the dark web hosts um, specific disinformation narratives that then you know translate and uh, transfer to the surface web. Um, rather, the dark web is a bunch of marketplaces that host a variety of tools and data that you can purchase, right? So you can purchase um, hacked accounts that are dormant. You pay a little bit more if they're older accounts because that lends them a bit of a veneer of legitimacy. Um, you can even pay different prices depending on gender um, in addition to date. But these are all things that you can purchase on the dark web. Um, the problem then is you cannot track uh, per se who is making these purchases and what marketplaces they're going to. Uh, it's a bit difficult. And then you cannot track it and say, because uh, buyer X bought this stolen PII on the dark web on you know, June 23rd, and then August, uh, two months later, we saw this disinformation campaign happen on the surface web. 
Uh, buyers don't normally leave reviews like Amazon. You know, four out of five stars has helped me foment a disinformation campaign. It's not something they typically do. So all this to say, uh, this test was very illuminating in that it helped us see the limitations of what we can analyze from the dark web. To give you a, a quick other example, that, which is not on a slide here, but uh, to, just to give some variety, uh, another use case we got was from a, an office trying to understand um, what are the different narratives that China and Russia were pushing on the future of arms control, um, specifically as they try to diminish the US's role um, and understanding what types of narratives they were pushing in a specific third country. In that case, that uh, end user came to us, they had a specific tool in mind, uh, Protagonist, which is a narrative tracking platform. And so we were able to set up a scope of work of eight weeks, again, that 25,000. Protagonist delivered a uh, report highlighting all um, the points that the end user was interested in. Can we please move to the next slide? Okay. So this slide here, I would actually direct you towards the middle of it, uh, where it says the Disinfo Cloud Dashboard. Um, as we have been going through and identifying different tools and assessing them in different stages of assessment, we uh, also built a repository so that uh, stakeholders like yourselves can log in and see what are these tools. Um, you can search and filter by different criteria. So this is what we came up with. Uh, it's called disinfocloud.com. Uh, I like to call it a consumer reports-like platform where you can log in again and see different tools and, and compare them, especially with a lot of similar tools. You can see the stage of assessment that these tools are sitting at. Um, you can uh, request, it's, a, it's meant to be a dynamic and engaging site. So you can request that we uh, assess a tool. You can request a specific test. Um, you can provide all manner of suggestions. It's a site that we're constantly improving based on user feedback. So, so we always welcome that. Uh, it is password protected. Not everybody uh, has access. Originally it was meant to be just .mil and .gov, but then uh, we realized that was a bit limiting. We want these tools to be tools that anyone working in the counter disinformation space is aware of. And of course that's banned. So we, uh, we now allow access to private sector as well, to academia, to civil society organizations, to journalists, anybody that have, might have need for any sort of tool uh, is welcome. We do vet uh, and approve folks before they're granted access. Um, but the purpose is meant to help be a resource. Uh, we're not just also identifying tools that you would pay uh, to access you know, through licenses. We also put a premium on identifying free and open source tools because we know that not everybody has the resources. So disinfocloud.com is the name of the site. We uh, encourage you to sign up. Uh, it is a password protected site, but we do have a public facing landing page wherein you can see all the different uh, tools, the types of tools. You can see the news, research and events that we're constantly highlighting in the space. We do a lot of summarizing of events and research just to, to again, be that one-stop shop um, for, for all of you. So, that is an overview of the test bed and then how it feeds into the Simple Cloud. But again, all of the technology engagement team's initiatives ultimately feel, feed into the Simple Cloud. It's where you can see the results of these assessments of these tools that we have identified. But I will end there um, and hand it back over to Alexis or perhaps it might be time for Q&A. Yeah, I think that that uh, was a actually a great spot to end in terms of what our overall presentation was. We, we did want to be, you know, uh, aware of the time here and also wanted to give a chance for there to be any questions, should there be some. I might, like the previous presenter, have had my chat function off so I could focus more on what was being said. Um, but we are open to taking um, a few questions. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have a few questions in the Q&A here. Uh, we'll start with Ian's question. So if you if you guys were here for when the war game section was briefed out, one of the one of the comments was that there was a lack of understanding of what U.S. government organizations should be in charge of the information warfare. Uh, is the GEC or the State Department the right answer or a start to figuring it out? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the GEC does see itself as the coordinating body of um, 
of the United States government, of the US government. I'm not saying that we're the only ones who are focused on um, information warfare, information operations, because clearly that is patently false. Um, but I think that one of our main objectives and, and the mandate that we have been given by Congress is to assist in getting everybody kind of on the same page um, as, it, as it applies to um, countering propaganda and disinformation at a minimum, um, which falls into the overall kind of uh, information operations, information warfare uh, kind of area. So yes, but I, I also want to be, um, I, I put a filter on that in, in the sense that I am, I am specifically within the, the technology engagement team and um, of course do not speak at the leadership level here, but I believe that we do see a, a, a presence for ourselves at a, at a wider angle. Great, thank you. Uh, next question comes from, from Ronald Watros. The military and Department of State programs are focused on foreign information and tech by policy and laws. How does the GEC bridge the gap to domestic U.S. tech mis slash disinformation narratives mirrored from foreign sources into the domestic U.S. environment? Yeah, actually, um, that's a great question um, as well. And I think that the way I, I want to um, approach that is by talking about the way we engage in outreach. Um, and that is done not only at the technology engagement team level, um, where we have a Silicon Valley embed from our team um, who, who's out there to, to engage not only with other interagency representatives in the area, but to also engage more closely with the, um, the companies in the region, clearly. Uh, but on top of that, we also have uh, a really great um, leadership of the GEC, which, which is regularly looking to engage with um, you know, uh, private industry and looking to have conversations to ensure that there is discussion um, occurring. So I think that you know, th those, are, those are in terms of interaction that's talking about at a domestic level. Um, I, I, I just you know, always like to emphasize that the, the GEC's role is, is foreign focused. Um, and I, and I, I think the internal we were, we, <laughs> Uh, are, are not permitted to influence due to authorities. Um, and we, we make sure to stay strictly within that. Um, but we do look to ensure that we're engaging so we understand where there are, where, where the conversation is happening. Um, and to ensure that we're kind of giving our two cents in terms of what is going on within the propaganda disinformation field, but certainly not looking to uh, influence anything on the national level. Great, thank you. So our, our next question, which I think will probably be our last so we can get right back on track, is from Dedso Weiner. Um, and this is probably for Christina because it's, it's based on the, the information from the disinfo cloud. Um, so you had, you had talked us through how there's the public page and everything. So how do you operationalize and raise awareness um, the results of investigating disinformation with regards to specific narrative campaigns? So I guess that's saying, what is the next step after you've discovered this? Is there any way to do something about it? Yeah, thank you for that question. So I will say for each test that we run, it largely is based on the end user and how widely they want us to push out the results um, or if they would prefer to keep it just to them. So, I mean, the short answer is that we, we work with each end user to determine if we will push out the results or not. Where we can and the end user is fine with us having stating their use case and what the test that we ran, then we will publicly uh, show what was the test, the prompts, um, how did the technology itself perform, what were some of the actionable insights that came out. We do our best to push that without the interagency and to our foreign partners, again, understanding that uh, many of us are working on similar issues. And so one test and the actionable insights that come from it are very useful in another context. Excellent. Thank you so much for those answers. And thank you for that great presentation. Um, and thank you for, for making us all aware of this disinfo cloud tool, which, which looks awesome. I can't wait to check it out. Um, and also, finally, thank you for getting us back on time. I think we're in a great, a great spot here. Um, we're probably going to just blow right through this, this five minute planned break, which I think everybody will be okay with as we round out the day here. Um, so Christina and Alexis, thanks. Thank you for coming on. And thank you for speaking with us. Thank you. Okay, and our next presenter is Olga Belogolova. 
and she's going to talk to us about perception warfare and whole of society solutions. Olga is a policy manager for information operations at Facebook, where she coordinates the company's IO disruptions effort. She spent the last three years at Facebook as an investigator and analyst, identifying, identifying, tracking, and disrupting coordinated IO campaigns with a particular emphasis on Russia and Central and Eastern Europe. So Olga, welcome, and you should have the floor. Great, thank you. And I think we have, I think we have a problem with your audio, Olga. Do you have a, a microphone? Stand by for one second. Uh, it, it's very garbled. Uh, it's, it still sounds very broken up, like there's something wrong with the microphone. We can we can hear you, but it's 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 um, I know I know you're speaking and I know it's there, but it's very broken up. Can you hear me now? That's perfect. There we go. OK, I was trying to use my uh, AirPod headphones, but that was a little too fancy for 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 today. So I <laughs> shouldn't have gone that route. Um, I'm glad this is working. <laughs> Great. Uh, so do we are we still taking a five minute break or is everybody back and we can uh, go right ahead? We are good to go. Let's let's drive on. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm pretty ex excited to join the Club of Mad Scientists. That's really the reason I'm here. Um, uh, I'm Olga Belglova, as you just said, and in my day job, um, I work as a policy manager at Facebook. Um, in the evenings, I moonlight as an adjunct professor at Georgetown, teaching a class called Lies and Disinformation, as Ben uh, mentioned at the beginning of this conference. Um, today, I'll be speaking to you in that capacity as a Georgetown professor, and so the ideas and views that I'm going to be sharing are my own and, um, and those um, associated um, with my work as a Georgetown professor. Uh, so what I wanted to talk to you about today is about perception warfare and perception hacking. Some people call it one or the other. Um, and how we as a society can work together across agencies, sectors, political and social divisions to address these problems. So the weaponization, the weaponized information environment and this research community is notoriously plagued by muddled technology like information operations, disinformation, misinformation fake news, um, influence operations, and more. So when I talk about perception warfare here today, I'm not just talking about the weaponization of information, but actually the, rather the weaponization of our perception of it. Um, so um, did you have my slides, if you can um, uh, put them up? Um, I don't, I'm not seeing them. Uh, perfect, thank you so much. Great, um, so, uh, I'm going to go to slide two now. Great. Um, so I'm going to start today by telling you a bit of a story. Um, and it's a story of the 2018 US midterm elections. The lead up to the elections um, period was characterized by an important realization in society here in the United States and around the world um, and a broader understanding of foreign interference threats. Um, there were countless conferences, television appearances, political cartoons like the ones you see on this slide, research reports, congressional hearings, stories of whistleblowers coming forward from the now famous troll farm in St. Petersburg, Russia. And there was a, this was a time where everybody was talking about this problem. And that's, that's the sort of environment that we were getting into. So next slide. So days, weeks before the election itself, government officials warned of pervasive Russian efforts to disrupt the election social media platform officials testified on the Hill um, and also kicked off dedicated war rooms to try to combat um, you know, the, the interference that had been previously identified. Um, and we all got used to as a society seeing the internet research agency memes like the ones on this slide um, in pretty much every news story that we read. Next slide. So bam. Um, the weekend just before the election, this guy um, uploaded a video on YouTube claiming to have quit the infamous troll farm and also claiming that he was coming forward as a whistleblower on their pre-election activities. He even contacted several disinformation reporters, researchers, seeing if they would bite. 
Now, this guy named Williams wasn't actually an unknown entity. His persona was well developed ahead of the 2016 election. He and his alleged brother, Calvin, had previously developed personas on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, claiming to be from the US and trying to reach African American audiences. They were all removed and exposed by different social media platforms in 2017, but here he was, he was back. Next slide. So in the video, Williams claims that he had evidence of interference in the 2018 midterm election. And he showed instructional papers like the ones you see here uh, that he allegedly stole from the, the troll farm. His video was removed quite quickly from YouTube and Facebook um, and Twitter and other platforms um, limited its distribution so that it couldn't be shared. Um, most reporters as well um, didn't really fall for this. Next slide. Then on the eve of the election, a website claiming to be linked to the Internet Research Agency went live at usaira.ru. The website, um, which you can see a few screenshots of here, um, loudly proclaimed its connection to the troll farm and shouted at the reader in all caps, citizens of the United States of America, your intelligence agencies are powerless. Despite all their efforts, we have thousands of accounts registered on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit spreading political propaganda. It went on and on to talk about how, you know, they had sort of duped all of us. So interestingly, the website went to no real lengths to obscure its relationship to the Internet Research Agency. In fact, it was registered to Azimut LLC, a company that had been indicted by the Justice Department in February of 2018, so earlier that year. Next slide. The next day, after the dramatic countdown of the website um, had expired, um, they had one at the bottom of the page, um, the content changed and openly listed Instagram account handles and claimed interference in specific congressional races. Facebook had already removed 30 Facebook accounts and 85 Instagram accounts the night before, thanks to a tip from US law enforcement. But the story here, and the reason I'm telling it, is why did these guys want to be found this time around? Why did they claim to have a wider reach and influence than they actually did? What was the point of making this such an overt operation? Next slide. Well, um, as I told you, um, we were pretty well primed for this particular kind of effort, right? We had spent basically two years fearing interference and they tapped into that very fear. We had spent two years reading dramatic whistleblower accounts of former troll farm employees coming forward. And then as we expected, Williams showed up and confirmed our suspicions. As NBC journalist Ben Collins called it at the time, this was a disinformation trap and we fell right into it. This wasn't just weaponization of information, it was the weaponization of our fears about influence operations. So why does perception hacking actually work? First, because of our cognitive biases and fears. Threat actors, particularly ones that studied the human psyche and reflexive control since the Cold War, take advantage of those expectations. Second, our growing distrust of experts and institutions meant that the IRA website shouting that our intelligence agencies and social media companies were powerless to stop these efforts, we were primed to actually believe what they were saying. Third, um, and I'm a huge believer in open source research and verification skills, um, and I appreciate some of the, uh, the comments earlier from, from Dr. Johnson on, on forensic research as well. Um, as a former journalist, I'm a bit biased um, towards, towards open source research, um, but there's so much that the general public could have known and figured out through some basics, right? As an example, um, as we already discussed, the website registration information for that IRA website showed its overt links to an indicted company. If one looked closely at the Williams video um, and actually tried to pull the URLs from his alleged evidence that he was showing, um, an analysis of those URLs would show that those articles were actually not really widely shared and not by a clustered group of people. Finally, in that video itself, if you look very closely when it was still up for a brief period of time, he was clearly still in Russia. Um, it was evidenced by the Russian water bottle that was sitting right next to him in his kitchen um, uh, to his left and the Russian KFC bucket that's sitting right behind him in his very former Soviet looking kitchen. Finally, um, and this is more of a societal issue, um, perception hacking and influence operations work because they capitalize on existing societal divisions and are distrust of one another. In fact, one of the reasons the 2018 effort was not as effective as it could have been 
um, was because law enforcement and social media companies had open channels of communication with one another and had actually worked together to the disrupt these accounts and remove these videos before they could actually reach a wider audience. So we weren't so powerless after all. Next slide. So I recognize that this is the, the portion of the conference here today that we're talking about solutions. So um, uh, in recognizing that, let's talk about some of the solutions to some of these perception hacking problems that I identified. So in order to address some of our cognitive biases and shortcuts, there's been a lot of great research on this particular subject, some of which you've heard today and some of which you can go in, um, and do some researching about. Um, when looking back at this 2018 perception hacking effort in particular, one thing we could have done was to wonder why these actors were being so obvious and to think twice whether we were being duped. Luckily, a lot of journalists and others did just that. Human beings don't actually do these things naturally, but there are ways to train our minds to engage in critical thinking, introduce friction to move our thinking from fast to slow. A recent study from MIT researchers actually showed that participants in a study were more likely to think about accuracy of what they were sharing if they were prompted with accuracy nudges, as they call them, um, and asked what they thought of accuracy as a concept, evaluate accuracy of headlines, even not the specific ones that they were trying to share. In my own personal life, I find that um, when I ask my mother, where did you read this? Was this a reliable source? Um, it later prompts her to send me emails that say, start with, I promise this is coming from a reliable source and citing where it, she actually found it. So in a way, I've trained that, you know, cognitive muscle there. Um, and I'm lucky as well, because uh, in my family, it's not just me, but my sister is actually a cognitive scientist. So we're all, we're all um, running our own influence campaign at home. Next slide. So um, we talked about distrust in institutions. That's one of the reasons why these types of campaigns are successful. Um, our distrust of institutions and expertise is both the goal and the tool of threat actors in the influence space. To combat this, we need to rebuild trust in institutions, including elections, democracy, intelligence community, government agencies, social media platforms, and media organizations and journalism. If any of you spend any time on Twitter at all, um, you'll be familiar with an interesting and problematic phenomenon that people often joke about, but it's important to this discussion. One day on Twitter, everybody's an expert on the conflict in Syria. The next day, all those very same people are epidemiology experts. And the next day, all of these people seem to be disinformation experts. I appreciate that some people may actually be very impressive Renaissance individuals, but this isn't possible at scale. We can't be experts about everything, whether it's at conferences like these, in the boardroom, in the skiff, or on the news, we have to elevate, elevate experts, not pundits. And when we don't know what we're talking about, we have to defer to experts that know better than we do. Next slide. So in my time working as a researcher and investigator, uh, one of my biggest pet peeves um, was hearing claims of Russian interference without any evidence. One story I always recall and tell is when a research firm claiming to track disinformation and track these types of actors accused a Muslim woman of being a Russian troll because her Instagram handle was similar to that of an internet research agency handle on Twitter. Before verifying, this research firm had tweeted about their findings, um, called out that particular account, and it is likely that this woman actually fair, faced a fair bit of harassment after that. So it's easy to jump to conclusions about a person you disagree with online and call them a bot, or jump to conclusions that every set of coordinated activity is somehow a troll farm, um, as opposed to say, an activist organization. Um, but as the Russian proverb says, um, which means trust, but verify. Next slide. So there are a lot of problems that can be merely solved by Googling. Um, as the joke so, uh, shows, um, when someone actually comes to you with a fairly obvious question, um, if you want to be kind of a troll of your own, you can send them a link um, to the Let Me Google That For You website, um, which conducts the search for them. What blows my mind is that we live in a world where we have an unprecedented amount of information at our fingertips. That leads to information overload, which threat actors take advantage of, but it also gives us an amazing amount of information with which to verify if we know how to harness it. 
So as Dr. Johnson mentioned earlier, there are a number of forensic tools that maybe are not accessible to everyone, but we can all learn a little bit more about how to leverage the information that we have openly available to us. If you look at outfits like Bellingcat, you can see a collective of open source researchers um, that don't have access to classified information, um, but they were able to track a Buk missile traveling from Russia to Ukraine before it shot down the MH17 aircraft. There are a lot of great people working in the space of open source research and intelligence, journalists adapting these methods, and organizations like First Draft that are providing that kind of training to newsrooms and individuals. And also, um, they, they now have a website where they, they have basically open training for, for anyone who'd like to, to take it. Next slide. So this is a tough one, um, and I, it's tough because these are, you know, as this slide says, hard problems. Um, you know, as it was mentioned during the war game talk earlier, most of the campaigns we've seen um, capitalize on existing societal fissures like racial injustice, marriage equality, um, partisanship, culture wars, and more. Threat actors don't create these wedges, but they certainly take advantage of them. And so we have to, as a society, work on these difficult issues and disarm the currency of whataboutism um, that has been used since the days of Soviet active measures. Next slide. So one area that we've seen a lot of work being done um, in government and in the corporate world is the disruption and denial of these types of networks, from social media platforms taking down networks of inauthentic behavior globally and publicizing them, to service disruptions of these troll farms led by Cyber Command. Um, also the naming and shaming of those organizing and running this, these types of activities, um, like the indictments from the Justice Department, um, they can serve as a deterrent to other actors who might wanna engage in the space as well. Um, but you know, as, as I said at the beginning, and I'll say again, um, these mitigations can't actually work in isolation. We have to work, they have to work in conjunction with all the other mitigations we've discussed and without collaboration, uh, with, with the collaboration of all of these entities. Next slide. So um, speaking of collaboration, um, you know, industry collaboration among big platforms, small pa platforms is extremely important. So um, what Facebook, Twitter, Google, and other companies already, already do today is share um, networks that they find with one another so that the other investigators on other teams can find and expose those networks as well and disrupt their activities across a number of different platforms. There's a really good example of that from um, an operation that's been called um, Operation Secondary Infection. Um, and it's a network that was first identified by Facebook investigators in May of last year. Um, and this network interestingly cuts across a dozens of social platforms, um, including online forums and, you know, big and small kinds of social media platforms. Um, the cool thing is that this network is actually studied by researchers at DFR Lab and Graphica, who identified additional activity based on the TTPs and known patterns of these threat actors. And then sharing that happened across these different companies, big and small, um, led to the identification and disruption of this operation across the board. Um, so it's a really good story to tell, um, and hopefully there will be more examples like that in the future. Um, the same collaboration needs to happen across government agencies. So there are teams working on these problems, um, as we've heard, across different government agencies. Um, there's um, the FBI's Countering Foreign Influence Task Force, um, CISA at DHS, Cyber Command, the State Department's Global Engagement Center and a number of other agencies. But as with the companies, they need to be talking to one another um, as Alex um, from the GEC mentioned um, in the previous talk. Uh, as a former journalist, I would be remiss not to mention the importance of journalism and media in this work. Uh, a great example of that is the investigation from Clarissa Ward um, and the CNN investigative team, which took place earlier this year um, when they visited a troll farm posing as an NGO in Ghana. Um, this operation um, was linked by Facebook and Twitter to actors associated with the past activity of the Internet Research Agency as well. Um, and, you know, this is a really great example where journalists, researchers, social media companies, law enforcement all work together to identify, expose and remove this network. Um, and the on the ground reporting from journalists was extremely helpful to exposing this network and explaining how it worked to the public. Um, and it was an amazing collaboration. Again, I hope more of this to come. Next slide. So my final 
recommendation here is kind of my sappiest, gushiest one, um, because, uh, you know, this work can't be done merely by playing whack-a-mole. Um, you know, I've been on that side of things and I recognize that it's important to disrupt and expose these networks, but, you know, we have to not only think about what we're trying to fight, but also what we're trying to protect and elevate, um, you know, whether it's the expertise that I mentioned earlier or, or something even bigger than that. Uh, and here I've got another story with which I want to, um, you know, sort of close my talk, which is um, a story from um, the summer I worked at the State Department um, on countering violent extremism. Um, it was in between years of graduate school, and I went to go see the Book of Mormon musical um, at the Kennedy Center that very same summer. So uh, for the uninitiated who haven't yet seen it, um, the premise of the musical Book of Mormon has two young and idealistic Mormon missionaries sent to a small village in Uganda. Um, and they're meant to share the Book of Mormon and attract converts to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, the villagers who are more concerned about disease, poverty, warlords, aren't very receptive to the messages and ideas that they're hearing from these two young missionaries. Um, and eventually what happens, you know, as, not to give it away to anyone who hasn't yet seen this, um, one of the missionaries um, who's pretty frustrated by the unsuccessful attempts to connect with these disaffected villagers, what he does, um, in part because he hasn't actually read the Mormon scriptures, he tries a different approach. He tailors, often with much embellishment, um, the, re the religion to the needs and concerns of the locals, whether it's the poverty issues that they're dealing with disease or warlords, he, he lies a little bit and he tells a story of why, you know, why this book is actually useful to the population that he's trying to reach. So what does this whole story about a musical have anything to do with what we're talking about here today? Um, well, um, I think that successful strategy is to counter violent extremism and to counter influence operations more broadly, um, have to address the underlying societal challenges um, that, um, you know, you know, communities face. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, um, some of these divides and wedge issues are existing ones, and so they need to be addressed. Um, but there's also, you know, initiatives that need to restore meaning in the value system that we're trying to protect. Um, as a personal story, you know, my family came to the United States as refugees from the Soviet Union. And one of the reasons we came here is because we yearned for the values and um, ideals that this country espoused. So I think that any country organization trying to combat these operations has to think about what makes them vulnerable to these campaigns in the first place. And they also have to give people something more powerful to believe in. So uh, as Mad Men's Don Draper once said in a pitch to a potential client, if you don't like what is being said, change the conversation. Next slide. So in closing, um, what I wanted to, to say is that, um, you know, there's a lot of mitigations and ideas that we've discussed here. Um, I don't think that they are all of the ideas that are out there. There's so many wonderful ones we've heard today. Um, but, you know, as the title of this talk notes, um, and you can see from our discussion, um, we do need a whole of society approach because none of these proposals or mitigations can work in isolation. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, and, and go from here. Okay, thank you, Olga. That was a great presentation. We've got plenty of time for questions, so please do use the Q&A button down on your toolbar to get those in. Um, so the first one, we've got one from uh, Rand. He says, suppose the Russians suddenly halted all of their efforts at campaigns against U.S. persons. Do you think that would result in a significant improvement to the pollution, or I assume he means a significant reduction in the pollution levels in the information environment? Would it make much difference to the disinformation campaigns related to our upcoming elections? So I don't think so, unfortunately. Um, I think one of the trends that um, was highlighted by some of the previous speakers or even some of the questions that have been asked is that there is a domestic angle to a lot of these operations. Um, most of you know, the operations that social media platforms have identified um, over the last um, you know, few years have actually been domestic ones, um, domestic in many different countries around the world where governments target their own populations um, or um, PR firms or disaffected um, groups of people, um, you know, come together and actually um, push their own um, narratives um, and do so sometimes in a coordinated and inauthentic fashion. And so and unfortunately, I don't think that that 
you know, first of all, you know, it's important to say that it's not just the Russians, right? Um, my area of focus and, and research has historically been in Russian actors, but um, as, as the audience here well knows, um, there are Iranian actors, um, Chinese actors, um, Saudi Arabian actors that engage in the space um, and, um, and can all use these types of tactics. And so um, we would be naive to think that, um, you know, if Russia um, stopped that we would be sort of okay. Um, um, and and as someone who who does look at Russia and think about how these actors um, engage, if I were looking at what's happening in the United States, I would say not really worth the bang for the buck. There's a lot of problems domestically that you can either amplify or you can just um, let them evolve on their own. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Joe Bogan. To what extent do you think an understanding of the cultural slash philosophical currents behind state and non-state disinformation campaigns is of use in countering and preempting them? And if so, how should this be integrated into efforts to counter disinfo? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I just want to make sure I'm getting it right. Sure. To what extent do you think an understanding of the cultural slash philosophical currents behind state and non-state disinformation campaigns is of use in countering and preempting them? And if so, how should this be integrated into efforts to counter disinformation? Thank you. So I think I think it's really important. Um, you know, if you look at what some of these threat actors do, is they have a pretty good understanding of of culture. Um, they they study. You know, if you look at some of the the documents that had been leaked from the Internet Research Agency before um, you know before it became famous. Uh, you know, a lot of them were um, analyzing the social fissures. They were little, you know, briefs about um, particular problematic issues that exist in, in um, American culture. Um, also, they targeted their own population. So um, they had briefs for um, the employees on Boris Nemtsov and um, opposition movement and some uh, and religion and some of the issues that are really important in Ukraine and in Russia. And so um, if adversaries are trying to understand culture, um, anyone trying to come Combat those uh, adversaries should try to do the same. Our next question comes from our very own Marie Murphy. She says, does verifying accounts on social media seem to have a credibility effect or are people more likely to believe their friends slash next door neighbors on important and complex issues regardless of their expertise? So I think that, you know, one, one of the things that we've seen lately in particular with, um, you know, COVID-19 is that um, there has been some verification effort to try to um, elevate the voices of people who actually do have expertise in epidemiology and um, in, in coronavirus specifically. And um, I think that's helpful, um, but, you know, when people are already sort of primed to only listen to certain um, ideas and there is that distrust of expertise, that verification won't do much. Um, so yes, you know, all of the people in, um, in my bubble who are reporters and people who look at that check mark and, and think of it as something that means a lot, um, yes, it'll make a difference. Um, but I think for the average person, um, I think people do rely quite a bit on trusted sort of influencers in their own communities. And so I think um, some of the strategies I've previously heard, um, you know, related to that are, um, you know, actually, you know, targeting the influencers themselves because they have such a wide reach in their community, whether it's a religious community or something else. Um, you know, I think Finland has experimented a little bit with this um, where they actually um, wanted to elevate, um, you know, particular health guidance um, during the COVID-19 crisis. And they tried to do that through particular influencers in Finnish society. Um, so maybe, maybe that's another strategy to try to reach the silos that exist already. So this next question kind of relates to what you just said there and relates to the average citizen. Um, it's from Emil Prosko. The information overload that overwhelms most social media consumers also leads to a sense of helplessness, which enables the Russian information warfare strategy. The average person isn't likely to be aware of some of the legitimate fact-checking resources you mentioned, and because they're overwhelmed by uncertainty, may give up trying to seek them out. So how do we make the average citizen feel more empowered in their pursuit of truth, given all the threats discussed today? So there's a number of different things um, that, you know, first of all, individuals can and should 
do to try to, you know, learn more about what they can. Obviously, I understand that there's, um, you know, the overwhelming factor of information overload. Um, some things that social media companies and some of these researchers in cognitive science have proposed are, you know, more contextual clues. I think Cara talked about this earlier in terms of labels, um, other things where, um, where an individual can have more information around what they're seeing. Um, one of the things that um, happens on the internet is um, people are stripped of the context that they usually have. Um, you know, even, even in sort of the forensics training that Bellingcat runs, um, if you look at a piece of a building, you don't actually know all the other things around it. And so um, things like labeling um, state-sponsored outlets, uh, which a number of social media companies have done, um, things like adding more contextual clues about here's another story that you could read related to the subject. Um, as I mentioned earlier, introducing friction into the process where people um, may not be able to reshare something until they've read it or until um, they've at answered a few questions. It sort of forces people to, to um, improve their, their diet and add some more healthy vegetables to it. Great, thank you, Olga. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions. Um, we've had a lot of great conversations today. Um, I particularly like the nudges part of your um, of your presentation. I'm going to use that in the future. Uh, we thank you for presenting with us today. We thank you for coming on, and you are now an official Army Mad Scientist. Very excited about that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So as we round out the conference today, we are now going to move to our closing remarks from Mr. Tom Greco, the Director of Intelligence, Deputy Chief of Staff G2 for the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command. Sir, you are spotlighted. Sir, I apologize, you're still muted. Okay, how about now? There we are, perfect, sir, thank you. All right, hey, so we've really learned a lot during the course of these mad scientist sessions on weaponized information. The U.S. Army expects to be contested globally by adversaries that seek to use information to fracture our relationships with our allies and to maneuver populations into extreme echo chambers where they can be manipulated. Two ways to break out of these echo chambers are promoting the exchange of ideas and to conduct rigorous analysis based upon core values. So to investigate, to investigate weaponized information, the partnership with Georgetown's Center for Security Studies and the University at Albany's Center for Advanced Red Teaming made a lot of sense. On behalf of the Army, I'd like to thank Georgetown for their continued collaboration with the Mad Scientist Program. You know, there's something about partnering with Georgetown that reinforces commitment to the Army's core values. It raises the rigor of our analytical discourse in the free exchange of ideas, helps us to grow ethically, and makes us want to build a more just world. Similarly, the University at Albany Center for Advanced Red Teaming is a cutting edge elite institution and helped, helped us raise our game. The center has done a masterful job of moving red teaming beyond its army roots to adapt red team techniques to novel non-military uses, for example, this worldwide conference. To be successful in the information environment, democracies need to adopt a whole of nation and a whole of alliance approach. Our potential adversaries have an advantage in harnessing a whole of nation approach because of their centrally directed national institutions. Democracies don't work, democracies don't work that way. To so, so to compete and win in the information environment, we have to build collaborative structures. As the foundation for the US's, the U.S.'s defense, the Army must understand, compete, and win in the information environment consistent with American values. All right, so what did we learn? Well, there's too much to go over every single point, but let me highlight three critical areas emerging technologies, reactive communication strategies, and trust. Emerging, emerging technology is driving the information environment, offering a very low cost of entry, enabling information dissemination on a very broad scale, 
allowing for very precise targeting and creating ever more realistic fake information. On reactive communication, owning the initiative in the information environment is very difficult for democracies. Unlike our adversaries, we do not have centrally directed national institutions who can have the first mover advantage. First mover advantage can lead to vir virality. Is that really a word? Virality, which can overcome veracity because there is often a tension between truth and attribution versus the speed required for the response to regain the information initiative. Or as red teamers would tell you, humans are subject to bias. For example, a few of the biases we talked about is anchoring, believing the first thing we hear, or confirmation bias, believing information that, re that reinforces our existing mental models. Finally, information attacks can degrade or destroy trust across a society or an organization. Trust is a critical concern in the Army where we must have trust between leaders, organizations, systems, and increasingly data. So the Mad Sciences program provided this on-ramp. This provided this on-ramp to the Army and our partners to examine the weaponization of information. We heard a lot of ideas from sources outside of the Department of Defense extended ecosystem, outside of our little defense um, echo chamber. To close, thank you, thank you all for your participation. We had over 500 folks registered uh, for this conference from literally all over the world. So thank you all for your participation in the Mad Sciences program and for helping the Army to better understand the challenges and opportunities of operating in the information environment. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Matt. Thank you. Okay, great, sir. Thank you so much for those words. I think that's a, a great way to round out the conference here. Um, as he said, we had over 500 folks registered for it. We had over uh, 300 at, at one time here. Um, uh, I'm very thankful for all the presenters to come out. We had a lot of great ideas. It really helped us explore disinformation in, in a larger venue. Um, there were a few hiccups in there. Uh, technology won a few of the battles, but I think I won the war in the end with PowerPoint. Um, so I appreciate you staying with me. Um, we have, this isn't the end. I mean, this is the end of the conference. This isn't the end of what we do here though. So everything that we did here today is recorded. We will have all the videos up on our APAN site. We've already got all the slides up there. Check the chat for the links. Um, we urge you to check the MadSci blog, which is madsciblog.tradoc.army.mil. We're constantly putting um, new, uh, uh, new posts up there twice a week. That's where the conversation will continue. Uh, we urge you to write for us if you have an interesting idea, especially about um, you know, what we're exploring now, a very relevant and significant issue. Uh, we also have a podcast, The Convergence, which you can find if you go to the blog or if you go to um, uh, the APAN site, we will link there. Um, and I see Mr. Kurzy's already got links to all, this, all the information I'm talking about in the chat. So please don't be strangers. Please get into the, into the, um, uh, the network that we have here at Mad Scientist. And um, while this was our large conference, we will still have another webinar. We're going to continue this work throughout the summer. So on, on 29 July... Uh, at 1 p.m., we're going to host a webinar featuring Do Dr. Ajit Mann and Mr. Paul Kobal of the Narrative Strategies Group to talk about disinformation and narrative warfare uh, as we continue to look at this. Uh, Dr. Mann is an accomplished writer, researcher, and professor of global security at Arizona State University, and Mr. Kobal is a former Army Warrant Officer who is also an author, a researcher, and an expert in strategic communications. So, um, we will have we have an Eventbrite link for that as well, so you can sign up uh, and join us uh, on the 29th. And I'll just reiterate once again, thanks for being here. Thanks to all the presenters. Thanks to both teams, uh, Georgetown Center for Advanced Red Teaming and the Mad Scientist team here. And um, please check us out on the blog and check out the podcast. Thanks, everybody.